touching the matter in issue shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth so help me god so help me god honorable dr goku every year mp for Sheshiwelso, the first MPP member to win that seat. I said the first MPP member to win that seat and repeat it. That's a huge achievement. <laughs> You're a second term member of parliament. You've been minister for lands and forestry. You've been Minister for Health, the Ghana Health, uh, National Health Insurance came into being under your uh, tutorship when you were Minister for Health. And your last portfolio was which one? After leaving Regional Minister for Western Region. What was the last portfolio the President gave you? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Minister of State, Office of the President, in charge of SIGA, State Interest and Governance Authority. Very well. Can we just keep it there? So, our Supervising Minister, tell us about SIGA, State Interest. And then we now see that President is going to appoint a Minister for Public Enterprises. Uh, what were you doing and what were they doing for their mandate? And since the enactment, what blueprints have you left uh, there? Well, Mr. President, the whole idea about the formation of SIGA is was backed by is backed by legislation. Is that government entities had had a field day and they were as is, as, so to speak, a law unto themselves. And they were not fulfilling their mandates. They were lost, so to speak, in the wilderness. And some of them were even, frankly, working at cross purposes. So SIGA was set up to streamline their activities, to bring the best in them so that there could be cohesion. They would uh, stick to their mandates. But SIGA was not set up to oversee their day-to-day -day activities, but to focus on their financial performance and also to stick to protocols that have been fashioned out so that they could uh, perform their duties in ethical environment. Do you want to name any of the state enterprises that you have been able to salvage since the enactment? What has happened? Just mention one or two of it and let us know what new impetus you've added to their existence and operations. Just a moment, I have to change my mask. Yes, uh, a couple of them have come. What comes to mind immediately is Gihok distilleries. Under the titulate of Masuel Kofi Juma, has made breakthrough. Their books were in the red, now it's in the black. And then also an entity like a state publishing corporation, we also doing very, very well. And several other entities. We are interested in hearing the several other. This is a committee of parliament. You are appearing before the appointments committee. State publishing who heard you, give up who heard you, don't uh, use wholesale words and say several others. Which are those other state enterprises that you have gone to their rescue? Well, Mr. Chairman, going to their rescue perhaps is even a strong word. The, the mere presence of SIGA even uh, engendered in them, uh, you know, changed the, the whole cultural environment that we re realized that they were doing rather well even on their own devices. And apart from the two that I have enumerated, the, the, you remember or you recall that the government has even stakes in 
some entities and they were not paying dividends. So some of them were, you know, started returning uh, dividends. Some of the mining companies, which were very drunk in, you know, as far as uh, time is concerned, started paying their dividends on time. Chairman, the nominee on the floor of parliament has some significant contributions to how Ghana contains the public health epidemic of COVID. You want to share that with us? What do you think? How do you rate our national response to COVID? And given your background and experience in health, what can we do better to combat COVID? Mr. President, Ghana has a very, very interesting story. Honorable Minister David, please. I, I am not president. I am chairman of the committee. So. You know, chairman, you know, sometimes language in French, chairman and president are interchangeable. I live across the border, so sometimes the uh, chairman is very president, but I stand corrected, Mr. Chairman. What I was saying was that in spite of recent reverses, Ghana has made a tremendous contribution to the fight against COVID. And we have something to show even to the rest of the world. Ghana has, you know, at the outbreak of COVID, marshaled all the arsenals that it could. And indeed, it was led by no less a person by its own president. And we have a health system where, contrary to popular belief, the public health system is fairly robust, especially in the African situation. Let me take a little bit of time and explain. We have a, a whole enterprise or a whole organization which looks at health promotion, health prevention, reporting mechanisms, and systems that deals with outbreaks such as this. You may recall that Ghana was at forefront in abolishing uh, measles, whooping cough, uh, and other diseases where, you know, troubling us in, in the uh, tropical climes. The same capacity that we built, we marshaled it against COVID. So at the very beginning, we, we realized that we were able to stem the rapid spread of the disease. And even though the spread in several places was exponential, ours was not nowhere near the exponential curve that people were expecting. So in that sense, we were able to deal with it. The only problem Ghana has is that in the public health services, clinical services as an entity, that is where we have our shortfall. And that's where people confuse the issues. But in the preventive realm, in the health education, those entities that are represented by the district director of health services and its uh, you know, apparatus, we have some of the best system anywhere in the world and we can raise our head high up. Even these recent outbreaks, if you compare it to anywhere in the world, we are nowhere near the sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, figures that is out there. So in so some sense, I have always maintained that our health system is very, very robust indeed as far as outbreaks of diseases are concerned. Yes, Honorable Ayanga. Um, Dr. Pepe Good morning. Um, you are going to the Environment Ministry, assuming that this House approves you. The is general public frustration about the environment, both in terms of 
urban environment and then also the rural setting, you know, Galamse and all those things. I was at the Ministry of Environment some time ago and we passed the land use on the Special Planning Act uh, at 9 to 5. Are you conversant with this act? Are you conversant with all the measures that have been put in the act, if, which if implemented, uh, can go a long way to address the issues of managing you know, the urban environment uh, in both the big cities and then the rural communities. Can you brief us on what your mandate will be under this act? Mr. Chairman, on the Act 5, 9 to 5, cease to essentially uplift the function that was hitherto performed by a department that was town and country planning into a status that they have more powers, the amount that had been so to speak, uh, expanded, so that they have the legal arsenals and tools to deal with the urban issues that we have raised. Yes, I look at the, the law, I must say that I'm not an, exactly an expert in that area, but the, the, that, that I have seen, I believe that it gives us the legal tools to do what is expected. Except to say that, like everything, we have to tend, contend with sociology and political issues, so that those lofty ideals that have been captured in the law can be fulfilled. So, yes, to answer you, as far as the entity called the Land Youth and Special Authority is concerned, they have what it, what it, what it is to fulfill that mandate, especially in dealing with urban sprawl, special issues, and even uh, it dovetails even into environmental issues, especially in urban settings. So yes, you have what it is to do that. If you, if you look at <coughs> the legal regime um, that the Land Use and Spatial Planning Act sets up, you must have a national spatial development framework. You must have regional develop, uh, spatial development framework. And then at the district and sub-district level, you must have development frameworks. If you want to build a house, there are all sort of rules governing the development of a building, the planning of a neighborhood, everything. In fact, there are rules regarding, you know, um, general spaces for, uh, let's say, children's uh, parks and etc. All those are captured and clear rules governing them. And for every development that you must do in this country, you need an EPA permit to be able to do that. So the combined effect of the land use and spatial development framework and the environmental uh, permitting arrangement that we have will go a long way to ensure that we really have control over the management of our environment. What is your thoughts? I mean, what are your thoughts? That's why, Mr. Chairman, I said human development is a function of several facets of life the legal regime and frameworks, technology, and everything. But in that conundrum is are two entities, sociology and politics. Those two things, you can find them rearing their head everywhere in our everyday life. They don't make systems work. And that is my fear. All these lofty ideas that I work, 
What I mean by sociology, I want to be very specific. Human behavior, the control of human behavior is very, very difficult. Unless we come to an agreement, if you attempt to even do it with legal regimes, invariably you fail. And that is where my fear is. So we must embark on education, educating the populace about the potential for this lost power and in the, uh, the frameworks and the plans and whatnot that have been drawn so that we make it work. If we do not embark on a massive public education, I'm sure that you agree with me that the way we behave, we may not. Because I see people building on places that have been demarcated for roads, places that have been demarcated for marketplaces. Yeah, people go through the back door and they, they build structures that are not supposed to be there. That's what I mean by the sociology. And then, yes, we are politicians. Those of us, even the enforcers, those of us who have to make sure that the law works. Unfortunately, sometimes we turn even a blind eye. So we are all in the dock. We all stand indicted. These are lofty laws, very, very beautiful in every setting, whether even in industrialized countries or what not. These are very beautiful laws. But unfortunately, if we don't change our act, our attitude, I'm afraid we may be telling a different story decades from now. Uh, you are looking at going to the Minister of Environment. There are laws that impose obligations on everybody using every space in this country. And if you comply with those laws, it will help all of us to ensure that we have the best environmental standards. The laws are already made, and you are telling me that you are looking at sociology, you are looking at politics, you are going to swear and put to enforce the laws of Ghana. Are you going to go ahead and enforce the laws, or are you going to pander to sociology and politics? Education is fine, but you have to enforce the law. Mr. Chairman, education is fine. We have to enforce the law. I'm being very realistic in this country. I can cite several examples apart from this scenario, in, the, in this uh, special planning scenario, where we have perverted things and we have not worked. I'm a very brave person. I'm saying that we are all standing in the dock, meaning me, myself included. But I promise you, when I'm giving the nod, you know I'm a fighter. I'm going to fight and I'm going to step on toes and make sure that things work. But I'm a very lonely, a, a, a lone person. And the way to go is not to flag the, the laws, but to get people's understanding. When you get that, not more than half of the battle, I dare say 90%, will be won. It's only then you have to deal with deviants. But when you have even people who are right-thinking people disobeying the law, then we have a problem. That is when politics and whatnot kick, kicks in. For example, if 90% of the nearest flout the law, can you put them before the law court? Empirically speaking, you have been defeated. You cannot put 90, 90 out of 100 people behind bars. It's impossible. That is where education becomes a very powerful tool. That's what I'm alluding to. Thank you, Nobu. You've done very well for us this morning. Oh, no. It's the same question. Just uh, follow up. Sorry? Those are just follow up on the same question. Oh, I thought you have asked about four no. questions already. No, it's all on special, special planning. Special what? It's all the, uh, related to special planning. <laughs> Why? But if you... Because of his response. <laughs> I'll give you one more. No, two more. Two more, Minister. Minister, two more, two more questions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nominee, our waters, our waters have been polluted as a result of improper waste management. And also in the Galamse areas, 
the use of all sort of chemicals for processing uh, gold and, and other things have resulted in a lot of pollution of our water bodies. Um, what will you do? And a lot of mining companies also do mine without proper uh, wastewater treatment facilities before the water gets discharged to other water bodies around them. What will you do, you know, to deal with the problem of water pollution resulting from environmental practices, both by big, medium, small-scale mining, and then the uh, illegal currency activities across the country? As a chairman, that's a tough one. It's a very, very wide subject. And uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet for that. First of all, they, we have their legal recourse. We have to enforce the Ghanaian laws as far as waste management is concerned with special regard to uh, management of uh, waste, liquid waste in the mining uh, places. Both, like you said, all the entities, medium, large, and small. Again, I seek refuge again in education. We have to educate the people. And then, of course, we have to look at the technology that is being used. But I don't know, honestly, I don't understand the uh, uh, understand the question in its entirety. Because if you are going to waste, uh, manage the environment, you cannot manage the liquid, uh, you know, uh, environment in isolation from even solid waste. But if to, to do justice to your uh, 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 your question, I believe that we have to have recourse to the law. We have to look, uh, look at the technology that we are using, and we have to uh, 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 look at the people who are doing their training, their capacity, and even their appreciation. That's where education comes in. And then look at the gaps in therein and try to rectify them. If the law permits people to be wayward, then I will come to this August house so that the necessary gaps are plucked. If it is a, te a technological issue that they are using obsolete equipment that is leading to leakages into the, what do you call it, the water system, water bodies in the country, then obviously that technology, if it's obsolete, will have to be changed. And then, of course, training of people, and we can also compare ourselves to other countries. I'm sure the mining environment, their best practices all over the world. Said that even I noticed that in, in Ghana we ban uh, what do you call it mining in water bodies. But I tell you, in several places they can do safe mining. And even when you go back to even in our own country, we used to be able to do dredging, dunkwa, safely. That's alluvial mining. So in fact, nothing is impossible with the appropriate technology. So we have to look at technology too. But I dare say that most of our problems is not like these things do not exist. The interplay between the economics that's making fast money and technology, that is why some people to choose the, the least pathway and make money and have a free ride and leave waste in their wake. So in fact, most of the things that they do are criminal in nature. And that's where the law should kick in, and then we should prosecute them. So that's how I see it. All right, thank you very much. Honor Patrick Buongo. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Doctor, um, e-waste, electronic waste in Ghana, became a very topical subject. And um, this some steps in setting up the framework to deal with that menace. 
a fan was under the law. Can you walk us through the e-waste program um, that this house approved? Steps that have been taken, the status of the fund, and um, related matters. Thank you. Okay, e-waste is a very, very important area as far as environmental pollution is concerned. Built in some of these electronic gadgets are heavy metals and rare metals which has the potential to cause or damage human health. I'm talking about kidney problems. Some of them, when they log in their body, cannot, they, they, they will be in your body forever. So, Ghana has realized that it's a big problem and we're taking steps. That's why we had a policy document and we had a, a law which has come to this house and you've set out a system to collect the e waste. In fact, a recent example was uh, Abu Brishi, where they set up a center so that those who deal in those crafts uh, uh, could hand them over for, uh, you know, a fee. They, they, they actually buy them back. And you set up, uh, the ministry has set up an entity in, I think, in the pre premises of uh, Ghana Atomic Energy Commission to manage the waste. They've said it will be embedded in the law or the, the policy is that we should set up a fund. The fund has actually been set up, but there are certain constraints. Some of the things that were envisaged, like pre-destination collection of the funds, they are running into problems. The problem really is that the, the primary vendors in the Ghanaian situation, we don't get all our, uh, uh, the, the electronic gadgets from primary vendors, I mean the manufacturers, and third parties come in. So those monies will have to be collected by the custom regime in our ports. And the agreements that we have signed, these are briefings that I have had. They said that uh, they do not capture all these this detail. So, you know, in, in a nutshell, there are problems with it. So, when I'm giving the nod, I'm going to legal regimes, streamline them, and then, of course, the administrative problems, so that these things can be removed and the fund could then run. So, that is what I know about the EWIS. But as we speak now, several aspects of them have been set up, and we are well poised to start to make them, uh, you know, to make it start. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, I know you to be a very big farmer. How are you going to use your new office to assist the CSI out to develop very good yields to support the agricultural sector? Thank you. That's my last question. Thank you. Mr. So, Chairman, because of the echo in the room, I do not hear you well. Because of your special position, I do, can you repeat your uh, no, question? Thank you. Um, I know you to be a very big farmer. And I'm asking you how you are going to use your new office to assist the CSIR, which is an agency under your ministry, if I'm right, to develop very good yields or mm -hmm. seedlings or plants for the agricultural sector. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, CSIR is doing a lot of good work. I was amazed to see that we have such uh, an entity in this country with a lot of its institutes, about, I think there are 13 institutes that have been various things. But specifically, if I may yield to the agricultural sector, well, you brought in a, a personal element. Uh, 
it gives me only an idea. But I will not be so, uh, you know, I'm a very humble person. I don't want to say that I could, uh, on a personal level, lead such a big entity to do this. But I have an idea that there is a big gap between the application of their resource and we, the families. Extension problem is really the problem. It is not that the yields are not that. The biological things that you've got up can compare to any place in, anywhere in the world. So on that score, there isn't much that I can do to them. But what I can bring on the table is how to quickly apply this knowledge to we, the farmers. That gap can easily be bridged. And the way I see it is that extension services should be looked at. And then the commercial application of the art services should be said that they should get a lot of, you know, a, 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 a remuneration so that they can even continue to do more for us. But as for the set findings, there are a lot out there that even within the next decade, we cannot exhaust their application. And then, of, of, of course, some of the findings too that I found is that I found that in my interaction with them is that we, we have to use their findings in the settings that will bring them the best economic benefit to us. Some of them are leaning towards a, 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 bit, a bit more of academic research than uh, what I call operational research. So they should be doing operational research. And the other time I had an interaction, by the way, the head, the current head, I worked with him when I was uh, briefly a minister for lands and natural resources under President Kufo regime. And we had a, you know, a, a long interaction. I believe that their findings we can, so to speak, narrow them down and there may be the best five or six or so who can, who has the best potential to, you know, uh, 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 get us up and running economically is what we should concentrate on because there are a lot of research out there that are gathering dust. So that's how I see it. To answer you directly, there is a lot of research out there. There's a gap between the research, the potential that it has, and we, the families. The intermediary is what we have to bridge. And then the economics of it to will have to be factored in so that we can get make the best use of that entity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. Honorable Chairman, uh, before the question, I want to plead that uh, we'll play a short documentary for the nominee to watch. It's okay. You, you told me about it. That's wow. short. This is Agno Bloshi, a suburb of Accra, the capital of Ghana. But local residents have given it a nickname, sort of a Camorra. It's the home of the biggest electronic waste dump and is a livelihood for many. First, it feeds them, then, polluted areas with toxins and toxic metals on the African continent.
Emmanuel Abadirija has spent his entire childhood at the dump site. He's never been to school, so he can't go elsewhere. For him, this job is the only way to sustain himself. Ghanaian laws forbid Emmanuel to work at all until he comes of age, but no one pays any attention. And you see the small small children, those who work here now. Some of them don't have parents. Some of their father died, some of them their mothers died, and some of their mothers are there. But they don't take care of them. You know, as a small boy, and some of them they can't they can work here. And after 12, they'll go back to school. And some of them they don't go to school at all. When they go to school, they'll come here. Some of them, early in the morning, they'll come here, pick the eye off, go and sell, get your money, go to school. I think that's enough. Can I ask you a question? I know which I'm on a documentary on U.S. and my constituency, Odio Odio Odio. This is an international documentary with a title, Welcome to Sodo. Honorable Chairman, this, one of the most significant parts of this, I said, and this e-waste feeds them and kills them. My first question, you see all these children and all this, what will your ministry be doing in order to save the future of the lives of these young ones who, through no fault of theirs, are forced into such a very dangerous job. Mr. Chairman, this is a very, very serious problem. And uh, as I watched it, a lot of things were engaging my attention. As a physician, I know that you were inhaling toxic fumes can cause so many problems. Even the metals in the, the plastics that have been, you know, it changed from solids to, you know, um, gaseous plumes. When you inhale them, some are carcinogenic, some will uh, can lead to so many things in the lungs. But the problem you've asked is actually a social question. How do we stop these kids from being there? I believe it's a function of poverty. And it's a function of ignorance. And it's a function of neglect, that's the relation of parental duty, all are in there. I believe that as a lead ministry in this area, I have to collaborate with my colleagues, especially the Ministry of Immediate Work Council, is a gender and children. We have to collaborate, local government, education so that we come up with a strategy to get the kids off. The waste itself comes within my purview and is almost exclusive, simply my problem with regard to the EPA's problem. But the question, if I understand you, is more protein than we think, and it is not under, with all due respect, under the ambit of the Mesty alone, Ministry of uh, Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation alone. So we need a collaborative effort. And uh, I've named some relevant ministries that we have to work with. I'm sure they have 
a lot of uh, there are even elements of child labor there and we are signed on to international conventions and whatnot. So we have to resurrect all those issues, protocols, the programs and plans, so that together, when we marshal all those tools, I'm sure we can have a go at the problem of it. Chairman, let me just uh, take a by me, just one minute. Minister, in your answer, I'm using your words. Function of poverty, function of ignorance, function of neglect. I will collaborate. I have strategy. The Ghanaian people want to hear you. What is your strategy to end that function of poverty, that function of neglect, and that function of ignorance as Minister for Environment if you are approved? Thank you, Chair. The strategy is to grow the economy. How you can you find these problems in developed countries? When you grow the economy, if so far too, there are other things that come with it. Education comes up. Children learn. In school, you will notice that these things are not good for their health. So, in fact, this is a vicious circle sort of thing. And that's why I'm saying that the most strategic thing to do is to get the, our society out of poverty as soon as possible. But in the interim, my mandate is only four years. As we work at it, we should then ameliorate their conditions by invoking all the laws, all the strategies that uh, gender and social protection is bringing to the table, all the strategies that local government is bringing, all the strategies so that we can stem that problem that we see in immediate. But in the long term, if you have economic growth, a lot of things come in its wake and you do not even do because the, popula the population itself is aware of this and they will not expose themselves to this kind of hazard. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, permit me, I want to draw the attention of the Honourable Minister, um, Honourable Nominee, to the fact that this has assumed an international dimension because the Austrian government is using this topic as part of the education curriculum on how waste is managed. And so the African community in Austria have protested and demonstrated against it. The attention has been drawn to the one in charge of Africa European Desk or something at the office of the president on this. I want to see you taking an action with the Austrian embassy to make sure that this negative perception being painted about our people is, is worked on. My second issue has to do with the question that was put to the Honourable Minister for Roads by the Minority Leader. Consistently, whenever it rains, mass light takes over the Accra Winima Road, especially the uh, Malam Junction Kasua Path. Totally blocks the road consistently, is posing a risk to human life and motorists. The, the roads minister said that they are planning to plant grass. But if you look at the situation there, it's not just a matter of sand winning. It's a matter of spatial planning. It's a matter of lack of, uh, let me say, su supervision. And total environmental degradation. What will you do in order to prevent these abuses on that stretch of the road, which becomes a nuisance to motorists and a danger to life and property? Chairman, I, I have, I've happened to encounter or seen that problem first and at least once. 
So in this sense, the picture you are painting is true. But again, this is a very technical problem. So I want to draw my attention to it. If I get a nod, then we have to make it a project and look at it, where environment comes in, where we have to deploy the appropriate technology to stop this, together with the road ministry, I'm sure, that they have the capacity and then we on our side, environment can come in and then of course the technical people can kick in and prefer solutions who can prevent it. I don't think this should be a big problem. Yeah. So my final one. Living in Accra, I appreciate one very important problem, sun winning, both within inland and at the shore. It's becoming almost an environmental problem for Gun East, Gun South, and those districts. I have no problem with people who undertake that exercise within the law, do the reclamation, cover up, and all those things. But many of those instances, they don't adhere to the law, the regulation. They just win the sand and win the sand and cause environmental problem. You're also in charge of technology. Is there a possibility, can we be looking at as, as a country, building without really affecting our environment and taking away the sustainability of the ecosystem? If you can repeat the last, you built a preamble, but I had a preamble, but the question I didn't quite get. I'm saying in certain parts of the world, there has been technological advancement, innovative ways of building without necessarily impacting negatively on the ecosystem, that the sun winning and all those things. But it looks at like with us, every aspect of our building, are we thinking about new methods? Since you are going to the Ministry of Environment and Technology, is that not it? Science, Innovation and Technology. Innovative ways, technological ways that we can look at building without necessarily causing damage to the sustainability of our environment. Mr. Chairman, I believe that his question is very loaded indeed. Yes, when we are building, we have to use earth materials, whether mud whether sand, and even if you are going to use wood, these are all natural materials. And in, in built there, you have to have a sustainability plan. So sustainability is how to replace the materials, or even if they are irreplaceable, how to mitigate their impact on the environment so that the impact on the human person is limited in terms of health and even aesthetics, say beauty and whatnot. So to answer you directly, yes, yeah, there have to be a mixture of all the propositions that are made. And you throw in technology. Is that the how, the know-how that will lessen all those things. So you choose the appropriate technology so that all the mitigating things are done. I believe that in this country we have. So yes, we are going to win sand. But when you win sand, how do you do the necessary restitution? You can even re really, after winning the sand, you can win back the soil. You can build the soil so that even you can plant things there. Those are the things that must be done. Mr. Chairman, my take is that in Ghana, we expect those who win sands to do the restitution. My take on this is, is that in several sectors, this does not happen. If you take the timber industry, those who harvest our timber, they are not interested in planting trees. If you take the gold and mining industry, those who did, they are not interested 
in being the environmental institution covering the big holes, the craters that they create. The same thing goes who dig the land and win sanctuary. So my proposition is that we set up entities with the requisite knowledge. In this particular case, under the local government system, or it can even be under the land and natural resources ministry. Take the requisite amount of money from these people because these are economic businesses. And those experts then do the necessary restitution. If you ask those who are winning science, and they will not be. So there are levies and whatnot which should cause them and we should look at the bigger picture and cause them well. And then the right price, because a lot of what is bringing all this problem is the phenomenon of free ride in this country. When I talk free ride, it means the actual cost, a lot of uh, things which are for the public good are under cost and um, their economic value are less than. And that's why. So people, actuaries and what not you, and those in, in the building industry should cost all those things. And then the environmental damage that is cost, and that is caused, we can have a cost to it. Take it, give it to entities that have been set up with expertise, those with the requisite expertise, so that they can do this restitution. You, I bet you, we cannot count on those who win the science to do the necessary restitution. Unfortunately, their knowledge even in that area is very, very limited indeed. So that is my take on that. Thank you. Yes, Hassan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Honorable Dr. Kekwifi, I congratulate you on your nomination. I've been reviewing sections 13 and 14 of the Environmental Protection Act 1994 and 490. And I have reviewed it in relation to uh, enforcement of spillage and environmental degradation and other such offenses under the Act. Now, from my review, I see that the offense for any kind of offense under the law is 250 penalty units. That is about 3,000 Ghana cities. Because the penalty unit is 12 cities. Now, this is not punitive enough. At best, what an offender would do is to add 3,000 cities to his course of operations knowing very well that I'll be charged 3,000 cities. That's the maximum. And then go ahead, do anything, degrade the environment and the consequences thereof. Would you consider an amendment to the EPA Act to give some bite to the enforcement regime under the, under the Act? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, yes. Penalty units, by the way, if I want to train you something. Is called pre joint in the Omanese Palace. Uh, so, 3,000, what did you say? 2,500? 250, that means pre joint 250. Anyway, that is by the way, I just to educate for our own education. Uh, pre joint is about now eight, <laughs> this also pre joint one. What, what, uh, <laughs> but uh, that the concept of penalty unit even existed before us. So that is what I want to bring to the fore. But the uh, chairman, what I'm saying is that that is absolutely I could not disagree with him. That is absolute. So the law is a function of time. So these allies, we have to review them. One, as a minister, one of my mandates is to review their legal environment and then bring it to, a, you know, clear, of course, with my superiors and then bring it to the uh, uh, parliament so that the necessary, uh, you know, uh, corrections are done. So this answer is very straightforward. You are right. And that I was referring to the phenomenon of free right. In our, uh, the economics here, the, uh, those who done economics, they know. This is what engenders free right. You see, the value between 
the difference between this uh, 3,500 and then the actual cost is <laughs> the marginal cost of that free ride. So we can capture it. So I agree with you. Thank you. And then we build it, we build it into the uh, penalties. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ghana is a signatory to the Bamako Convention on the ban of imports of hazardous waste in Africa. Now, if you review the convention, you see that the provisions practically deal with everything that has to do with import of hazardous waste and the punitive regime. Now, I have been searching all over the place to see whether the convention has been domesticated pursuant to Article 75 of the 1902 Constitution into our domestic laws to see whether it has been so that we can enforce it in Ghana and then prevent people from bringing hazardous waste into the country. Can you take steps to see to the implementation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This can be done very expeditiously. That's the very essence of signing on to conventions. If I may give an analogy and a parallel, we signed on the FCTC Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in Geneva. I was then the chairman of the VHA. And quickly, one of the consequences was that we had to pass a in country uh, legislation to make it sure that people do not smoke in public places. Ghana did it in double quick time. And uh, uh, so I have an idea about what to do. So as soon as I'm giving the nod, thanks for averting my mind to that. It, it shall be done. Your Honor. Yeah. Honorable Zoera. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Honorable Nomi. My question has to do with uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics training for the youth. As the world evolves, different skills will be required of the youth so that they can remain competitive in the world market. I want to find out what your plans are to ensure more training of STEM for the youth so that they can be part of the changing world that we are seeing every day. Again, Mr. Chairman, the last, if she will indulge me, the last end of the question. You want to find out from me? I want to find out from you. If, if you get the nod as Minister for Environment, Science and Technology, what will be your plans? to ensure that there's more STEM training for the youth of this country so they can be competitive and relevant to the changing world experience. The need for STEM training is very, very STEM and uh, self-evident. In fact, society thrives on STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. No society can progress without that. So, as for the need, it's well established. But the plans that we have to draw to make sure, first, starts with even education. Because if the society does not understand that STEM is the platform in which all our actions should play out, to make us competitive, to give us a modern society, if we do not invite that, if there is no acculturation, if you do not accept that, all plans will not work. As for the specific plans, we have to look at the numbers. How many of the youth are in, you know, STEM environment? And then we have to draw plans, know our objectives, know the deficit in terms of numbers, in terms of quality in terms of quantities, and then draw the plans that will address this. But I believe that it must start with acculturation. And indeed, every youth 
up to a certain level, should have a background in these four disciplines. Even if you are an arts student, because everything technology thrives on this, uh, you know, uh, uh, science is trying, it thrives, engineering and technology, which are derivatives of the basic sciences, they thrive on all these things, science and mathematics. So everybody should have a working knowledge and appreciate that this is good for society. And then we go into specifics. That is where we should decide that maybe at the secondary school level, secondary level, maybe 80% or 60% of our students should be goaded towards that area. And then at the tertiary level, in my mind's eye, at least half of our population, the courses that are being offered should be in that area. That is the only way our society is going to progress. But it takes national dialogue and national conversation, creation of awareness to get to that stage. It's going to be a very difficult task. Well, my four-year mandate, if I get the acculturation thing right, like it's happening in Western Europe, the Americas, and even places like Iran and India, where these things are appreciated, I'm sure will be all off to a very good start, madam. Yes, I'll give you one more. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. My other question is on research. There's a general decline in research in Ghana. And as you know, research actually is the bedrock of any society or community that will make progress. So in the event that you get the nod, what will you do? What will be your immediate plans to make sure that research is inculcated, especially to working with our higher institutions of learning to make research part of the curriculum, a very serious and um, 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 enduring part of the curriculum so that our country can benefit from new knowledge to prepare our development. Thank you. Again, we have no choice here. Research is the limiting of industrial development. And research, there is the basic research and then there are applied research. Ghana is not an island. And there me, there's something called scientific morality. We have a duty to contribute to the body of knowledge in the world. So even in the basic sciences, we have to do research. But even in the, it is even more important in the applied realm. That is where the economic benefits come in. And again, all our institutions, we have to get the institutions uh, to build that kind of capacity. But one of the findings that I made now is that a lot of research is going on. And indeed, Ghana has made some contribution as far as our uh, let's say West Africa even is concerned. But the people are not aware of them. Let's take even planting for food and just for example. People do not know that about 95% of the maize that is being grown and which has led to increase in yields and increase in productivity is coming from the research done by CSIR. So you hear the Ministry of Agriculture has done well. But the research on the opinions are never broadcast to the Ghanaians so that they do not appreciate it. Because in this we are being overtamper. We are being, uh, what do you call it, the various varieties. Hardly do you find the primary, the old variety being planted now. Even let's come to our own cocoa. See, sir, the Cocoa uh, Research Institute has done a lot in the Cocoa area. That's one area I know best. 
that is why Ghana has been able to hold its own in spite of so many things, diseases and all, that at least we are very competitive in the world of cocoa production. If you take Brazil, they are a net importer of cocoa, even from Ghana, because by here, Eastern Brazil, not Eastern Brazil, was devastated by which is bloom disease. If you take Malaysia and other things, Paul Berra disease, uh, 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 no, they, they, they were afflicted. The other scientists could not stop them in any big way. But we have held our own. We've researched and CSIR and its uh, institute, Crop Research, uh, you know, Coco is at Bunsu and elsewhere and Tafu and others. They have been able to give us varieties that can resist uh, CSSV. So we have a lot of things going for us, but they are, they are not known to the Ghanaian public. So the idea that we, are, we have positive in the research arena, we must question it. We have done quite a lot. But of course, I will be the first to admit that we should be doing a lot more and as a, a, a doctor of a, a public health, the neglected tropical diseases, nobody is going to solve them for us. I'm talking about the large vestiges of elephantiasis, onchocerciasis, and this. Those in the West, they are not interested in them anymore because they are of no economic importance. But we owe it to our people to research into them so that we can eliminate them. And that will be our contribution to the world. So, because so long as there are reservoirs in the world, they are a threat to everybody. So my idea about research is that, yes, this is, is going to take decades to build, but at least a beginning should be made. And be a minister alone, I cannot. Certainly, having been away from that arena for long, I need to go and immerse myself in it, be at par on the same page with my, you know, scientific, the scientific Thank you, Honourable Minister. And we have a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought you called me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On Thursday, 24th June 2020, Accra experienced three earth tremors. Overall, between January 2018 and June 2020, the city has experienced about eight earth tremors. Officials of the Ghana Geological Survey Authority are on record to have warned that the earth tremors is a signal of a looming earthquake of greater magnitude in the future. I know a committee was formed to develop a comprehensive framework for earthquake preparedness and response as the minister designate for environment science and technology what will be your contribution to ensuring we are able and ready as a nation to protect lives and properties should there be an earthquake in the future well mr chairman uh, the Geological Survey Department comes under the purview of lands and uh, natural resources ministry. But that said, uh, through EPA, because there is intertwining of a uh, mandate between Mesty and the land, so it's not like I want to avoid the question. But certainly, I have to collaborate with my colleagues so that the plans and what all that you have alluded to, they are brought to the fore. Whatever input Mesty as a ministry has to make into it is expedited so that we have that prepared net in place. Certainly, the way you put the question is going to, it means an uh, intersectorial collaboration how to be engendered because NADMO and others also will have to kick in. So thanks for drawing my attention. I have to look in that area. I haven't added my mind to that, let me confess. 
that will certainly uh, look at that area when I get there. Thank you. Your, your CV shows you served as a member of the National Development Planning Commission, and you also led the National Health Insurance Scheme introduction as the Minister for Health. In fact, from concept to legislation to implementation, you are credited for the efforts that you, you made, and I want to commend you. Um, should you become the Minister for Environment, Science and Technology, what specific legacy or projects do you want to leave um, at the sector? Legacy. It's for, for me, for me, with all humility, to talk about legacies now. Let me get over this hope. But I tell you, uh, I've always described myself as a fighter. One thing that I've been thinking of is, in all humility, recommend to my president that maybe you should be thinking of a, a, a decade of innovation. A decade of innovation for this country. Because, mesty, when we talk about innovation, there are so many facets of it. So if you have a, a national dialogue, even innovation in the arts, the president has done a lot of things that people might not even realize. Even the cultural setting, this it started as Friday where people used to put on a look, look up at a fabric soon. Now is the norm. If you put in a jacket, you, you look like you are gradually even becoming an outcast. That is innovation, a mass innovation. But even me, I will be in the scientific arena. So we should have a desk which makes sure that science, technology, and innovation in all the sectors, somebody who will be looking at their work plans, their programs, and make sure that is what is the best way of doing this. Let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, one small anecdote. Even as I speak to you now, the conventional wisdom is that you do not plant cocoa seedlings in the dry season. I have stood conventional wisdom on his head, and I'm doing cocoa ray planting in the dry season. I've noticed that when you do cost-benefit analysis, and I water my seedlings, and I plant them in rows and lines, and I water them. One determinant, that is the growth of, you know, weeds. I'm able to control them, and I'm able to focus the water to the roots of the, the seedlings. So they grow faster. And by the time we come to the next rainy season, I will be up and running and I will have less mortality. I've done all the costing. So what I want to say is that that is innovation, even at my personal level. But we have to do things, we have to challenge conventional wisdom about how to do things. We are so much embedded and married to culture. Some cultures are very good, cultural elements are very good. But there are certain things that we have to bring in innovation and come in quick so that our economy will grow and we will prosper as a nation. And so that is what I want to be brought to for that. It's not a new thing, I did not invent it, but somebody who brought it to the fore that the nation buys into it. But that is, these are early days yet. The innovation thing at Mesty must be taken seriously, and it cuts across all sectors. That is why I used even the social sector as an example, and not the science sector. Thank you. Finally, um, you are a great expert in the cocoa sector, and I am a son of cocoa farmers. In the village, in Honorable Eric Okoku, bear me out. When is the cocoa season? Farmers welfare and living standards are good. But during the off season or the, the lean season, farmers go through a lot of hardship in terms of their economic living standards. What innovations can we 
do about the cocoa sector, the product, the cocoa product, so that we can have either a year-long harvest of cocoa or extra products that can be developed from either the leaves or the pod or whatever to give much more income to improve the welfare of cocoa farmers. Mr. Chairman, cocoa is a perennial crop, and its fruition is limited by the seasons. If you mitigate, you do micro, and you, you get the elements correct, you can harvest cocoa throughout the season. That's why cocoa board is even doing pilot irrigation and whatnot. They work. So, well, as head of uh, MESTI, uh, I will collaborate with my colleagues in agri and we have had info, we had informal sector. But I believe one other thing too. We have a problem in where I come from, CSSVD, cocoa soling shoot virus disease. It's a disaster. Production has slumped from about 350,000 metric tons to 150 as I speak now. But it presents an opportunity. Mr. Chairman, Ghana has mimicked or copied monocrop farming. We have an opportunity to do mixed farming or intercropping. So it's an idea I will not pretend to be uh, a better, uh, you know, more agriculturist than uh, the, the agriculturists. They have the knowledge. But I can tell you that personally, I've been doing mixed cropping. And I noticed that CSSVD does not it, it affect my cocoa trees. For example, I intercrop cocoa with nutmeg and then black pepper and then uh, 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 there used to be rubber species in some of the land that I acquired. I've left them some standing and even the the indigenous rubber, that uh, uh, Ufuntum. When you leave all these things, and uh, you, you, you can have, we can harvest them and get income all throughout. So right now, I am per acre basis, I am more from not men than cocoa. In fact, about 15 times, a bag of cocoa will first give me 660 Ghana cities. But not make they come from Techiman to come and buy. It's about 9,000 Ghana cities. Okay. So, 9,000 Ghana cities per bag? Per bag. Not make? Not make. Oh. So, we have a lot of things to do. And you see, the researchers, they will do. But monocropping is good, but we have an opportunity. That is why my colleague, we, we can pilot them at least, or even do some things like that. I believe that we are grappling with CSSVD because of monocropping. If we had to do a mix and integrated farming, and in fact, I left a coconut. I also plant coconut. So when you do that, you may, pick, you may make the tropical environment, and diseases and infestations are minimized. So there are a lot of things that we can do to we farmers who can then earn a lot of uh, uh, income. Honorable Judge. Thank you very much, yes. Mr. Chair. Honorable nominee. Yeah. Plastic waste is a menace in Ghana to the point that fishermen are now harvesting plastic waste instead of fishes. What policy direction will you give to ensure that plastic waste is not a challenge to Ghana? The chairman, plastic waste, <laughs> there will always be a challenge, but we have to manage it well. If we don't want it to be a challenge, then we have to ban it. But that is not on the radar because we can also argue the benefits from plastics. So, first of all, we have to apply technology. 
the sheer volumes must even be reduced. In recent times, and thanks to the advocacy of Professor Frimpong Watin, you see that even the package, the water bottles, they have been reduced, uh, you know, the manufacturer, they have used the, the quantum, the weight has been reduced drastically, and yet they serve, serve the same purpose. So it means the quantities must be brought down. Then, of course, our recycling effort must also be up. So we have to get, and we have an idea. It's not like we, we have to get. We have an idea about the quantum of plastics that enters this country. And then we know that there is an existing technology to recycle plastics. The problem, though, is the management system and then the economics. When you recycle, at what cost and what, what and then what will it take for somebody not to throw away the plastics, but indeed put it in uh, designated places or uh, you know, collecting centers? Those are the problems that we must solve. But I noticed that Messi has done a lot of things in that arena. There's a policy document there they have put in place. We've gone beyond policy and, and their programs and in fact even a, a pilot project which is on stream. And that's what the economic thing, that is the funding. They have put in place, Messi has put in place a system where funds will be available to make sure that these programs can be carried out. So, Madam, yes, we have the capacity and uh, where we are to recycle plastics. The solution really is recycle. But built in the uh, economic and social problems that I always pivot to. And that is where we have to direct our energies to. The technology even to do recycling as we know, is, is very, very, the various technologies abound. What would be suitable for our, uh, uh, you know, environment, we can do that. So, I believe I have to review the literature, we have to review the, pro, the programs, the policies, where there are deficits, we will come back, if necessary, to this house, so that the necessary institution is done. Thank you. Yes, I'm grateful, Honorable Chair. Congratulations, Doc. My first concern is to do with climate change. First one to Sustainable Development Goal 13. And in line with Ghana's agenda of promoting climate change, one given the note, what leadership will you provide for combating climate and its impact? Well, climate change, there are several facets to it. Ghana, as we know, as a geographical entity, is a small country, and indeed, when you distapose it to other countries, we are a small contributor to what is happening to our, you know, as far as climate change is concerned. That said, we still do contribute. And then on the other hand, even more important is the impact on Earth. Those who pollute the Earth, the impact does not respect values. So we must set up systems to mitigate their effect. That is why we must learn how to live with a climate change. Because if there is drought, then also it will affect the whole of West African sub-region and not Ghana. And we cannot go to war with <laughs> the big countries because they have brought us here. So we must tell our, our policies, our efforts, and even invoke technology to address some of these issues so that we survive as a nation. And I'm talking about technology. We have to use, for agriculture, for example, we have to use climate smart mechanisms. The previous speaker asked me about how we were going to earn income and whatnot. They are all inbuilt there. 
they are primary smart mechanisms so that we can combat drought. If, for example, if I may give a specific example, CSIR, I know if reset into rice that can res resist drought, rice species. So if uh, the real four pattern changes, uh, depending upon the geographic area, we can use those species and promote them among our farmers. So there are so many aspects of things that we, we can do, but we must look at our laws, we must look at our plans and so that we can address them because we are not an island unto ourselves and indeed even that analogy is wrong because it looks like even in the world is the island states who are suffering and indeed bearing the brunt of climate change. So in a nutshell we have things that we can do to mitigate the effects of climate but we have to scale them up and know those that are good in our situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Doc. Uh, my second concern is to do with funding of research and innovations. My, I'm a major investor of mines and technology, and Ken USD year on year undertake career fairs and innovation fairs, where young, brilliant tertiary students exhibit their inventions in technology, which cut across various sectors of the economy. At the end of the day, these brilliant inventions end at the exhibition for lack of funding to take it to the next level. One given the not doc, will you consider it needful to drive private sector robust funding and investment to develop such inventions that are being carried out across our technology tertiary institutions? Thank you. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. I have already flagged that there's a huge gap between research and industrial and agricultural applications. And that is because those entities have not made, so to speak, the appropriate noise for the Ghanaian populace to know that they are, again, to use local parents, they are there. So as a minister, I believe that to bring it, uh, if I brought to the fore the capacity, the knowledge base, that's re research institutes, and, and by uh, extension, the examples that we cited, what schools, even uh, secondary or uh, you know schools, have been able to do, and excite the Ghanaian populace. I believe that people will be more inclined to put money there. But more importantly, this thing should be economically driven. If you marry industry with research and people can manufacture things in a very, very you know, economic way, economical ways, then they are more inclined to support, they will be more inclined to support research. But of course, this thing will not happen spontaneously. So government and in a sense of the ministry to make sure that there is a C fund for this kind of activities. And the ministry, the way I see it, should be at the forefront very industry, the private sector for this kind of activity. So I have every intention to do that when I become the minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Honorable nominee. Um, somewhere in September 2020, the World Bank published a paper titled Balancing Economic Growth and Depletion of Natural Resources. And in that paper, it is estimated that in Ghana, environmental degradation costs $6.3 billion dollars annually 
or nearly 11% of Ghana's 2017 GDP. That makes environmental degradation issues in Ghana a very serious one. The Yale University also in 2020 published what they call the EPI, which ranked Ghana as 168 out of 180 countries in terms of robust activities to deal with environmental degradation. Honorable nominee, what contribution would your ministry do to reduce the environmental impact of Galamse activities when approved? Well, the preamble suggests a wider sector about environmental degradation. And in my mind's eye, Galamse is one big activity, but it's not the only culprit. So if I were to go by your preamble, we have a long discourse, but let me stick myself to the Galamse that you have cited. Indeed, Galamse has been with us for a long time. Even history, you go to where I come from, there are pits right in the middle of the forest. So people have harvested gold from the bowels of the earth since millennia. But it was with the introduction of heavy earth-moving equipment that the menace became very, very serious. And indeed, there was one empirical legislation. In retrospect, I believe that it was wrong. 1989, mining with heavy earth moving equipment, small scale mining, was legalized. And that was the bane of Ghana's environmental problems. That was the beginning of the menace that were in here. If you want to mitigate it, again, I see solace in the fact that it should be a multifactorial or sectorial approach involving society. But first, we must even educate ourselves and know the nature of the problem. Because it is about a balance sheet situation. There are certain communities, if you step there, you want to abolish Galamse, you'll be chased out. If you go to Amenfi East, those of us who I know every inch of the Western region, the chairman, permit me a little bit. What's up for 20, 30 years ago was very, very nondescript time. Now it's an urban sprawl built largely on the back of small scale money, legal and illegal. Large swathes of that community, if you went there and told them that you want to abolish currency, you have a big problem. Due to certain areas in Takwa, Christia, and so on. So we must have an honest discussion what we want. Because governments upon governments upon governments since that 19, a political 1989 uh, proclamation or enactment have tried to stop that st uh, stem that tide without any solution in sight. If I may prefer some solutions. First, technology, we must roll it back. Two, we must have a national dialogue and say that our generation is becoming perhaps too selfish. The gold in the bowels of the earth in Ghana does not belong to our generation alone. So we must regulate it severely. So if I may use the Wasa Amefi is example, we should have a law that says that based on the available resources that we have, perhaps no more than 
50 square kilometers should be mined at any point in time. I'm using that as an example. Just like we, we regulate frequency moderation in this country, because we cannot allow everybody to set up a radio station in Accra, right? So we have not addressed that question. It looks like the Minerals Commission and other regulatory bodies, once there's a fine, then it means you, you, uh, people can go and mine. Then, so we can develop that argument. Then I have this idea that earth moving equipment in mining areas must be severely regulated and must be tied to the all fight there. For example, again, my fee is, I'm not targeting them. Example, if they are going to do only, if, if, if they are about 20 mining sites, then maybe there shouldn't be any more than, let's say, 20, 25 excavators should be regulated. But even more importantly, we should make, have a census of excavators in this country, and we should even consider a temporary ban on them. Because when we bring the excavators to this country, what are they going to do? I have con contacted my engineering friends, and they have an idea how many excavators we need in the road sector, for example. You take it from the population of excavators in this country, it means they are all destined towards the small scale my, my factor. So we should have a census. Decommission some of them, sell off them off, and then put a ban on their importation and by attrition get the numbers that we can use to do mining, small scale mining. Remember, I told you that we should regret even the quantum that we are going to mine. And then, Mr. Chama, if you allow me, there is one particular equipment in that chain of operation called a uh, washing plant. If you go to Asiapa, if you go to uh, uh, Bogosu, if you go to Tapa, by the roadside, people, electrical engineers and blacksmiths, they are manufacturing those washing plants. They are for single purpose use and they are distinct towards the uh, water bodies. So we should criminalize the unlicensed manufacture of washing plants. Because you know that that washing plant is going to be used to do galamse in water bodies. And they should be put at the assembly so those who have been licensed to do, they take special permits so that it can be manufactured for them. So these are, once you put on these impediments in their way, and you, solve, you sell the idea to Ghanaians that our generation is not entitled, and that maybe over the next decade we are entitled to only maybe uh, 50, uh, 10, uh, whatever, 1,000 uh, fine ounces of the gold fine, and we are leaving the rest for our grandchildren. Then we will have the reason directly, the, the basis for action. Until we do that, I know all our actions will end in failure. And of course, the criminal aspect, we just passed a law. Nobody has been put in the dock and sent to prison. We were here when you were said that if you, you, you somehow you fell far of the law in certain aspects, you could go to jail for 25 years. I'm yet to hear of anybody. So when we combine all those things, this environmental degradation and the contribution therefore from Galaxy will be severely assuaged and this country will be the better for it. So that's why but I do not prefer to know all this knowledge. This is a personal thing that I'm bringing to the fore. But when I go to the ministry, I'll bring all these things for consideration. There are better experts out there. So that is that. Thank you. All right. Honorable nominee, my second question has to do with um, environmental officers and enforcement of environmental standards. I realize that most of the environmental challenges we have is as a result of lack of enforcement of environmental laws at the assembly, district assembly, and municipal assembly levels. One word, Kate, we used to have, uh, is it town council, which we used to call Tangasi. 
and those times living at a, a new town, anytime you hear that Tangasi is coming or somebody is coming around, it's always uh, the time that everyone wants to enforce standards around. Are you considering a collaboration with the local government ministry and various MMDAs to reintroduce uh, the local environmental uh, officers to enforce environmental standards as a way of improving our environment? Well, we have evolved. So the tanker's concept exists in this modern form. But I get from you is that we must enforce the laws. That was why I have been hammering on sociology education. If the people do not accept it, it won't work. So we have to educate ourselves. So I agree with you, but maybe not in the old pre-colonial or post-colonial, immediate post-colonial tank council methodology. Those things will not work now. So in which way would you make it work now? Well, I will have a couple of suggestions to make to the local government uh, ministry because those things, they are within its ambit. But there's one thing that I want to say, I've been discussing with people. The EPA is an enforcer. It's an implementer, it's certain as well an enforcer. And it seems to me, reading the literature, that it was set up in adversarial situation in position to several government agencies. So, we have to collaborate with the agencies, yes, I'm not uh, invoking, uh, uh, bringing in any radical ideas. But I want to say that I want to see the old case where the EPA, upon the intrans intransigence of Les Minerals Commission, and after getting all the clearances that I can, the EPA can then put the Minerals Commission or Forestry Commission in the dock for infractions, persistent infractions. That is my, the limit to which I can go. But the others that you are citing, they belong to another ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, don't know what Brian Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, nominee. Uh, this question is more on science, technology, and innovation. See that you've answered a lot of questions on the environment. Um, nominee, NASA just landed a Perseverance rover on Mars. As a country, we are grappling with basic problems of identification and waste management. Now, the fact is that if you look at the space race, if we don't get there within the next 30 years, we won't find space by the time we get there thereafter. The question, is there a space policy being pursued by the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation? And if there is, are you going to work to ensure that within these four years, at least something will lift off the ground, even if we don't get anywhere, so that we have hope that we are going to pursue a space agenda? Thank you. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. Ghana, like the rest of Africa, should be interested in space. It is not an exotic thing. In fact, most of the things that comes from space exploration and the technologies that lead to it have application on uh, terrestrial Earth. A good example is <laughs> mobile telephony. And like I've said, even if we've made the basic sciences our contribution, at least there are applications we should be interested. Because space has application in meteorology. So if you want to do precision meteorology, how to make better forecast weather and all that, we should be interested in space exploration. It doesn't mean that we are building our own rockets and whatnot. There are a lot of satellites out there which can provide them with the data and whatnot. And of course, we should be having uh, receiving stations, so to speak. That is why I 
that country say here, a beginning has been made. The Ghana uh, space, uh, the Afro, uh, that observatory, it was commissioned by the president himself. That is a beginning. So we must not think that space exploration and the derivatives therefore are an exotic phenomenon which should be led, left to the developed world alone. As we speak now, you know that a small country like UAE has set an, an object into space and is going to explore a mass. Even now, we are in uh, Martian space. Ghana certainly can compare itself to United Arab Emirates, if even we do not, we are not as wealthy as they are. At least population wise, land size and whatnot. So we should be very interested. But we can also do that in collaboration with our neighbors. That is why Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria we can get our act together. And in collaboration, we can get some of these things going. So, yes, as a minister, I will explore these possibilities. And if there is a niche area that Ghana can express itself, Ghana can express itself, we shall do that. Okay, I, I have a specific question. Do we have a space policy? Yes, there is. There are rudiments, or they are not rudiments. They, I know that there are space policy, but it has. It is within the confines of Mesty, so we have to. The draft policies are there. Is there a roadmap to ensure that we and our partners are in space at some point? And if so, what is that point? Mr. Speaker, I did not get the last one. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Is there a roadmap to get us into space at some point? And if so, what is that point? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of that, how to find out. It's not everything I'm going there, and let me confess that it's not everything that I've come to. There could be, but honestly, I do not know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I must be for Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would like to take the nominee to COVID-19 response and how, like no other time, COVID has reminded us that science, research, and development must lead, and we must invest massively. Clearly, countries that invested in R&D are doing better in developing a vaccine and uh, having the facilities, the testing kits and all of that, the basic infrastructure to fight the pandemic. We have still not met the AU target of 1% uh, of GDP for research and development. How can you take advantage of the times we are in and scale up support, uh, not only government resource allocation, but also mobilizing resources from non-state actors so that as a country we can begin to invest more aggressively in research and development, meet the 1% target uh, of, of GDP which has eluded us uh, for, for years now, and, uh, and build a strong capacity to be led by science. Mr. Chairman, the need for a very robust research and development system is so self-evident that I believe that the advocacy for it will register on the Ghanaian public. 
the question is funding. And like the Honorable Committee member said, I'm aware, or like he, he has a very mind, mind to the fact that under the Lagos protocols, government should at least set aside 1% of their GDP per annum to do research and R&D activities. So, as a, and indeed, my predecessor has brought, I'm aware, that we sent to cabinet a document which has been approved that at least 1% of our annual budget, our GDP, should be spent in the R&D sector. When I go out, find out whether, if it needs legislative backing, then I intend bringing it as fast as possible to this house, so that it has a legal backing. In fact, I prefer that option because it will then uplift all government and we will all be we all sign to it. Either government will succeed itself or a different government succeeding a different government. So that should be one of my mandates. So a beginning has been made and have cited detailed proposal in the policy document and, and, and so we have to find out whether there are elements of legislation that have been made. If that has, then I will speed it up and bring it, uh, you know, send it to cabinet and then bring it to this. Of course, that decision will have to be made by the president in consultation. And if it's going to be done by an executive fiat too, then it means that the pathway then will be very short indeed. Then I have to prevail on my superiors because we have a, we are running a four year, you know, electoral cycle is done as soon as possible. But more importantly, this one, the sustainability question will come in when industry itself appreciates the importance of R&D. And in that one, I have made several references to it, even in questions that have been asked before. So the private sector will have to be brought on board through several regimes. I noticed that, Mr. Chairman, the even one percent is on the low side because places like South Korea and elsewhere, they are doing two percent or one point five percent of their GDP. But that is another matter. Even one percent, we have to read there. So we take that first step, and I'll make the advocacy for it to be above even what the Lagos Protocol recommended. Thank you. Related to that, Mr. Chairman, is the amazing innovations that have come up during this COVID era in Ghana, local innovation. I have a few listed here, KNUST and Incas Diagnostics. They have developed rapid test kits uh, waiting for FDA approval. You have the Red Bed Health Tech Company that has developed a sophisticated diagnosing app. You have Professor Fred Bagonlori and his students at Academic City College who have developed an affordable ventilator. You have Team Marvel that won an award. Uh, patients Norte, Nelly Apete, and Ishmael Asari for developing ventilators. You have uh, Dr. Emil, Emeline Opoku who also has developed the diagnosis mobile app for health workers. You have Cognate Systems that has also developed a, a special health assistance app. And the list goes on and on and on. But you talk to all of these innovators and they say that they are not receiving support. If approved, how can you reach out to these amazing innovations that have come up in these times so that 
you can give them the needed government backing by way of policy, by way of resources, to have it commercialized, because it will not only help us in developing our scientific capacity, it also has industrial and job creation opportunities. How can you assure this committee that you reach out to all of these local innovators who are winning international awards, making waves, but don't seem to be getting the needed governmental support? Mr. Chairman, innovations engendered by COVID many in the African continent, so many everywhere. And Ghana is no exception. The examples that we have cited exist. Yes, but there are problems with applicability. So specifically what you tend to do is to have a, a team of members who a scientists who will evaluate the applicability of these innovations because we have to get a certain criteria that these innovations will satisfy so that they can be helped because a bottom line is that there should also be an economic criteria because if the innovation does not bring economic benefits then in essence it belongs to the basics it means this thing is possible but if you are talking you have to look at applicability then the other aspect of it of these innovations and diagnosis or the technical innovations uh, in terms of uh, 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 equipment and then diagnosis is that intellectual property protection is very, very weak in this country. So we have to up it and look at that regime so that anybody who brings an idea to the fore, his intellectual property is not stolen. If you do not do that, people might not bring to one. In fact, it's a very a big moral and ethical issue, so we have to look at it. Especially when I'm thinking of calling for a decade of innovation in this country. So, thank you, it has brought to the fore. But certainly, in a very small way, COVID, that one, you do not, COVID has not the, uh, the, the routine laws and routine regimes, COVID, you, you wave them aside. So we have a small team to look at them, and those that have potential, by all means, we look at those things and make sure that they be applicable in the Ghanaian situation. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to pick the nominee's thoughts on climate change. Uh, yesterday, the United States returned to the Paris Climate Change Accord under President Biden. Uh, the climate change debate. There are as those who belong to the developing countries school of thought who say that we have to be measured with our targets and, and how we, we pursue climate change goals because the, our developed counterparts did not have these climate change limitations and allowed them to industrialize and they are now at a particular pedestal and that we should be mindful how we follow them at this point in our development where where do you do you stand uh, are you with those who are a bit more skeptical and say that let's uh, develop first and and be a bit mindful about the climate change uh, research outcomes, or you think that we should leapfrog and we should uh, confront the reality of climate change and uh, go along with the developed world and uh, be more uh, aggressive at adapting to the climate change threat. I want to know where you stand in, in this debate and where we can expect you as the policy leader uh, on this matter, if nominated, which direction you will move this country? 
Mr. Chairman, implicit in the question is the idea that this, uh, this climate change issue is a binary issue. It is not. A whole lot of conversation and science is in there, built through the millennia. Those are, have developed. Those countries, yes, they had a free ride and used their world resources to get to where they are. And we are here. And they are telling us that, in fact, tropical world is the lungs of the world. So we should be the carbon sinks that is in the CO2 and all that. I understand all those issues. But whether we like it or not, they have lived from this and in this, <laughs> they are still spewing out those gases that is even as we speak, making that climate, aggravating the climate. So I'm very happy that President Biden has returned the U.S. of A to the uh, Paris Accord because they were one of the key abusers from the other planet. That said, as a minister and general being a small country, I believe that whether we like it or not, climate change is real. And there's a limit to what we can do. That is why in one of the questions that we should develop climate smart systems so that we can survive as a nation. But more importantly, we demand from those countries as of right that they should do environmental restitution. And if Ghana, Nigeria, DRC and whatnot, we are the carbon sinks of this world, the lungs of this world, then we should receive recompense for that. It doesn't have to come in the form of money. It can be technological assistance to beat this self same climate change and to assist it. And this thing can be costing. And in fact, they have a moral obligation to do that. So that is my take on that. It's not a binary issue. You cannot say that I'm for them or against them. Thank you, sir. Very well. Okay, Eric. Eric is not ready. Yes, Honorable. Honorable nominee, you have already spoken about um, plastic waste management, but um, I'd like to find out from you, given the fact that um, plastic is a persistent pollutant which poses grave danger to our soil, a Greek. When ruminants feed on plastic, they, they, they die. I'd like to know from you whether you would not consider an outright ban on plastic, the importation, manufacture, and distribution of plastic, like the Rwandans have done. Today, if you go to Rwanda, it's one of the cleanest cities because they have banned the distribution, manufacture, and importation of plastic. Mr. Chairman, ban plastics or not. That's a, a very difficult one. As a new minister entering the scientific arena, I have to immerse myself and listen to all the conversation and the arguments and whatnot, the scientific basis, the data, and the economic basis pertaining to our situation before one makes that pronouncement. What I know is that we can certainly lessen our dependency on plastics and certain steps have been taken. We can also do recycling and all that. But whilst we are at it, we will have to monitor what other countries have done and their situation have, if they have lessons for us that we can copy. After all, we are living in an interdependent world. Then we may want to consider what they've done and see whether we can do. But for now, I do not have all the information that is available <laughs> to make such a categorical pronouncement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman. My second question, 
has to do with the certification. Um, Ghana ratified the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification in 1996. But ever since we signed and ratified that convention, it appears not much has been achieved in our uh, um, collective quest to deal with desertification. The hardest um, hit regions of the country, the northern regions, and this phenomenon has largely contributed to the north-south migration. So if you have Kaya here today, I mean, it's as a direct result of desertification in northern Ghana. If you are given the nod, what would you do to ensure that the UN Convention is fully implemented in our country to root out or at least control desertification in our country? Mr. Chairman, again, the question even begs another question. It, it is not lost on anybody that desertification is a phenomenon which is which threatens our very livelihoods and even our very lives. And we were just talking about climate change and all. Oh, desertification, if you take away the trees that the uh, flora, you generate carbon dioxide and you contribute to the CO2 in the uh, atmosphere. So the question for combating desertification, we do not even need an international treaty to see for ourselves that it is something that we must do. Having said that, it means all the activities that generate potential desertification, we must attend them. And this one demands also intersectorial approach, land use policy, agricultural lands, the sort of tree crops that we plant, the our the technology that we use to do tropical agriculture, all those things will have to be looked at, and the necessary policies and the necessary programs and the necessary technologies that will stop the certification will have to be, uh, you know, looked at so that we can fight. So, yes, as a minister, I know that it is a big issue, and I happen to have toured uh, the, the northern <laughs> regions of this country. But I tell you, it is not even a phenomenon which is peculiar to the northern regions of this country. At the turn of the century, where I hail from, it was all forest land. Now they have been thinned out so that, again, my favorite crop, I noticed that cocoa is migrating south. Bia East, the Bia districts, cocoa does not thrive well there. Now it's cashew, it does well there. So it's all, it, it, it's, it's, it's a spectrum which is coming south, you know, down south. So we must fight and do the necessary ecological restitution in a very holistic way. And that's why we have to look at policies and programs and then look at the various sectorial actors so that we can act in concert to stop this. Okay, now leaders. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable nominee, this is just an aside. Uh, just going through um, preparing for this, I came across an article that puts you as one, that lists you as one of the richest men in Ghana. I came across an article that listed you as one of the richest men in Ghana. And I, 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 I wonder if you will uh, want to make a comment on that. But my question relates to CSIR and the Ghana uh, Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, the CSIR, for example, I do know, uh, seem to be running out of researchers and scientists. 
due to either retirement or poor remuneration. And I'm sure it is agreed that uh, after uh, Osajipo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966, uh, science technology and innovation seem to have uh, gone down, especially as the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission was supposed to lead the way. I'm just thinking if you have talked about these two institutions and the role that they can play in STI and what you intend to do, especially uh, given the fact that these institutions seem to be running out of the necessary human resource that is required to drive whatever vision that led to their establishment as a result of either retirement or poor remuneration. Mr. Chairman, again, another difficult area because the determinants of this problem are many. It starts with training even in the especially the secondary schools because if you do not have a critical mass of numbers that will take the science-based subjects in the universities who will then apply themselves in the applied science arena where essentially DCSIR and uh, GAEC are those are applied sciences they, they, they have a base where they, they feed from so to speak they feed from so the problem should be looked at the scientific culture, and we have answered this previously, and I've given an affirmation that, yes, we work with education so that we have that critical mass. I even went to give a ratio that in, in, in secondary institutions, the science to the humanities should be in the ratio of maybe 60, 70 percent to 30. And indeed, everybody should have even a science basic like the U.S. system. I school a bit in the U.S. so that everybody has an appreciation of what has happened up to a certain level. Then when we branch into those specialties, indeed in the universities, then the sciences, especially those critical areas that are in need, that is why we have to have an incentive mechanism, scholarships to go into specific areas. Then following that, you cited remuneration. If we put our value on it, and that they are, and we link them to industry, I'm sure they are, they are remuneration and the recompense for them will be up. And that is why we will retain. Because when we even we train those people, it is not that people do not want to branch in those fields, but in fact they leave further afield into especially the developed world where salaries are better. But at least we can make an effort. And it is the only way we can do that is to link them to the productive industries so that we can retain them. Right. Um, landfill sites. Um, I wish that could be my uh, substantive question, but um, I'm sure it will come up. So let me um, go to controversial um, assessments that have been done of members of parliament. Um, one that was recently done by the University of Ghana and another that was done by Odikro some time ago did not uh, capture you favorably uh, by way of uh, attendance to uh, uh, your duties as a member of parliament. And that's why I refer to them as controversial reports, because I am aware of the controversy those reports generated. But both reports did not capture you favorably. Uh, given the role and the tax that you are expected to perform as Minister of Environment, uh, what, what can you say about this past, you know, research reports that did not show uh, that commitment that is required uh, of one who is representing a constituency in this house? Well, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I wonder which report is referring to. 
because in my first term I was a regional minister. And indeed, if you ask the majority leader, Honorable Osei Chemesa, I have occasion that he had always praised me that I always made an effort to be in attendance. So I'm very, very, very amazed. That research, their methodology <laughs> should be questioned because indeed I came, uh, I'm sure that I had the right balance between visits to my constituency, the ministerial duties at the regional level. And remember, that was the time we were canvassing for a region, for the Western North. So uh, those reports and the group, they, 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 I, honestly, they, they are very unscientific. So, so honestly, I do not. But to answer you specifically, my ministerial duties and my attendance in Parliament, you want to place a bet? Me, I am one person who puts a lot of premium on my parliamentary because there is a history behind me. Nobody has suffered to become a minister, uh, an MP more than me. So I don't joke with my MP duties and everybody will attest to that. So <laughs> I, I do not know where they got that thing from. I was given a specific duty to midwife a region into being West North where I came from. I turned in with all the girls to that I could. So if I didn't get the balance right vis-a-vis -vis attendance, that should not be a yes thing for anybody to make projections. Well, you can only know how much you have suffered. You cannot know how much others you have suffered. So to declare yourself as the one who has suffered the most is quite interesting. But uh, finally on landfill sites, I have one in my constituency that is very, very disturbing. I see the uh, folds around Kula in my constituency, uh, around the landfill site, sometimes trying to work a living, even as they uh, face the uh, dangers that are associated with spillage and other toxic materials that come uh, from these landfill sites. Uh, the controversy has always been really under whose control are these landfill sites, local government ministry and all the sanitation ministry. Uh, yet these are, you know, uh, these have effects on the environment and the people who live in those uh, communities. I want to uh, find out what your approach will be, uh, as especially other countries have long moved away from these landfill sites as ways of disposing uh, uh, waste. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you previous responses. A combination of technology, legislation, sociology. Let me explain. Landfill sites. We are saying we are moving away from it. Yes, it's tied into recycling. And the recycling agenda lies partly with us, EPA and others. So we will make sure that we up our game and get the capacity for recycling. Recently, when the president went around doing the campaign, you, you are sure that you had a several places where recycling of waste material is going to be done to generate, uh, you know, fertilizers. And by, in fact, waste material actually is a resource if well handled. So we we'll look at that. But we are talking about capacity issues. We might not be able to do it in every place. And we are transitioning from landfills to recycling. In that, as far as that is concerned, it means whilst we are in transit, certain laws must be enforced. And I have said notice that after talking to even our own entities, the EPA should not shy away from sending entities, not individuals. Of course, individuals can be sent to court. But I want to see an example being made, and I mentioned a couple of them. Entities, yes, government agencies, we should collaborate first. But if there's a sure dereliction of duty, 
and an entity is sent to court, I don't want to mention an, an example, the CEO of that entity, I'm sure, will fall, I'm sure, by even public suasion, will be forced to do what is needful. So we should say, I will not, uh, I can consider that uh, anger. But on the other hand, we believe that uh, the way to go is recycling, really, so that we can make use of the waste and turn them into other things. Thank you. Are you really worth $180 million? Are you really worth $180 million? Well, I don't know where that thing is coming from. I, I don't know. I refuse to. At least I have not been cited for, uh, for a public theft. <laughs> but what matters is that you are a very serious farmer. I'm hearing here that you, you cultivate nutmegs. When people import them from elsewhere, you cultivate them here. That's very commendable. Yes, Honorable Minister Nome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a follow-up to the last response the nominee gave on um, landfill sites and recycling. Source separation of waste, separating our garbage at source to promote recycling. Is it something that you would consider um, promoting? Waste is also exported to other countries. Some Scandinavian countries actually import waste to feed their recycling industry. So if we manage this space properly, it could be a major um, import earner for Ghana. Would you look at um, source separation of waste and all that is required for it, legislation, public education and all that. Thank you. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, two questions, two things that uh, Honorable Slavuzu has had. Source separation, yes. Absolutely. We must do it, separate the solids and the biodegradables from the non-degradables. But it's a cultural phenomenon. It's a cultural phenomenon. We have to do education so that it is embedded in the public polity. So it, it is something that we have to train people to imbibe and do. So the education will have to go in thing. And indeed, uh, where it comes from, for example, feeding ruminants. Can you imagine? Let me go even further. Plantain peels. If we, 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 we buy from the markets and we buy the what we are going to use today and maybe tomorrow in the peeled form and they are packaged for you, leave the peels behind in the markets, we can aggregate them, cut them into pieces and feed ruminants. We are going to gain. So this thing doesn't take exotic science to do this. So that's what I mean by sociology and culture. Some of these things are not even science. So we can do that, madam. And then export of waste. Well, we have to look at it. Because if what we are saying is true, we may end up even uh, being a net importer of waste even from our geographical region. Those countries who hopefully may, we have the capacity to generate energy, uh, fertilizer and other things, products from waste. Then I can see Ghana importing from Côte d'Ivoire to go and add waste. So, well, if in the interim we have to export because we don't have the capacity, we have to look at the economics of it and then give the necessary permits for that to be done. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I would like the nominee to tell us what he will do to assist the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to strengthen its monitoring and evaluation and enforcement to follow up on whether the permits recipients are abiding by their conditions of their permits. I mean, people in the mining, telecommunications, forestry, oil and gas, and many other sectors need an EPA's permit to be able to conduct their activities. But after the permits are issued, what is done to monitor the implementation to ensure that they are actually being applied. 
Mr. Uh, Mandela, the consequential question is, uh, you know that place there is some echo problem there, you can hear. Uh, very well. What is that? What is being done? Please, can you help me? What would you do to assist the Environmental Protection Agency to strengthen its monitoring and evaluation of the permits that it actually issued to those who apply for those permits, whether in telecommunications, mining, forestry, oil and gas sector, and to enforce the conditions of their own legislation. After the permits are issued, do they follow up to ensure that they are actually abiding by the terms of those permits? And what would you do to assist them to strengthen the mechanisms to enforce their own legislation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The permits have expiration dates. To one of the issues is that some of them, once the permits are issued, let me admit that there is no follow-up, and even though we might have the data, to see that they are renewed. Then the other problem is a, you know, capacity issue in terms of a human resource. The EPA is very, very thin in the, on the ground in the regions and their districts. In fact, when, when I, before I came here, naturally I contacted the heads of the various agencies and one of the issues that came up was that they have a, a problem with uh, recruiting staff into that area. So yes, we have to build their capacity so that they have their necessary skills even to inspect them, but also we have to put boots on the ground in terms of numbers at the operational level, because invariably these activities happen in their districts. So that is what I intend to Because if they do not monitor to see whether the, the, the entities are operating in accordance with the law, then it's as if they are operating only from their offices. And the mischief that this is intended to solve would still be uh, perpetrated. Now, noise pollution is also environmental pollution, and it can even cause mental health challenges for us, particularly in these areas when people are locked down and can't have um, other activities to take their minds off the challenges that we're facing with COVID and all of that. Our churches, mosques, nightclubs, bars in residential areas are the main sources of some of this noise pollution. What are you going to do to ensure that we minimize the scourge, which may even be affecting our health? Mr. Chairman, noise pollution is a big and very difficult area. But that said, it doesn't mean we should not enforce the laws of the land. Because of our cultural settings, there's resistance from certain segments of society with regard to noise. So we have to, we will embark on massive public education as far as noise pollution is concerned. And in certain instances, give uh, ultimatums and then enforce the law. I believe that, as a physician, I know that, like she rightly pointed out, noise pollution is a very, very important problem in this country, but we do not appreciate it. So we should put in place systems that can even measure, because we have simple implements that can measure the number of decibels that we've gone over, but unless we have that capacity to you know, measure all those things. And I notice that we do not have a lot of them in place. So we have to get the law. The law is there, but we, consequential legislation will have to be reviewed. And then, more importantly, embark on massive education nationwide so that we come to a point where people themselves will see the severity of the problem and be self-compliant 
But then in those instances where people are recalcitrant, we enforce the law. My final question is, um, what are you going to do to promote science, technology, education and mathematics, uh, engineering and mathematics he, he has answered that question. and training for girls? He's answered that he question. has answered that question. For girls? Yes. Okay, thank you. On STEM. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm, I'm really constrained with time because it's time for uh, Friday prayers. I hope prayers start soon. Yeah, I, I, I can see that you're also praying that it starts soon. So I may be grateful if the nominee will just take my questions and then I can run out, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Hoping that you may ask the full house for me. I have a number of questions that. I have a number of questions that relate to land encroachment with regards to CSR, that's uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Their lands across this country are really, really being encroached. And you've served as the Minister for Lands and uh, Forestry before, so I'm sure you are very much familiar with this. And in some instances, they are finding it very difficult to get the Land Commission to assist them to hold on to their lease, that will help them to be able to protect this. What will you do to curb this? And second has to do with innovation. I mean, in an early answer to your question, there yeah, you try to explain, we all know the importance of innovation and research work, but the current funding mechanism, if it continues, then I'm sorry, very soon nobody will be interested in I mean, uh, working on any research work. What innovative measures will you put in place to ensure that there's some funding, dedicated funding, to support uh, innovation in the development of our country? And Mr. Chairman, the last group of questions that I have has to do with the GMO. That's the genetically modified f food. I just want to know your position on it and what is your views on all the talk about GMO? Also, you know, sorry, that Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, since 2012, has been researching into GMO cowpea, that in their uh, work believe that it has the potential to curb the Maruka pest destruction. They have currently even applied to the National Biosafety Authority for, to enable them to release this uh, crop into the general population. But unfortunately, the Minister for Agri Food and Agriculture on 14th March 2019, when he met the development partners, had this to say that Ghana does not need GMO to ensure food sufficiency and security. What is your view on this? Whilst this is happening, unfortunately you have the Minister of Agri has a different view. As a medical doctor yourself, and knowing very well that you've been in this area for long, can you say that GMOs are 100% safe for consumption for which Ghana should allow them to test that, even though I know we've done the biosafety law already. And Mr. Chairman, lastly, as you proceed to the Ministry of Environment, if this house gives you the opportunity, will you encourage CSI to continue its push on more research on GMOs, possibly against the views of the life of the Minister for Agri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope that uh, probably, Mr. Chairman, you help me with the follow-ups. If he answers, we have to run to the uh, Chairman, he has to go for Friday prayers. I would have to stay with the Honorable uh, Tampule. It means you're also going. Okay, I'm obliged to support Chairman. But whilst the answer where is need for Chairman for me to come in on a follow-up, I will. And I trust that the leadership on this side will allow me also. I'm not late yet. If I take my questions, I still can join any mocks, which is around 130, 135. Thank you. Yeah, the number of them. You may take them one by one and be as short as possible. Mr. Chairman, land encroachment. 
these are legal issues. We have to find out. I will have to find out what are the real issues. If we have to have recourse to the law, we will do that and take back, back the land. That's the answer. Funding for innovation. I think I've answered in several questions that have. And I, uh, I even called for a decade of innovation and it's undeserved funding from industry and end users and the private sector and how government should be set up a dedicated fund. So I've answered that. The GMO position, again, there are several issues in there. And to force the minister to take a position is not fair. I happen to know that the issues are not even about biosafety issues, but the ability to conserve your gene uh, pool, the variation, because the potential to, uh, to make us genetically dependent on outside of and it has implication even for our national security. These are the real issues, but it is not even the biological safety, so to speak, because my God, a lot of GMOs are, are safe. They are safe. That as a scientist, I will say that it has been in the USA, they use a lot of genetically modified entities, and as far as I'm concerned, their mortalities are as, as simple. But inbuilt there is the safety and the, the economics, because some of them have patented some of these things, and if you become very reliant on them, it means your genetic pool, you lose them forever, and if there's a catastrophe, you cannot go back to those things that were native to your environment. Again, if some of these things should escape into the environment, they can actually replicate themselves and populate your nation and change the flora and fauna of your nation. So when there are experts out there, we have to listen to them and see what can be done. But having said that, there are several things, researches that have improved local varieties that we are, they are sitting on shelves, which can give comparable results to GMO uh, identified entities that we have not even used, that I have talked to before. And then he asked about Sari. Uh, he's not here, I've forgotten. Savannah... Yes, yeah, Savannah Agriculture Research Institute. He says, uh, as they run down, I forgot the question that they are undertaking some small studies. Will you encourage them and oh, find as for the studies, they can take a permit from EPA, and if it's certified, there is always a committee on GMO. And if all the biosafety precautions are taken, studies are permitted. So they you will support them to undertake those studies. Pardon? Will you support them to undertake those studies? Yes, I'm saying that the law even permits those studies to be done. As to their wide application, because before even you get a permit to do those studies, there is a committee, I've forgotten the uh, official name of the committee, but there's always a local entity, a uh, committee of scientists who make sure that those entities will not escape into the environment and cause all the pictures that I've pointed here to fall. But there is there. It doesn't mean that we cannot, uh, at the research level, uh, deal with GMOs. It is only when we want to deploy on commercial business that we have a, a lot of issues there, and I've enumerated them. And then, uh, that is all. Council for, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, he asked for your view on a particular matter on it. On particular? Your view on Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Yes. The land encroachment issue I've, I've, I've said, and then it apply, it's applicable to uh, the Kwabinya, um, what do you call it? Uh, Ghana Atomic Energy, GAEP 2. So there are land issues there. But we have to look at the law. I mean, the law is the law. So if people have encroached and we have to deal with them, Man, I will be Chairman, Minister-designate, your answer is specific. You've used Kwabinya. 
The Honorable Muntaka wanted to find out that across the country there is unacceptable encroachment on all Council for Scientific and Industrial Research land. What will you do if you become minister to halt the unacceptable practice? He, he has answered that one. That was what he answered first, yes. He said the legal matters, so he will look at the legal matters. But Chairman, legal matters is not enough. You have your land, they are taking it. He should tell us what he will do to secure those oh, lands. Preventive one, those in our country say the more the normal you call the Akan, you have to buy. That one step we will take. Now, then those that the are gone will be very difficult. He has translated. To which uh, uh -huh. those that are lost, we will, we will draw a perimeter around those that are not lost, so we secure them. And then those that have been taken, we will go and use the necessary legal instruments to retrieve them. Yes. Um, um, I'll try and be brief. Doc, um, come with me to environmental impact assessment and a huge requirement and you know it's a basic requirement for setting up a number of uh, setups in this country now in one of my theses it came out clearly that the EPA often subcontracts uh, the pursuit of e uh, environmental impact assessment to private hands and then often it turns out that it compromised. What will you do under your leadership to ensure that we don't compromise the conduct of environmental impact assessment? Mr. Chairman, these are moral issues, moral hazards. So we have to put in place a mechanism. Those private entities who do that, either personnel or organizations, offer our books and we do not deal with them. And then indeed, if there are avenues for sanctioning, we will take that recourse. But certainly, uh, as a believer in, in the private sector collaboration, I don't think we have to, because of that uh, reason, we have to not deal with the private sector. I only uh, I, I decried the death of uh, uh, personnel, <laughs> you know, that we know how. Then, on the other hand, to we, we even you cannot say in absolute uh, certain terms that even the public personnel there in the public service they might be any better. So, um, the carbon trade concept, which is hugely advocated globally and developing can, developed countries have taken huge advantage and in our parts of the world we seem to be lacking behind because of capacity. What is your own assessment of our drive towards building our capacity to buy into the carbon trade concept and also rake in the necessary benefits to our country? Well, the carbon trade center has been beset with a lot of problems. You know, I don't want to mention some countries' needs, but I have been issued certain countries thought that it was the potential for a rip off from the developed world to the developing world existed, and they were contesting some of the issues there and the assignments that have been made in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, values that have been put on certain activities. But that said, we also have a problem with tapping into that thing because of a, 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 it's a, a highly technical issue. So I don't know what is happening in my ministry. If the technical impediments in terms of capacity to uh, write or uh, apply with the, within the necessary format and whatnot. If we are we, able to do that, then I will look at it and then make sure that Mesti does it so that Ghana will, will be able to assess the fact. But my understanding is that 
There are certain countries who do not even, as a matter of principle, agree to that arrangement. And I don't want to mention one big country that has been mentioned here to fall before. But that said, the real issue, let me repeat, is that it's a highly technical area and we need very, very technically competent people who are very conversant in the area so that your paper will even, or submissions will even be accepted in the first place. That's the brief that I, I got. But when I get there, there will, will be other issues. So when I get there, we, we, we will have to look at it. And then I suspect our country might also be, be too keen to assess it for various reasons. Because you have to also uh, come out with certain pre, there are preconditions to attach to it. So we have, it's a big problem. So maybe we'll have the conversation in detail some other time. But my last question is related to e-waste. I'm aware uh, Germans have been helping us. If you go to Abu Bushi now, there have been a number of interventions to get our top uh, concerns about e-waste. I know you are also concerned and passionate about this. Do you have any predetermined programs or plans to deal with e-waste in our country? Indeed, let me give credit to my predecessor. There are a, 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 a very, very elaborate plans in Mesti now. Some of them, like I'm saying, might even need legislative backing. Uh, and the others, the, the, the programs we have, naturally everything evolves. So when I get there, I have to look at it. And then if there are any gaps there, and if there any level that I'll have to take it to, I'm certainly interested in that area. And we will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm done. Um, Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Honorable Member, what's the full name of your constituency? The constituency, how do you call it? So you also. How many polling stations do you have? 100 and 68. So is it true that a ballot box was burned at coalition in the last elections? Well, I heard reports that I was not a witness to that. Wasn't burned, was snatched and destroyed. Was a mob went into it and they, they destroyed it. Ah, okay. So your okay. So your collector resource was less than ballot box. Pardon? Your collector resource was less than ballot box. No. Ah, okay. Uh, it's appreciated. It's appreciated. Yes. I I I enjoy your depth intellectually, but Minister for Environment, the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission have major constraints, indeed financial constraints. They cannot even afford payment of subscription to SKA and then the two loss of their land are lost. They are also suffering problems of encouragement. This is captured in the handing over notes of your outgoing minister. What will you do to address these matters? Thank you. Well, then I will have to honor its international obligations and agreements that have been entered to. So, yes, I read it from the news too. So I have to find the nature of the problem. And then uh, negotiate with the Minister of Finance or whatever entity that France are going to come from and pay up. We simply have no choice. We have to pay up. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, thank you. I would lump it up. Plant Genetic, Genetic Resources Research Institute, Bonsu, Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, Sale, Nyangpala, Soya Research Institute, Kwada Sukumasi, Water Research, and then they all generally have problems. What will you do about it?
so that they are efficient in the delivery which they undertake. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I didn't hear that they were having pro they are having problem with staffing. 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 Yes. Uh, experienced and skilled staff for those uh, research institutes, as I mentioned. Mr. Chairman, I believe this question has been asked in a global way, albeit in a global way before. <laughs> we were losing a lot of researchers. And I've said that we have to link those uh, uh, institutes to industry so that their IGF could be up and uh, some arrangements should be made so that their salaries and other uh, remunerations could be competitive to uh, their peers elsewhere. Now, of course, I also have to appeal to my government if we are going to make science and technology and innovation the fulcrum under which uh, Ghana's socioeconomic development revolves that we put a premium on those people and their experience on what not should also count. I noticed that the Minister for Labour, I listened to Badia, he was calling for extension of, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, the retirement age. Those things must also be factored in so that, they, 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 because we are living longer and I don't want to be into his space, but if they must make a case for it, these are the people that we need so that we do not go, so to speak, on uh, premature <laughs> retirement and they have the opportunity to earn extra income. Chairman, for instance, I'm referring to handing over notes, the CSIR uh, in page 70 of it is currently operating with a staff strength of 2,728 which is woefully inadequate to choose their ways and that despite technical clearance granted in 2019, some 158 staff were recruited, but they still think that they've lost a number of staff to retirement. Will you replace and make sure they have their full complement of staff? Thank you, Chair. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I also see, and uh, it's unfortunate that Ghana is yet to take advantage of it. Oil palm, palm kernel. You hear everybody talk about Malaysia, the Malaysia miracle, and they are doing well. What are we doing, and what will you do as minister to ensure that we export this in large quantities? Thank you. Based on improved research and improved quality production of those products. So indeed, Mr. Chairman, indeed, Ghana is importing oil, oil palm <laughs> products. And so our capacity is very uh, constrained. But like the Honorable Committee uh, Vice Chair, so to speak, as we still have capacity to make up on those deficits. And that is through improved varieties. A lot of farmers are not planting improved varieties. So the potential is there. But this one, I have to collaborate with the Minister for Agri and other entities so that this thing can be fashioned out and rolled out. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, FARA, is headquartered in Accra by some agreements signed in October 2003, specifically October 14. The government of Ghana signed an agreement with your ministry. Has that agreement been ratified by Parliament in accordance with Article 75 of the 1992 Constitution. Mr. Chairman, I cannot recall. Uh, there are so many activities 
saying the legal problem. Till you get to the ministry. So I have to find out if I'm not, then of course I'll come. Till you get to the ministry and it's not been ratified, when should we expect you referring it to Parliament for ratification? After being all the necessary checks and what I should believe that within the next so even if the necessary work takes you two, three, four years, we should be waiting certainty of time because it's been signed. The headquarters is here. They are helping the country with their work and their research. Give me a date that you will come to Parliament for us to do what is constitutionally needful. Mr. Chairman, I believe that we have, as I sit here, that's why I say I don't know its status. But I'm asking myself, why has it not come? There surely must be some problem. And I intend finding out, but barring every constraint, I believe that when we look at the way things work in our country within 90 days, it should be able to come here. But you know that the president is sending you there to solve problems, not to go and know the problems, but to solve them. So that's why I want a definite response from you. Will you solve the problem and get the agreement ratified? Then, after all, what would be the legal basis of us engaging in that relationship? I believe I've given a response. I believe that an intelligent girl should be within three months. Now, to the Honorable Black, I referred you to the United Nations uh, Climate uh, Decision, UN General Assembly 2019, and you know that because of the past U.S. President uh, politics, which was not based on multilateralism, the U.S. as a major player took some unilateral decisions which I heard you say that President Barney has promised to do. The commitment by developing countries, including Ghana, are we not just a consequence of their actions? And what will you do so that we become a major player? I mean, we talk about the matter of carbon emission. Do you have an idea how much Ghana contributes to that? Carbon emission. Well, as a percentage of the... Our, uh, 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 in the global standard, I don't think we contribute much. I, I used to have a figure in my honest, but I do not want to put a figure that I cannot substantiate it. Well, I, I saw 40 something million people. As uh, chairman, the president was so determined to fight illegal mining, popularly referred to as Galamse. There was Operation Vanguard, which in my view was legal. There was your ministry also taking another group referred to as Operation Halt, which was working with the Forestry Commission, the other one, uh, the Minister for Interior and the Minister for Defense. When you assume office as minister, will you rationalize and make sure that we have unity of focus in the fight against Galamse? If we need to deploy the security agencies, you will not be working at cross purposes with your counterparts as defense and interior. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. And as far as I'm concerned, some of these entities have been, been withdrawn. So we have a clean sheet to which to start. Now the Environmental Protection Agency of your ministry they need also staffing support, they need technical support for capacity. But the Ghanaian community or various communities in Ghana are complaining about two electromagnetic effects. One with telecom towers and its sighting and the consequence of lack of public education for them to appreciate how that impacts on their life. The second is fuel stations. You just have a community, then all you see is a fuel station coming out in a neighborhood that they get frustrated and they don't get what you call institutional support that supports the protection of their lives. What will you do about it? 
the chairman, the electromagnetic phenomena on the strength of the scientific community, there is even not a consensus on the damage that is done to the human person and for living organism. That said, as a doctor, I will err on the side of safety. But the EPA will have to conduct a scientific study the Ghanaian situation and come with recommendations. I understand steps have been taken in that direction. I don't know what stage they are now. I think it is being done by the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. Fuel stations, the, the story with fuel stations is a bit difficult. Some have been built up areas. There are others too who set up and then the community or the built up area, so to speak, also uh, um, got to them in the sense that there are specific distances that they should uh, 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 keep away. But I'm not sure, even is there regard to, when you talk of fuel stations, the law with regard to petrol stations is a bit different from the gas stations. So, we have to disaggregate the two. The, my understanding is that the fuel uh, uh, stations uh, can be closer to communities than some. Uh, that's the gas, petrol, uh, diesel stations, the liquid gas, can be closer to communities than we care to, apart from public places like churches, mosques, schools, where you cannot build petrol stations. Indeed, the law is that if you are a private entity and you are uh, living close to even sharing a wall with petrol stations, it's not against the law. That's one thing I find out. If we have to change it, we have to change the law. But with regard to gas stations, there's a definite distance that one, it must be away from all built up areas. That one, I forgot in the absolute distance, but I can find out. That much I know. But again, which came first? Some people obey the law and build, and build their gas stations far away from built up areas. And here it is rather the built up areas which encroach and got near to the gas stations. And here they cry foul. So the narrative is not as simple as people make them out to be. Chairman, the Minister, you are given one side of the narrative. I agree with you on that leg. But there is the other narrative where homes are invaded or the EPA issues are licenses and what those citing up the fuel and gas station is to hold the EPA license and say that we've been authorized to be here but the community is saying that we have not been engaged sufficiently or we do not agree with EPA going ahead with this activity what will you do about that? Mr. Chairman, that's why I'm saying that with regard to diesel and petrol, look at the law. <laughs> if they, they can be permitted to build right to hopes, but schools must. For, so if the law is by, we can change it. So they, they can cry foul, and I sympathize with them, but sympathy is different from law. Then, but when you're talking about gas stations, that is another category, and I think I've explained already. Chairman, I love eating sweet potatoes, and in Ghana, we don't even encourage its eating. Uh, Chairman had a bite of it this morning. I see as part of the research, very different types of research going into expanded production of it. It is something that we easily can export to improve our foreign exchange regime. And it's something we can encourage is eating, uh, even in our domestic uh, economy. What will you do to give meaning to the research finance on sweet potatoes in Ghana? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I believe that we have to collaborate with the Minister of Agri. That is where Mercy and Agri should put their money. The sweet potato is very nutritious, contains protein content compared to pure flour. And we should do our advertisement and promote consumption of that. In fact, we can incorporate it into flour in a certain ratio so we can make it into bread. But we have to train our taste buds to get used to it so that people will patronize them. 
even before we talk about export. Yes, the export potential too is there. So I agree with you entirely, and that is where we can even improve farmers' incomes and help them out of poverty. Chairman, my final question to the minister is, Ghana now has the advantage of producing oil and gas. Is there an environmental policy relating to oil and gas resources, its exploitation in our country? And what will you do if you become Minister for Environment on this matter? Mr. Chairman, indeed there is a policy, a cited drug policy, in various stages of development. I forget which stage it has reached. So that would be one of my duties to make that it comes, uh, the, we get the necessary things done and it comes to Parliament as soon as possible if le legislation is needed so that we can uh, uh, deploy its long, long overdue. Will your ministry conduct some need study? Solar, I know it's largely driven by policy by the Ministry of Energy in Ghana, but you are responsible for the environment. If you take from Navrungo, coming through Bolga, through Nasia, Savlugu to Tamale, as you have traveled extensively abroad, whether you are in Germany or you are in Switzerland, you see those uh, solar uh, things which uses like an electric fan. Uh, I don't know the technical meaning for it. My view will be that we should begin de developing that kind of environmental friendly infrastructure to support the solar regime in Ghana. Can you give me an assurance, Minister Designate? Ghana being in the tropical world, the potential for solar energy is huge. The only problem is the economics of it and the economics of it. Well, how they deployed solar panels in Germany might be acceptable there. People should have a national dialogue. Whichever configuration is able to harvest the energy, that is a, our primary concern. Whether rooftops, whether we put in them our garages, whether on standalone entities, whether in farms where we can even do because some certain Plants even need shading, and when they are well spaced, you can even harvest them, especially in rural electrification settings. That one, we have to have a conversation and dialogue and a closure on that. Chairman, so that thank you, and I wish the nominee well. Honorable nominee, well, I only wish to put this on record that your life is a reflection of somebody who is prepared to acquire the knowledge, dirty your hands to achieve results. I wish you well in this new enterprise. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all members. I appreciate what has happened today. I'm so oh, you're, you're discharged. you hear from us. Uh, I hear that the France I spoke about is called wind veins. Eh? Thank you. Honourable of members, we will resume at 2.30. Okay.
Can the administrators to the nominee, please? I. I, Uzra Fia Kuto. Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Honorable Dr. Ulsef Riyakuto, can you tell us briefly about yourself before we ask you questions? Very briefly. Sorry, I, can't, I, I couldn't hear you. Can you tell us briefly about yourself before we ask you questions on your nomination? Very briefly. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Also, Fria Kuto is my name, the past Minister for Food, Agri Food and Agriculture in the previous government. I have been a member of this August Parliament for two terms, representing the good people of Kwadaso from 2009 until 2010, uh, until 2014. Uh, 22 this 16 <laughs> okay <laughs> 21 um, that's all I can say for now very well let me add a few more. you were minister of agri in the last government were you not Yes, Mr. Honorable uh, Chairman. And what committees were you serving on while the Member of Parliament? Sorry, I think uh, the Member is on the phone and I can't hear you properly. What committees of Parliament did you serve on while you were a Member of Parliament? I served on the Committee for Food, Agriculture and Cocoa Affairs, the first term as Deputy Ranking and the second term as Ranking Member for that committee. <laughs> that the only committee you served on, the two terms. Which other committees did you serve on? I served on other committees. I served on the committee for um, you have to excuse me. I have to check because basically I was more interested in, the, in my committee. Very well. Yes, sir. Yes. Chairman, let me welcome the nominee, the present minister designate for food and agriculture, and to congratulate him. But to take him just, Chairman, as you observe, your CV, go to page one, the one you submitted to Chairman. I see member economic management team. I see Commissioner National Development Planning Commission. When I go to the second page, Chairman, we don't have any information on his parliamentary career uh, in the CV. Uh, so if you can explain that in this CV, we ought to know that you serve as member for Kwadaso. And we ought to know that you serve from this period to that period for the purpose of the record in your CV. Unless there is an improved CV that I'm not aware of. But what we do have, Chairman, I don't seem to have enough information on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll provide that additional information after this. All right, thank you. You are the President's Policy Advisor on Food and Agriculture. What is the state of food security in Ghana today? The state of food security, Honorable Chairman, is very solid. We've never, as a country, been in a situation like this for many years. And I'm saying this, it's so obvious, if you go to our markets, even in the midst of our dry season today, from the north to the east to the west, 
you will see along the way, on the high roads, the small, the minor roads, a lot of food being sold. And you look at the prices and so on, you will realize that these prices are far less than in previous years for the seasons that we are talking about. And normally, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is the season where you have the least amount of food and the high prices because the rains are not here with us. We are in the dry season. Stocks are supposed to be at their lowest. And therefore, it's a good time to, to pick, to demonstrate the fact that, indeed, for security... Chama, I just had a nominee say that prices of food are less. You want to share with this committee how much is an Olonka or a bowl of gari selling in the market, a bowl of maize, how much is selling in the market, and probably a bowl of kinky, so that we are satisfied that we have food security in the country, there is abundance of it, and Ghanaians are feeding well. You want to share that data with us? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've got loads and loads of statistics here. I could submit that to this committee in terms of both production of the major food items like maize and rice and so on, stocks, prices, everything is here. So if... Uh, Chairman, if you can just share a few details in okay, a minute, then submit it for our perusal. Okay. Further on, Chair. The, in terms of, uh, if we take maize, I consider maize to be the most important food security crop in this country. For the mere reason that is the only crop which grows in the four corners of this country is also the staple crop of most ethnic groups in this country. And before we came into office in 2017, the highest amount of production of maize in this country was 1.8 million metric tons. And I'm talking about 2016, which was the last year before we took over. Since then, Honorable Chairman, base production in 2017 was 2 million, it hit 2 million. 2018, 2.3 million. 2019, 2.9 million. And 2020, we projected 3.1, but for the massive drought in the south of the country, in the main uh, producing season and the minor season, we could have reached that level. But because of the drought in the two major growing seasons in the south, we were able to do 1.9 million uh, 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 tons. So that is one indicator. The other indicator is to do with prices. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have here the monthly trend in average wholesale prices in major markets in Ghana. It's all plotted out here. Unfortunately, I didn't know I was going to have this uh, question. I would have brought uh, a screen to show you exactly what it is. But all the details, including the graphs, are here to show exactly what I'm talking about. That in spite of the seasonal nature of the price uh, movement of maize and other crops, in particular uh, case of maize that I'm holding, you'll see that the, 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 the cycles are very clear. That oh, Minister, how much is the bowl of maize? Sorry, the I don't have... Maize. No, we, we, we track... Maize prices in 100 kilogram bucks. So how much is 100 kilogram of maize selling in Ghana today? Um, we have here on average... In December, we, we had 172.39 cities per 100 kilogram bag of maize. That is the for the, whole, the average wholesale price in, in this country. If you look at 2019, for the same December, it was 127.62. You look at 2018, it was 133.35. But, um, Mr. Chairman... Can you add 2017? 2017, how much was it? Sorry? 2017, how much was... 2017, it was 92.96. 
So does that support your mathematics? Is it less or high from 92 to 172? Yeah, but if, if you take account, Mr. Chairman, if you take account of inflation, these are nominal figures that we track. But to get a real crisis, in order that you have a standard way of measuring, you have to look at it in real terms, not in just nominal price terms. In economics, Thank you, Charles. So how much is uh, a, a bowl of kinky? You have an idea. You are no, responsible we, for... we don't, unfortunately, we don't track uh, uh, the prices of bowls of kinky. Uh, we don't go to the micro level. But we track uh, the prices in the wholesale market, selected wholesale markets in Ghana. That is the job that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture does. Uh, Minister Mwamine, you have an idea of agricultural's contribution to Ghana's GDP today, even though I know that there has been substantial decline in the last decade of investment by government in the agricultural sector. What is its significant contribution to our GDP as of today? Well, as of today, of this date, 19th of February, I cannot tell you, but I can say that the latest statistics from the Central Bank is pointing to 19% of Ghana GDP. And they have dropped from 20 years ago when it was nearly half of GDP. And that's what, Mr. Chairman, you would expect in any growing economy, that the agricultural share of GDP will come down, the services and industry will go up, which is the historical fact. So this trend in Ghana is not unique. It is indeed. We expect that all the plans put in place by this government, if they are to be carried out, that the share of agriculture in the GDP will continue to fall, while the others, like manufacturing and, and, and services like tourism banking, will go up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. You are supervising a very important sector of our national economy, which probably accounts about 60% it is quoted in some literature of uh, employment uh, in Ghana. I come from the north of Ghana and one of our main staple food is rice. Rice production in northern Ghana, apart from the vagaries of the weather, we do not have combined harvesters and the cost of it too high for poor farmers up north even if you talk about acquisition of a tractor, if you take from Savulugu through Gushegu coming through Nantong, Nasia, you probably cannot find more than two, three farmers who may be able to afford a tractor. If you get confirmed as minister, what will you do to make this available to support rice production in northern Ghana? Thank you, Honorable uh, Chairman. In fact, the phenomenon being described by the, the, uh, by the minority leader is not only specific to rice. It's so with all the grains. And it, the demand for machinery, for harvesting, for processing has gone up because production, the basic production has gone up. In the case of rice, I can say that in 2017, the total milled rice in Ghana was 433,000 metric tons. 2020 has gone up to a million metric tons. This is what the Ministry of Food and Agriculture estimates are. And so there have been more than double uh, uh, increase in doubling the uh, production of rice. And therefore, the, the, the quantity of mill, the mill, milling capacity is expected to go up. Unfortunately, the private sector has been very slow in taking up this opportunity in rice mill. Um, so government has had to enter into an arrangement with countries like Brazil and India to bring in farm machinery of which harvesters and uh, uh, milling facilities are a major part of uh, what is going on. So government is taking, uh, uh, has taken note of this shortage and I'm sure that this year, both the Brazilian supply and the uh, uh, Indian supply of machinery will be able to address this issue that we are discussing. Thank you, Chairman. You are reported to have made this uh, significant uh, statement.
about, and I just want to quote you, the hike in food prices. I think we all recognize that only four years ago, a bunch of plantains, you had to spend 40 Ghana cities, but now with three cities to six Ghana cities, you can get a bunch of plantains. It shows you clearly that we have come to reduce prices of food, even in the major cities like Accra, where there is substantial rushes in the market. You are quoted to have said this. Do you stand by the statement? I, Is it a I, true state I, of affairs I, in relation to plantain yes, in the country? I, I stand by this statement. In fact, there has even been an improvement in the supply of plantain since I made that statement. Don't forget, plantain, like any other food crop, is a, is a seasonal has a seasonal supply characteristic. So you find that after the harvest, there's a lot on the market, and as we enter the, the dry season, production and the supplies go down. We can say with the monitoring that we are doing for even exports of plantain, that was unheard of. Export of plantain. You go to Wagadugu, there's a special place, and I'm sure you saw the television clip where journalists followed uh, a, a truck of plantain from Agogo to Agadugu. Yeah, and, yeah and thank you, Chairman. Industry. So, in your strongest view, food is very cheap, and Ghanaians who could not afford a meal today now can afford three meals. Do you have a sense that there are Ghanaians who still cannot feed and struggle for a meal a day? Uh, Mr. Chairman, obviously, in any society, even you go to the United States or you go to the United Kingdom. There are people sleeping outside on the pavements. So we are talking about the generality of the improvement of the people of this country, not specific to a few people. The comparison is between now and what it was 10 years ago or what it was five years ago. And I'm very confident, and I don't think I'm the only one. I mean, there are a lot of people who bear witness to the fact that supply of food in Ghana has in, improved considerably uh, under my watch as the Minister for Food and Agriculture. Thank you very much. Has your attention ever been drawn to the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority giving a concession to a company called Fruit and Export Terminal uh, to support the export of horticultural products through the Thermal Port? I'm very much aware of that, Honorable uh, uh, Chairman. This is a very sore subject for me because 10 years ago, so 2008, my predecessor, Honorable, the late Honorable Deborah, signed uh, an agreement with Gapoha for, to convert one of their warehouses uh, for fruits and vegetable exports. Unfortunately, that agreement has not been complied with. And the fruit exporters have drawn my attention to that. We are in constant discussion, not only with Gapoa, but also with the Minister of Transport to resolve this issue. So it's still a matter which is, being, is under consideration. Is the agreement functional or has been terminated? Mr. Chairman, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't hear what he said. I'm saying that the agreement for the export terminal, are you aware that it's been terminated? Is the agreement terminated? Are you aware it's been terminated? No, I'm not aware of that. As far as the records of the, the Ministry for Food and Agriculture is concerned, that agreement of 2008 is still alive. Was there an agreement subsequent to 2008 in 2015 that you are aware of? Yes, that uh, is part of the issue that we are dealing with. That instead of dealing with the food exporters, Napoa entered into agreement with another company, giving a concession to them. What is the name of that company Gapoa gave the concession to, other than that to which your predecessor minister and another agreement in 2015 were signed? You want to give us the name of the company? Mr. Uh, Honorable Chairman, I do not recall the name, but I know that uh, Gapoa entered into a concession agreement with another company. I cannot mention their name. I have to look through the records. We will need it for the purpose of our the oversight we are exercising. 
But you are aware that naturally if you terminate a concession agreement, the consequence of it may be judgment debt. Are you aware of that? I'm very much aware of that. Will you work to avoid a judgment debt on the state of Ghana as that itself can amount to contributing to some financial loss to the state? Yes, I'm very much aware. Chairman, I will take the nominee back. That one is a policy decision of President Nana Akufu Addo. Uh, probably it came to Parliament. Uh, I don't support that policy initiative of putting the Minister for uh, Koko under the Ministry of Agriculture. I still believe that given the nature of Koko and its contribution to our national economy generally, and to the management of our foreign exchange regime, uh, Koko should still have some supervision of the Ministry of uh, Finance. You inaugurated the Koko Marketing Company. Did it have all institutional representation as was required by its enabling legislation? The board. Sorry, what's the, the question? Again? The CMB board was inaugurated by you. CMC or CMB? CMC, CMC. The CMC board was inaugurated by you. That's correct. They didn't have the requirement of the law of all the requirement under the legislation of institutional representation? Honorable Chairman, as far as I'm concerned, it did. We, it went strictly according to the regulations guiding the operation of Cocoa Marketing Company of Ghana. So no institution was left out to the best of your memory? Yes. So the concession agreement between Gapuha and the food processing company, what is the status to the best of your knowledge? Yes. What is the are, are status? We, are we talk, Mr. Chairman, are we discussing Cocoa Marketing Company or we are discussing Gapoa? Because I'm a bit confused now. Yeah. He's left Coco Marketing Company now. He's come back to... Uh, yeah, but Chairman, he answered me. He said he inaugurated it. He didn't see anything wrong with institutional representation. I go, I go for that. But I have shifted again just to conclude on the matter of uh, the concession uh, uh, agreement between Gapua and the Export Terminal Ghana Limited. Are you aware that this matter was brought to the attention of His Excellency the President? President Nana Akufuadu? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I cannot see that letter from here. So unless I sign the letter, I cannot uh, answer the question. All right, uh, Chairman, uh, probably let me rest and our colleagues will take a bite, but I'll come back along the line with uh, some handing over questions uh, so that the Honorable Muntaka probably will uh, hold my. Yes, thank you. Honorable. Thank you very much, Chairman. Honorable Minister, I'm right here on your left. Right here. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, Minister, um, you fought through this House um, a very important loan agreement for about 150 million United States dollars from the Indian Exim Bank for the Agricultural Mechanization Equipment Services Centers across all districts in the country. Uh, I know the challenges that we went through, but uh, can you address us on the status of the implementation of this very important program for rural agriculture? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Uh, in fact, uh, I inherited this agreement between the Asian Bank of India and the government of Ghana. And it had been in the works for four years. We were hoping that within the first year of our uh, administration, we could conclude on the Indian facility and uh, have available to our farmers the machinery that we so desperately need. Unfortunately, I found that it was a very long process. We are just coming to the end of 
that uh, arrangement where we are signing last year, I think in July, our Minister for Finance signed with the Exim Bank of Indian representative in West Africa. And even after that, uh, all kinds of procedures have to go through. I'm happy to report that we are hoping by the end of, before the end of this year, 2021, uh, we'll start receiving the items from India. Uh, we heard from Honorable Haruna how desperate we are for uh, harvesting uh, uh, machinery and, and others. And we, we really need the, this equipment uh, to help our farmers uh, in agriculture in Ghana. So we are very hopeful that before the end of the year, we will we'll start receiving the item. But before then, for the interest of this committee, uh, the last tranche of the Brazilian facility has now been approved by the government of Brazil, and hopefully before the major season in the north, in around May, June, we should start receiving machinery from India, India for the same purpose. So yes, it's going to, we have $150 million worth of farm machinery coming from India, and we have $33 million worth of farm machinery coming from Brazil. Between the two, we, we should address adequately the issue of, um, of uh, supply of farm machinery to our farmers in order to sustain the growth which has started in this country in the last four years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my second question relates to uh, what Honorable Harun Idrisu asked. Minister by the new legislation means for the cocoa sector means the minister responsible for agriculture in terms of having oversight over the cocoa, cocoa board. Recently we've uh, heard in the media and even a statement was read on the floor on cocoa board's indebtedness to a lot of LBCs, local buying companies, and issues with uh, fertilizer, and the initiative of on farmers, cocoa farmers scheme, pension scheme, among other initiatives and challenges. Want to hear from you on uh, on the issues with regards to the LBCs, and cocoa roads, fertilizer issues, and the farm, farmers pension scheme that was launched by the president and your good self. I think sometime in December or so. Thank you. Honorable Chairman, that has been a very unfortunate situation in the past month or two. And it's because of the peculiar nature of the cocoa industry. COVID has hit the centers of chocolate consumption as in America and the United, uh, in Europe. So demand for chocolate and for that matter, cocoa beans has gone down. Our arrangements that we had made with the uh, foreign banks to finance our operations are dependent upon the number of contracts that we are able, in other words, the amount of cocoa that we can sell uh, as a guarantee to these foreign bankers that to release the tranches. For the first time in I don't know how many years, it has not been possible for us to sell in, uh, enough contracts to, be, to enable the last tranche of about 190 million US dollars to be released. In fact, if you compare the amount of uh, contracts that have been sold out uh, this year compared to the same period last year, we are down by nearly one third. We are really down by nearly one third, which means that the decline in, 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 in demand for, for cocoa beans by the chocolatiers and the processors, as, which is a result of the COVID, the, the lockdown in, in Western Europe and in America, is really affecting our um, operations here. So by now, before the end of the year, no, uh, normally you should have had enough contracts for the release of the whole amount of $1.3 billion. Unfortunately, we couldn't sell that fast.
So now that we have the contracts sold, uh, we are expecting that coming week, early next week, the last tranche of $190 million will be with us, and then we can pay for all the outstandings uh, of cocoa, and that issue will be behind us. In the meantime, the central bank is cooperating very closely with Cocoa Board to give them some uh, uh, bridging uh, facility to help some of the LBCs to pay for the cocoa that uh, they had uh, uh, taken from the farmers. So that's how far we are in the situation with the LBCs and cocoa farmers. Thank you. Honorable, I didn't hear from you on the farmers' pension scheme. I'm sure you address it whilst I tie it in with my last question. I know you are a very big farmer in coffee, but looking at a report on the coffee subsector, it's not that encouraging. And can you let us have some understanding on what you are doing to improve upon that sector? And that's my last question, Chairman. Thank you. Honorable Chairman, if you look at the statutes establishing the Ghana Cocoa Board, share and coffee are two tree crops which, by law, Cocoa Board should help to promote. Unfortunately, that part of the work of Cocoa Board has not really uh, taken off. I remember very well as a ranking member in this August House, I initiated a process with the government at the time to provide us with four million, to provide a, uh, a four million project as a pilot for coffee development. And the committee, those of you who are, who are here who are members, you remember after the third year, we went around the country to inspect these projects. And they were great prospects. I mean, you went to uh, Eastern region on the uh, Kwau Hills. You went to uh, parts of Ashanti, Eastern region, Brong uh, Afo, then. Uh, the pilot scheme had been very successful, and at that time, I even recommended, as a ranking member, that government should make available 40 million uh, CDs uh, to enter into the main project. Unfortunately, that money didn't come, so we're, we're stuck with a pilot. But uh, you may know that we have initiated this great idea of diversification out of cocoa, by selecting six crops, three crops, of which uh, this August Parliament approved the, the establishment of an authority. And the President of the Republic last year inaugurated the board and the management of this uh, three crop development authority in Kumase in November uh, last year. So um, the, their work is precisely to pursue what Cocoa Board couldn't do by developing these six crops, including coffee, third level Cocoa Board for development. We know that that is a, an area which is going to assist the country in the medium term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee. When you won elections and you became the Minister for Agriculture, I assume your position as a ranking member. I hope you are hearing me. And so, I'm doing your work for you. One of the major challenges facing the agricultural sector in Ghana has to do with lack of access to fund them access to fund them, fund them. The, the Ghanaian banks are unwilling to advance loans to players in the sector because of the huge risks. And it was against this background that your government actualized the Gessel project. By Gessel, I mean Ghana incentive-based risk sharing system for agricultural lenders. A facility was approved by this house and you reported to us in the 2020 budget that 
GSL became operational in 2019. But you added that you have a board, full functional board, with management and staff. And you also indicated under paragraph 5A0, the arrangements the board is making to get more funds for farmers and those in agribusinesses. What specific legal instrument delivered this uh, board? Honorable Chairman, I'm not a legal person, but what I know is that Gersel was initiated by the Central Bank of Ghana to address the issue of agricultural finance. And they have made a lot of progress by forming a limited liability company to manage Gersel. So Gersel, in practice, is now a limited liability company. The constitution of the board, I have to consult with the, with the central bank, which is the sponsor of this, uh, of Gersel. But what I know is that Gersel is up and doing. We are in touch with them. We've had a selection of, uh, in the poultry industry where we are initiating a pilot scheme. They have, Gersel has been involved with, in collaboration with the Agricultural Development Bank in providing finance for a selected number of poultry farmers and uh, feed millers. So uh, Gersel is actually uh, up and running, as far as I know. In terms of the board itself, to be honest, I cannot give you any detail about that. Thank you. Chang, and just to do a follow-up, and colleagues uh, bear with me, I probably will not have the long-winding one. Just on Gesa, you say you are up and doing with poultry when you don't have a board. Is that a good governance style? As, uh, uh, the Honorable Chairman, as far as I'm concerned, we have been, between myself, the Governor of the Bank, and the Minister for Finance, we have been collaborating in trying to get this model financing for the poultry industry as a, on a pilot basis, and that if it worked, then uh, we're going to extend it to other agricultural activities. I know for a fact that Gersel is now a limited liability company. Limited liability companies, you have to have a board. So I'm very surprised if there's no board, then management alone cannot take decisions. Or then it means that Gersel Limited is not properly constituted. And I'll doubt whether the central bank will <laughs> supervise such uh, an auditing. I know that the Minister of Finance is. Uh very has an update about that insurance initiative on the agriculture. Can you just assure us that you work with the Bank of Ghana to allow for the takeoff of that initiative? Sir, Honorable Chairman, can, can, can you repeat? I see, I have read budget statements of the Honorable Minister for Finance, and he has an update. He seemed excited about this insurance intervention in agriculture. So I'm asking that if you do, be, if you do become minister, will you work with the Bank of Ghana for the takeoff of the initiative? Oh, Honorable Chairman, that's precisely what I've just uh, said. That right, already... that's, that's appreciated. Chairman, there was, between 2017 and 2018, in the public space, there was this uh, cuckoo road, for instance, the Eastern Corridor in the Volta region, many other cuckoo roads dotted around the country. You are now supervising minister for the cuckoo board. We are told that there was some audit. You have an idea what the findings were, any wrongdoing, how much did it cost to undertake the audit, and can the audit report be made available to us? Thank you, Chair. I know of that an audit took place uh, at the beginning, I think five months after we came into office. But this is something that was done between the Ministry of Roads and Highways and Ghana Cocoa Board. If the uh, member 
wants further information, I can always provide that. I oh, will appreciate the report. And Chairman, my last question. Fertilizer pitches in Ghana, uh, there is some, uh, there is a company, AMG, capital A, capital M, capital G, which probably was incorporated in 2017, I hope I get it right, which has won a number of major contracts. I'm also aware that the Ghana Exim Bank have loaned them some money. The servicing of it is not as good as it should be. Do you have any interest in the company? Is there any relationship? Honorable Chairman, I deal with loads of companies in the Ministry for Food and Agriculture. In fact, in this particular activity of fertilizer, there are over 50 companies that we deal with. I don't, all the 50 companies cannot be, the details cannot be, and their activities are not, are beyond me. So I'm not in a position to answer that question. All right, thank you, Chairman. What do you want to leave as your footprint for President Nana Dudanko as your legacy as Ghana's Agri Minister responsible for food and agriculture? Thank you, Chairman. Planting for food and jobs. That's what I want to leave for the people of Ghana. Thank you very much, yes. Mr. Chairman. Just a short uh, follow-up. You indicated in your response to the person I posed on GESA that Bank of Ghana has formed limited liability company. Who are the shareholders? Bank of Ghana. Now my next question has to do with Party for Food and Jobs. The legacy that you intend to leave behind. You have indicated to the whole country that under planting for food and jobs, you created 2,286,892 jobs. In fact, the Minister for Employment included this figure in his calculation for the number of jobs the government of the MPP and Ranado Danko Kufaru has created within the last four years. But I recall that in your budget you reported to this house that 94% of these jobs that you have created under planting for food and jobs were created on the farm. They are farm level employment. When you calculate that 94%, it will give you 2.2 2 million, 2 million, 194,678. These are jobs you claim you have created through planting for food and jobs on the farm. When you talk about farm level employment, what exactly do you mean? Can you give us a specifics? Honorable Chairman. This is a subject that we can sit here and talk about for many, many hours. At the end of the day, we are talking about what is created out of planting for food and jobs. The central part of it, as far as security is concerned. Honorable Minister, hold on. I think the figures that the Honorable Minister is using to ask the question different from the figures the Minister Oliver said, and he's actually, when we asked for the document, he brought them to you today. The, the figures you're quoting are not the figures he used, which he gave to this house. Yes. No, this is the figure he said, and which is quoted in Parliament, which was brought here. They're different from the figures you're quoting. No. Sorry. I'm saying that the figures you are ascribing to the Minister for Labour is different from the figure the Minister for Labour brought to this house. He actually he came to answer a question in the house and he submitted the documents. It's a copy he has just brought because when he appeared before us, we asked him to bring the same documents. 
they brought them to us this morning. So I want you to ask your question, but quote the appropriately the figures, not the figures you're quoting. That's not what is the official document before us. Jama, the figure I quoted, I said the minister himself. Oh, the minister yes, himself. Yes, this is a figure oh, yeah. I thought that I heard you say yes, he has been labor. used on several platforms. And I referred yeah. to the handing over notes of the minister for employment, which also referred to the same figure. The 2.2 million jobs and the accounting for food and jobs. Sorry, um, yeah, no, no, no. I've been left totally confused, uh, uh, Honorable Chairman. Can he repeat the question? Honorable Nominee, how many jobs have you created and accounting for food and jobs? Honorable Chairman, I will have to come to, back to him on that. But I want to make a very clear explanation. We are talking about job creation, which is part of the title of the government's policy, planting for food and jobs. The jobs are deriving from the food that we are producing in abundance for the people of this country and beyond. The only determination of the figure ideally will be to have a labor census on, in the areas that planting for food and jobs are being conducted. But it is not possible to conduct a labor census to determine accurately the number of jobs created in the areas that planting for food and jobs are, are, are being undertaken. So you have to rely on estimates. And those estimates the figures that are given, uh, uh, that uh, is quoted by the Honorable Member, are uh, derived from the estimates that we make. We are not saying that it is to the last person, but just to give a comparative uh, analysis in terms of the fact that, if, we, for instance, in the case of maize, I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Honorable Chairman, that maize production has gone up from 1.8 to 3 million metric tons. Obviously, using the labor-intensive methods, because we have very little machinery, it has to be by hand that this increased production takes place. And of course, it will mean that more people are engaged in, in be, to be able to produce the quantities that we are talking about. So I don't think we need to split hairs about whether it's 1.8 million or 2 point something million. Basic question is, I, production taking place? Has the growth taking place? We are saying yes. And secondly, how did it come about? We are saying by labor, by engaging rural labor, and in some cases even urban labor. And then thirdly, what is it that uh, uh, the quantity of site labor? That is where there is a controversy as to whether it's 1.2 or 1.7 or 2.1. So I don't think we should labor the point to the extent that it becomes it, did, it erased from us the, the essence of what the government is doing in, in, in promoting agriculture in Ghana. Thank you. The Chairman, the Honorable Nominee has on several platforms been very precise in respect of jobs created under planting for food and jobs. On one of the platforms, he indicated that he has created 2,286,892 jobs. It's all over. And this is the number that the Minister for Employment used in determining the number of jobs they have created in this country. And this is from expression 
in the handle of a nose he presented before us. And he indicated that that was even prepared somewhere in uh, July. And that the updated figures will be made available to Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when you read paragraph 259 of the 2020 budget, it is stated that 94% of the jobs created under party for food and jobs were created on the farm. The peas and farmers on the farm created 2.1 million jobs. And then 4% to value addition. We need to understand all these things. And then it says that 2% to extension, delivery, and ICT. A total of 45,000. Mr. Speaker, we wanted a nominee to explain to us, one after the other, when we say we have created jobs on the farm, what are those jobs? Very simple. What are the jobs? Honorable Chairman, I still do not understand the intervention of the Honorable Member of Parliament. I, I don't. Honorable, all he's saying is that when you say you have created jobs on the farm, yes. what jobs have you created? Very, very simple. First of all, before we came in, there was very little application of fertilizer, and I have the figures here that I can quote. So, planting for food and jobs is encouraging farmers to apply fertilizer using improved seeds. Using improved seeds. So, the increase in fertilizer, the application is done by hand, by labor. So, obviously, the same number of people cannot carry on with this. They have to get more labor from outside their families to be able to do that. That's the first point. The second point is that once, Mr. Chairman, is there an intervention? Once the seeds are in the ground, because of the fertilization, the amount of weeds uh, increases. So you have to employ more people to maintain the farm. Then after that, you are talking about harvesting. Instead of two, three bucks, we are talking about in some cases 15, 20 bucks. So the additional production has to be harvested by hand. So when you get that, that is also uh, uh, creating jobs for the harvesting. Not only for the harvesting, for the uh, on farm processing, for carriage into the nearest, the nearest village and neighborhoods and all that. All these create a lot of jobs. Basically, that is what it is. And in fact, in uh, undergraduate farm management uh, uh, studies, you are taught that you need so many man Mondays to do this work, to do that work, to do that work, and then you put it all together to say that you have every acre of land that you operate for cocoa or for corn or, uh, or for soya, so many uh, uh, Mondays of labor are created. That's the basis on which we do these estimates. So if you accept the fact that production has doubled in some cases, it's even gone on three times, soil production and so on have all gone up. They are the source of the creation of the jobs that we are talking about. And that is more important than to say that uh, it's created 1.2 or 1.3 or 1.4 uh, million jobs. It's, labor is an input into production. Land is a, an input into production. Fertilizer is an input into production. Land is an input into production. So all of these have to be calculated in order to come to uh, an estimate of the profitability of each uh, 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 crop that uh, the farmers produce. So that's the basis on which we are saying that production, uh, sorry, uh, 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 so many jobs have been created. In any case, Honorable Chairman, these calculations are done between us and the Ministry of Employment because they know the regulations and the definition, international definition of what is employment. They represent Ghana at ILO, International Labour Organization and so on. So we cannot do this thing, these things on our own at the Ministry. We provide them with the basic data and based on their framework, they come up with a calculation and hence our contribution to the, uh, the Minister designated for Employment. Thank you.
If I get you well, do you mean that, let's say, five bags of fertilizer? You assume that having taken five bags of fertilizer, the farmer will employ ten people. Then you, you, you write ten. This person takes three. You assume that he will employ five people, then you add five. That's aggregated to the 2.1 million you are talking about. Is that the impression you are creating? Uh, I'm not with Please. I'm trying to discourage our, our honorable member here from splitting heads. And the way I see it, I don't see how an answer to that honorable, question. Just answer the quickly what he has asked. No, but I, the, the point, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question, but I don't understand the question. Very well. And if I don't that, understand the let question, me, let, I me make it, let me make it simpler for you. It says, in counting jobs created, do you count the short-term employees, like those who are employed to apply fertilizer for this period and, and left, or they are talking about that permanent workers. That's my understanding, is that right? Yes, he says I'm right, so. Yeah, we're talking about permanent employment. That's job creation. From my recollection of what the Minister of Labor is saying, the definition by ILO, that is not just going to apply fertilizer and going home to sleep and then we can't do as uh, job creation. In any case, the same pool of labor. We're talking about rural labor. And he comes from a rural uh, constituency. He should know uh, what I'm talking about. <laughs> So, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Nominee, on what basis do you determine the, manner, the number of people employed on the farm? On what basis? I think he has answered that question. He the has Ministry of Labor uses the ILO regulations. He said that in his answer. So, what, what is that regulation? What is that? No, we want, we want to understand. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, this is a very important issue. The nominee is in charge of the sector. He has implemented a very important program. And he claims that that program has generated so many jobs. We are now interrogating those jobs. And we're saying that oh, when we supply the fertilizer... Honorable Member, ask a question, please. So I was just asking, what is that regulation? The ILO regulation that determines the on farm employment. What is it? Chairman, I'm surprised. The Minister of Labor himself does it has been here. He didn't ask him that question. So, uh, do, you, do you know that do you know that regulation or not? Just answer shortly. I'm not sure. Do you know that, that re particular regulation or not? Uh, I, I will refer to my uh, brother, the Minister of Employment. Yeah. Your last one, please. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, so, Honorable Nominee, do you mean that, as you said before this committee, you cannot tell the committee the exact number of jobs you have created? I don't, I don't remember if you have another person, please ask it. Now, my last question has to do with procurement of slashes by Cocoa Board for our farmers to weed their farms. Cocoa Board has procured some slashes. And in all the cocoa growing areas, you see some of these slashes lying either because the farmers cannot use these machines to weed their farms. Can you share with the committee the cost of this machine and whether it is serving the purpose for which it was bought? I know, Chairman, I think this is a very important question. I cannot sit here and speculate. So I want to uh, inquire from Cocoa Board exactly what, how much it costs and all those things, and I can come back to you. Right, thank you. Yes, Hassan. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm 
Chinese are designated, so I congratulate you. The program of uh, rapid expansion in maize and soya production for export and local livestock production is for me a game changer. And the good people of Kushegu will be happy to hear more about the plans and programs and see how much of it that we can take advantage of. Can you apprise this committee of any update on that program? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Honorable Chairman, the, this program has five modules. Planting for Food and Jobs has five modules. The, the most popular is the food security that everybody calls planting for food and jobs. And it's been conducted in a way that over the, four, the past four years, more and more smallholders have been uh, brought into the program. In fact, we started with just about 200,000 farmers, and as of last year, uh, 1.7 million farmers are benefiting. And you can see that the two basic inputs, uh, Honorable Chairman, to do with giving the farmers improved seed, which sometimes can give three, four, five times more yield than the traditional seeds that they are used to. And then the fertilizer, the quantity of fertilizer that we are giving to them have also skyrocketed. And I'll give you some statistics. In terms of uh, seeds, we, in 2017, we distributed 4,400 improved seeds of maize, uh, soya, sorghum, millet, and the others, rice, and so on. By 2020, that figure had gone up to just below 30,000. I mean, leaves and bounds from just 4,400 to 30,000 metric tons of improved seeds. And this year, we intend to do, 2021, we intend to distribute 40,000 metric tons of improved seeds to these farmers. At the same time, if you look at the amount of fertilizer, in 2017 we were able to distribute 121,000 metric tons of organic and inorganic fertilizer. By 2020, that figure had jumped to 424,000 metric tons. The rate of, of, of increase of these supplies of these is totally unprecedented in the agricultural history of this country. This year, we are hoping that we will be distributing more than half a million metric tons of fertilizer to the farmers. So, uh, the member of parliament for Mushegu does not have to worry at all. We are making sure that we reach every smallholder farmer in this country, at least in the second term of the Akufuadu administration. So, that is the answer that I can give, uh, Honorable Chairman. Uh, Honorable Minister Designate, so I'm also into livestock farming and I was excited when I was going around my constituency and hearing the success story of rearing for food and jobs. I'd like to know what program you have in place to scale up the program from the initial launch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Uh, we have a very comprehensive program for livestock development in this country. And that covers all livestock. We are talking about poultry, cattle, piggery, uh, small ruminants, uh, sheep and goats, uh, guinea fowl, and all that. And the program is such that uh, for, I'll just put poultry, poultry aside for now. We import high breeding species from the Sahelian, Sahelian region, bring them into Ghana, and distribute them to farmers, uh, selected farmers in a selected number of uh, 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 regions, especially in the, in, the, uh, um, in the savannah regions, the five savannah regions, plus some in the east and, and so on. And every year, we are increasing the numbers. We give these uh, hairs to the farmers, and we expect them to keep them for a year, and whatever, comes out of that, we take that out and give it to another set of farmers. So gradually, it becomes an exponential growth in the, 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 
the the number of uh, livestock that the farmers are producing. So basically, that is it. But I can give you uh, the numbers. Uh, in the first year, in 2019, 7,500 sheep were distributed to 750 farmers. Currently, 23,000 sheep and goats are in the process of being distributed to 740 farmers and 11 livestock breeding stations of the ministry. So if you come to pig weight, you have the numbers here, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think in terms of the economy, the most significant uh, part of the value for food and job is poultry, because Ghana is spending something like 350 million United States dollars importing uh, chicken uh, meat into Ghana. Only 20 years, 25 years ago, we used to export to Nigeria and our neighboring countries. The industry collapsed, and it's the determination of this administration to revive this, uh, uh, the livestock, which creates a lot of jobs as well. So we started with a pilot, as I mentioned earlier in my intervention. Uh, we selected a number of poultry farmers and feed millers, and we've linked them up to the, Africa, the Agricultural Development Bank and GESEL to finance them. We are just coming to the end of the first stage of the pilot, and then we're going to uh, expand the program in the next two, three years. Majority of uh, poultry farmers in this country will be benefiting from this arrangement. So that is the way it's going. When it comes to cattle, which has uh, become very controversial because of the Fulani involvement and so on, uh, we've done the experiment in their farm place, taking one big area that was abandoned after, after Kufo's uh, administration, uh, which is a, a kind of a, um, a, a ranch. We've resuscitated that ranch. We put uh, cattle in there, feeding them, giving them veterinary uh, support. The owners have to pay the, the livestock attendance, the boys to just keep the livestock. Uh, we do everything and it's proving very successful. So we intend to expand that uh, even to our borders in the north so that uh, they don't have to come all the way down but they can be, uh, they can have a cattle ranch there and then the slaughtering and so on, the meats can be brought to, into, into the uh, big cities and so on. So, uh, Honorable Chairman, this is what is happening with the, with the livestock development that we've christened realm for food and jobs. Thank you. Honorable Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Honorable nominee, I respectfully take you back to the budget statement 2020 page 57 briefly, which says that 94259, it says that 94% of these jobs are linked to farm level employment. Are you thinking of an agreed policy targeted at university graduates that will help them to get employment, high-end employment in the agribusiness? because it's obvious that these are low-level employment. Are you targeting young university graduates in high-level employment in agribusiness? Thank you. I know, Chair, one major component of planting for food and jobs, the module that we call greenhouses, greenhouse villages, whereby we have created three villages, one in Dawina, one in Bojuasi and the other in the center of Ashanti, uh, Akumadan. We, uh, with the help of a, an Israeli private sector company, we established these three, which has targeted towards the youth in particular. And the youth, I'm talking about agricultural graduates and diplomats. Well, we trained them on site for three months, seven days a week, residential. After that, the best ones amongst them, we take them to Israel. As I speak to you, we have about 120 of these uh, trainees who have come out of, our, of this scheme working on kibbutz to get first-hand experience. And they are not just going there as surplus labor. They are going there as paid employees. 
Some are getting as high as $1,500 a month with free accommodation and so on. Uh, the fares, the pioneers have come back. We've resettled them in this same area because we, each one of the, uh, of the uh, villages is sitting on 90 hectares, 90 hectares, 120 hectares of land. And we are only using five hectares at the moment. So as and when they come, Ministry of Food and Agriculture will help them to settle, uh, to do their trade on the site so that there will be a common I, I arrangement for marketing the produce and all those things and then they will just concentrate on the production, intensive production. And this is high tech uh, agricultural production for highly uh, qualified uh, youth. We are hoping that we get into a kind of uh, uh, PPP arrangement with a private company to come in with their own resources to help to expand. Everyone this. wants to ask a question, so make your answers short for us, otherwise we will keep long today. So, so that is uh, in answer to your question that yes, there's a component which is looking at highly qualified agricultural graduates and diplomas uh, to be part of the Planting for Food and Jobs program. Before I ask my next question, I will encourage you to expand it so that we can all feel the impact in Ghana. Expand that. Before I ask my next question, I will encourage you to expand that project so that a lot more young graduates get the opportunity in agribusiness. Okay, my next one is uh, more localized. In Bono East and Bono region, there's a lot of tomato production there. Tomato production. We grow a lot of tomatoes in Bono East and Bono region. However, in the month of January and May, we don't have enough. But any period short of that, if we get the traders going to Wagadugu, it becomes a challenge for the tomato production in these areas, especially the Tobodom area. Last year, you sent your deputy minister to come to Tobodom to look at it and have a discussion with them. For date, you've not heard anything from you. And that practice is going on. It's affecting the business in that area. What do you intend? doing about it. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair, yes, I remember that uh, Honorable Odro, uh, at the time my Deputy Minister, who was the Member of Parliament for New York, was dispatched to go and talk to them. In fact, he's still in touch with them, except that the difference is there's a big investment in, co uh, in tomato processing which is coming up near Brekum, between Brekum and, um, I've forgotten, but around the Bre in Brekum district. Uh, I've visited that uh, uh, facility. It's big enough to take as much tomato as we can produce. If you look at the statistics that they are providing in terms of their capacity and so on. And I'm just praying that with that private sector intervention, the people of Trabodom, uh, tomato farmers and others will take full advantage of such a industrial facility to, 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 to produce more. Uh, for, in fact, uh, as far as uh, uh, Kumadan is concerned, we are hoping that that factory would open soon so that once production starts ramping up, they will have a market for their produce. So I, I, we are hoping that that will also happen to the Bruno East and Bruno uh, uh, to, tomato farmers. My last question, which is also a follow-up. You are thinking of more people entering into the tomato production sector. Are you also thinking about irrigation around these areas to promote all year round cultivation? And I mean all these areas you are talking about, Bono East, uh, parts of Bono region, and then Akumadan area. Yes, um, the thing is, as you know, irrigation is a very expensive, uh, uh, capital intensive activity. So, uh, you may be aware of the Pualugu uh, project that the President inaugurated, um, um, well, cut the sword actually, about eight months ago, where the Governor of Ghana intended to spend nearly a billion US dollars, 950 million dollars, uh, for this uh, Pualugu irrigation and electricity generating uh, project. So just one project is costing that much. 
But as far as Bono East, Bono West, and the Forest Belt is concerned, God has endowed this country with huge valleys full of water that we can produce a lot of rice and so on. And the ministry is doing everything to promote such activities. And in, and in fact, uh, even vegetables, of course, because if they are at the check all over the place, they, that's where they, the water is throughout the year. So I would look at the natural endowment aspects to promote production first before spending the huge amounts of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, trying to bring irrigation to these places. So we are aware that in the very dry areas of this country, yes, they will need irrigation, another, and that's why we are doing the one, one village, uh, one dam project in the northern parts of the country. But I think that in the forest valleys, we have overlooked a natural endowment which can really change our production in terms of exploiting this resource with rice and other uh, uh, high water demand uh, crops. So we are looking at that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Pastor PJ. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Nobly, congratulations. And um, as a former Minister for Agriculture, we are very proud of you for introducing the Planting for Food and Jobs program. You will agree with me that to enhance food security, and, substantial, uh, and sustainable livelihoods of Ghanaians. There is the need to adopt technologies that support disease-free planting materials, production, and resilient crop varieties. At first, I would like to know whether you have been in touch with Binari, the Biotechnology and Nuclear Agricultural Research Institute in GAEC. And if you have, how do you intend to adopt current and scientific proven nuclear related techniques in this area? Thank you, uh, Arul Chairman. Um, the nuclear institution that the member for Asuka is referring to is one of many such research centers belonging to the CSIR. And I, this morning I heard the minister designate my, my namesake, uh, Dr. Freire, talking about the contribution of CSIR to agricultural development in Ghana. I'm talking about seed, improved seed, improved seed. Is improved seed have been uh, really bred at these stations by our top scientists. So if you take hybrid seed, I mean the recent one which is, will become very famous, is the Wasi uh, maize hybrid from the University of Ghana, which we are collaborating with them through a private sector company to replicate and to expand, because their production is twice as much as the OPV of our Tampa and Co., which are also products of scientists in Ghana. So, yes, we use um, uh, uh, the nuclear uh, institution for, for instance, the pineapple industry, which nearly collapsed, the nuclear technology to produce the, the new seed for uh, pineapple and is reviving the pineapple. Uh, at the moment, we are looking, uh, we are working with them on this of crop development where nuclear technology can be used for the seed and other productions. So yes, we are closely working with the scientific community in Ghana to ensure that their sweat is, uh, is a major input into agricultural development in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as a follow-up, I think uh, what I want to know from the Honorable nominee is uh, whether your ministry is prepared to sink in some funding 
to explore more into these technologies. Because honorable, I can tell you for sure that currently we have a problem with our farmers and they are having difficulties and the challenges in insect agriculture, insect pests, which they have the right technology to address. But what we are faced with, the Ministry of Environment, Science and Technology doesn't really have the adequate funding. But since it resides with your ministry, we, I would like to know if you are prepared to support this uh, binary to develop these technologies to support the, where the, uh, insect, the pest controls and also improved variety of uh, satellite. Thank you. The budgetary constraints facing the Ministry of Science and Technology is the same constraints facing the Ministry for Food and Agriculture. So, uh, Benari, we recognize their potential, and like all other research institutes, are suffering from acute uh, shortage of uh, uh, resources for them to carry on work that they have been trained to do. So, uh, we really sympathize with the Ministry of Science and Technology for not having enough budgetary resources to support the diary. But obviously, whatever product comes out of the work of the diary, we are prepared to propagate and distribute among farmers at some subsidized rate so that they can uh, increase their, their yields and, and their production to support the transformation of agriculture in Ghana. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, and my last uh, question, and that is on ornamentals. So when we talk about ornamentals, I know you know, flowers and all that. It really contributes significantly to our socioeconomic, uh, our socioeconomics of Ghana. And there's a high demand for potted plants and fresh flowers by consumers in Ghana. However, growers are faced with ineffective traditional propagation methods. And then I want to find out how would you help to mitigate these challenges? I think I've had a discussion with you that it has such a potential that it is important that we add it up to the very the numerous programs that the ministry is promoting at this point in time. How would you want to support that. Thank you. Uh, Hello, Chair. This question really relates to the, the, the component of planting for food and jobs, the module uh, greenhouse villages. Because you go to Kenya, uh, fresh cut flowers, uh, vegetables, and the greenhouses is they are very, very significant in the agricultural economy. To the extent that they are able to bring $3 billion worth of these products to the European market. And yet, they are about three times the freight away from the market. We are only five and a half hours. And indeed, the village concept, the uh, greenhouse village concept, includes fresh cut flowers. And, and other ornaments. Uh, it's not. It's just not. It's not only vegetables, and, uh, and that, that is a very important component. And it still requires this greenhouse technology to be able to produce that. So uh, there's a lot of hope for the future of these ornamentals and and cut flowers because our eyes are actually trained on not only vegetables for export, but also high quality. Uh, cut flowers and, uh, and ornaments for the European market, which is so close to us. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my first question is on smuggling of 
government subsidized fertilizer to neighboring countries. As a chairman, in August 2017, Ghana's graphic business uncovered a syndicate of smugglers who carted subsidized fertilizer across our borders to the neighboring countries. I want to find out, and from successes, Ghana loses close to $120 million as a result of fertilizer, I mean, smuggling of fertilizer. I want to find out from August 2017 to date, what practical steps did you take to prevent or stop smuggling of government subsidized fertilizer in the country? Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair, since uh, this is a house of record, I want to find out from the Honorable Member this $120 million that he talks about. Honorable Minister, if that is not correct or you don't know that, say that, but you don't ask the question. Okay. So let you give us the answer. Because I'm, I'm surprised. The total amount of money we spend on fertilizer in this country, it means that half of it is carried away across our borders. And that, that cannot be true. This is why uh, it's a rhetorical question, but it, it, it is a, a fact that I'm stating that it cannot be $120 million. In any case, uh, Honorable uh, 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 Chairman, we have taken very severe measures in the last two years to stop the leakage, the illegal uh, 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 trade in fertilizers across the borders. And the reason why it is there is very simple. We are the only country around us which subsidizes fertilizer in seed. No country does that. And therefore, the, and we are subsidizing fertilizers, as has been indicated, 50%. So the smugglers have a field day uh, with a huge amount of uh, money if they are able to carry one bag across the border. But I would like to, in answer to his question, I would like to come out uh, with four items that we have done. First of all, we have restricted the distribution of fertilizers to the districts that are known to be uh, uh, indulged in this uh, trading. And these are, in the Upper East region, we have six districts that we have restricted the movement of fertilizer into. Upper West, six districts. Northern region, two districts. Northeast region, uh, one district. And Volta region, five districts. So for the last two years, we are, we've restricted the movement of fertilizer to these districts because we know them to be the centers of this illegal trade. Now, apart from that, we have also branded, we have branded all fertili uh, fer uh, subsidized fertilizers with big logo, planting for food and jobs, and with a yellow band cross, uh, diagonally crossing every bag. And the bags of fertilizer for subsidy has also been reduced from a unit weight of 50 kilograms to 25 kilograms. So that is another area that we are doing, we are, we are, we are, uh, we are resourcing to, to reduce to the minimum the uh, movement of uh, fertilizer across our borders illegally. At the moment, we are trying a new system of e-monitoring of fertilizer distribution. Uh, we've experimented in the northern region with, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 50,000 farmers where we register them, take their thumbprints, give them a card, and they can load, uh, just like uh, Momo money, they can load uh, on it and then uh, use it at a re uh, retail and pick up their fertilizers to go and, and apply on their farms. So we have gone to a great extent, and these are is working. And not only that, because of the threat of uh, jihad in the northern part of uh, West Africa, Ghana has stationed platoons of uh, soldiers along our border in the north, from east to west. Uh, and we are collaborating with these plat uh, platoons also to monitor 
movement of uh, fertilizers and other products, including uh, some uh, petroleum products across the border. So this has effectively reduced to the minimum the amount of fertilizer which uh, 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 crosses the border illegally. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my next issue is on uh, cocoa production. Mr. Chairman, for the 2019 budget, on page 112, Cocoa Board is implementing some interventions to ensure cocoa production in the country. Some of the interventions include mass spraying, artificial pollination, cocoa farm irrigation and mass pruning. But the, I'm sure the minister will agree with me that if we go to the western of now, as part of implementing these uh, interventions, cocoa production keeps on going down. So my question is, what do you think is the problem and what is your effort going to do about the drastic going down of cocoa production in the western of region? Honorable Chairman, it's very unfortunate that we witnessed a massive decline in the heart of the cocoa industry, which is now the north, western north. And we all know that production has virtually collapsed. Now, that has its genesis well before we came into office. The policies that were implemented by the previous administration by removing the subsidy, the grants that were given to farmers for cutting their trees infected with solid shoot did not help. Um, the so-called free distribution of fertilizers to farmers did not help either. So it's taken over five, six years until we came before any effective action was taken. You remember that um, in the heat of the campaign, I think it's October, uh, no, September, the president launched this $600 million um, scheme uh, supported by the African Development Bank and the, and the Japanese banks to try and get to the bottom of this uh, outbreak of solar shoot by making sure that every tree not only in the Western North, but in this country, is cut because there's is a virus just like COVID-19. There's no, in, the, in, the, in that case now, at least we have vaccines for COVID-19. In the case of uh, uh, the uh, uh, CVBS, there's no, we haven't found any solution, a scientific solution. The only solution is to take out and then plant with a new seedling. And the new seedling, of course, takes three, four years. So we are given grants to farmers who uproot, uh, take out their trees for the three-year period that they, 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 they wait for the new seedling to start yielding. The government is given a grant, uh, I've forgotten how much, every year to support their incomes while they wait for this. And that is encouraging the farmers to voluntarily come forward and cut their trees. And it's going very, very rapidly. I don't have the statistics. Last year, the number of trees that were cut compared to, that's 2019, compared to 2020, is a huge increase in, in the numbers. So farmers are now very comfortable with this scheme that has been put in, in place by us. And we are hoping that there will be a massive revival of the cocoa industry in the Western North in another three, four years when the scheme is fully implemented. Thank you. Honorable, honorable member, no, be, be hmm? guided and take a cue. That will be your last. Mr. Chairman, 
my next question is on the payment of uh, cocoa purchased by cocoa board to cocoa farmers. At the moment, the minister is aware that cocoa board owns the LBCs, and therefore the LBCs also own their district managers and uh, and the uh, purchasing class. The minister tries to provide some answers, reasons that have accounted for this non-payment to the farmers. I remember. Oh, Mr. Please, please, please. He's doing I, know, I know what I'm doing. Oh, sure. Sit down. Be quiet and listen to me, please. Yes. What is this? Mr. Nomi, you tried to provide some justification for the non-payment. My question to you is, when should cocoa farmers expect cocoa that be bought by cocoa board to be paid to them? When? Because we are trying to say that we are expecting the last drawdown and we don't even know when the last drawdown will be, I mean, will come. So when? Should the poor farmers expect payments of their farm produce? The chairman, I've spent some time on this subject, but because Honorable Wahi is a good friend of mine, I will indulge him with an answer. Monday, farmers will start getting paid. Yes. My last question. Honourable, honourable, respectfully, your respectfully, you must stay your turn. Hey. Thank you, honourable chair. Congratulations, Doc. Doc, congratulations. And my question relates to the Ghana Côte d'Ivoire Sustainable Cocoa Initiative that was established, among other intents, to. Um, promote better pricing for farmers and to combat the cross-boundary smuggling and to promote other interests. Can you apprise the committee on the benefits yielded so far and what would you do to sustain the gains in this collaboration when given the north? Thank you. Uh, sorry, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, The, yes. the question was a bit muffled, so I couldn't hear a part of it. Yeah, look, can please look, um, for the benefits of repeat, um, the Ghana Côte d'Ivoire Sustainable Cocoa Initiative, the bilateral arrangement that was established with Côte d'Ivoire um, to promote, among other things, better pricing for farmers and to combat cross-border smuggling of cocoa and to promote other uh, mutual interests in respect of cocoa production. Um, some two, three years on the implementation, what are some of the gains that this bilateral collaboration has yielded for the country? And what steps would you take, one given the north, to sustain the gains, the gains yielded from this bilateral arrangement? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chairman, yes, uh, this collaboration started three years ago. But it's only this year that we've actually implemented it. We've implemented it. The LID, the Living Income Differential, is to do with the fact that on top of the premiums that the chocolatiers and uh, processors abroad pay for the, the produce from Ghana, for instance. On top of that, every ton of cocoa that we sell to these uh, uh, importers abroad, they pay 400 US dollars on top. So in the case of Ghana, we are talking about two, $200 premium, natural pre premium, historical premium. So on top of the 200 pounds sterling, on the London terminal. There is also the 400 
dollars per ton that these uh, uh, customers have to pay under the LID. That has enabled us to increase our producer price in, on the 1st of October, as the President announced in Serioso, uh, by $400. So that went straight to the farmers, and they are still benefiting from it. It's only recently that it has emerged that Cote d'Ivoire is having problems in implementing it because there is virtually a boycott by a section of the international traders of Cote d'Ivoire uh, uh, cocoa. And of course, they know that Cote d'Ivoire produces a chunk of the total production between us and Ghana. They do something like two and a half million metric tons. Ghana is doing around 800, 900,000 metric tons. So there is a lot of pressure on Cote d'Ivoire uh, at the moment, which is causing a distortion in the market and is making it difficult for uh, the implementation of the LID in Cote d'Ivoire. But we are in touch with the authorities there to see what we can do in order to sustain the, the whole arrangement. In fact, uh, three days ago, I was at an international conference, International Fund for Agricultural Development. We had our 44th Council meeting. I'm a, I'm a governor there. And because of the COVID, we couldn't go to Rome. The key speaker happened to be the chairman of Mars Chocolate. And I confronted him uh, after his speech with the question that you are saying that you are doing all you can in Indonesia to help small holding farmers. Here in West Africa, you have the late LID with you and some of you are, uh, you are not abiding strictly by the, by, by the arrangement. You know? Oh, the answer he could give was that, as far as mass is concerned, they are keeping to their side of the budget. And of course, it is an international conference. I couldn't have a banter with him on the issue. So I had to leave it. But it's definitely is coming up under some strain because the cooperation that we expected the uh, customers and trust to, to bring to the table seems to be wobbling as we speak. But we are still working on it to make sure that it stays on course. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Mr. Chairman, on my side, um, Doc, you recall the cocoa district that are operating to make cocoa implement fertilizers and extension services more accessible to farmers, operates uh, in this joint with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture established um, cocoa, uh, Ministry of Food, Food and Agriculture district. The MOFA districts are different from the cocoa districts. And sometimes you find one district, one MOFA district, being served by about three or four um, cocoa districts adjoining. It makes it very disjointed. Would you consider an expansion of cocoa districts in, in streamline with the MOFA district, such that there will be one clear direction where farmers would assess cocoa implement and extension supports from. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chairman. This is an issue which has been ongoing, and we've dealt with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I know, for instance, that uh, Bosome Frehon, the uh, district chief executive, approached me about the fact that they had to send their cocoa way across to Bakwai and so on, and it's, uh, it's discouraging cocoa production. So he made an application to Cocoa Board, and now they've been granted a district. So, and the same thing for German, uh, uh, German North, uh, one of the areas. They were saying that it's encouraging smuggling because they have to bring their cocoa all the way. They wanted their own district. I drew the attention of the CEO of Cocoa Board to it, and I'm sure by now they've taken action to create a district for them. But it means that we need to review the whole arrangement because the structure of production, of course, has changed uh, since it was established. These districts were established maybe 30, 40 years ago. So we will look at that and see how best we can uh, fashion out a more realistic uh, district uh, arrangement. But whether it will coincide with, with Cocoa Board districts, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry, with Mofa districts, I'm not sure. We'll have to look at it. Thank you.
Она благо, да. Я готов. Thank you. Chair. Yeah. Um, how you've talked extensively about um, planting for food and jobs. And I, I want to take you back to uh, that policy. Now, how, how different is the planting for food and jobs policy from the usual agro subsidies that almost all governments in this country have undertaken? including offering support to large-scale farmers, all crops, <laughs> because under the planting for food and jobs policy, um, there are just a few um, selected crops that the policy applies to. Thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Chairman. The difference is very simple. It's the scale of it. The scale of it in terms of the amount of resources, public resources going into these areas of subsidy and the quantum of it, the number of farmers benefiting from it. That's the difference. And it's such a difference that is unprecedented. And I have the statistics to support what I'm saying, in the sense that if you look at budgetary resources which has gone into planting for food and jobs, it is such a massive increase. And I, I just want to give you the very accurate statistics to demonstrate the point that I'm making, and I don't seem to be fighting um, just a second. Anyway, I'll, I'll come to it in a second. So, for instance, before 2017, the, uh, this fertilizer subsidy has, was put in place by the Kufour government in 2007. And it, it was continued by the NDC administration for the two terms until we came. Throughout that period, the largest amount of fertilizer which was imported under the program was only 110,000 metric tons. And the 110,000 metric tons, the highest amount of subsidy was only 20%. 20% between 2007 and, 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 and 2016. When we came, as I, I, I told you, from 110, last year, 2020, uh, 2020 we we were able to distribute about 400,000 metric tons of fertilizer and a subsidy to farmers. 400,000. And not only that, we came in with a subsidy rate of 50%. So, in terms of scale, and as I said, from 2,000 beneficiaries in 2017, we are talking about 1.7 million beneficiaries in 2020. So it is such a huge volume that last year between seed and fertilizer alone from the budget we spent nearly a billion seeds. Never happened before. Both in terms of quantity, value, beneficiaries and so on. So that is the basic difference between planting for food and jobs and other government agricultural projects, uh, programs in the past as far as subsidies concerned. Now, honorable nominee, uh, notwithstanding the difference in quantum, uh, that is what you say is the difference. Women groups have complained bitterly, particularly in the Upper West region, that the policy is discriminatory against them because um, you have to have up to a certain acreage of farm before you qualify to 
um, become beneficiary under the policy. And yet, as you know, women are most vulnerable. Most of them are below the poverty line. So they are not able to benefit under the uh, policy. Secondly, um, the category of crops that the policy covers does not include granules. And you know in that part of the country, granules farming is the mainstay of women in particular. How, how do you intend to address this challenge associated with the policy? Uh, Honorable Chairman, I, I share the sentiment of the Honorable Member in that respect that there is always been discrimination against women, but it depend, the severity depends from locality to locality, culture to culture. And if I may, Honorable Chairman, I will recall a, a story where my car was stuck in the bush somewhere around Mion, and I had to wait for two hours to be retrieved from the bush and for another car to come with a tractor to come and pull me out. And my, I was going to visit a group of women farms. They wintered when I got there over 7.30. Luckily for me, the moon was so bright, we had the meeting. There were about 50 of them. It was a small village, but there were about 50 of them sitting under the tree waiting for me. And we had the meeting. And their complaint was exactly what you were saying, that we should give them special project. We shouldn't uh, 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 add them to their husband's requirement because very little comes to them. And I was very sympathetic to that. Fortunately for me, the regional director of agriculture was with me. So um, we felt that we should make that as a pilot, make a special uh, program for the women in that village to see how that will come up. Uh, uh, up. To be honest, this is about two years ago. I, I haven't gone back to check about the impact First of all, the action that you took to make sure that the women are separated and given special treatment, and if so, what impact has it got on production and so on. But now that you've reminded me, I'll go back to see how this thing works, because you're right. Government programs of a rural nature tend to favor men more than women and, and, and kids and children. So we have to be able to design these programs or fine-tune them to make sure that there's a balance between uh, the, uh, the, on the gender issue. So uh, I'd like to thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, yeah. Final question. Um, Honorable Nobini, the last time the minister designate for roads appeared before this committee, like you are you appearing now, um, he gave strong indication that the Futuliga Wesi Road is one of priority for this government because of the agricultural potential that the um, Fumbisi Wesi with the Bilisi Valleys uh, 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 comes with. Now, and he further indicated that so the Ministry for Roads and Highways is going to collaborate with. Um, the Ministry for Food and Agriculture to open up the um, valleys which are noted for rice cultivation. Now, what concrete plans do you have from the perspective of Agric to open up the Fubisi, Godimbilisi, Uesi valleys for rice cultivation? Thank you. Um... Honorable Chairman, the area the Honorable Member is talking about was one of the first areas I visited as an undergraduate in agriculture at the University of Ghana. And they took us there to show us that this, these are valleys, about 18 of them, that can supply the whole of West Africa with rice. And when I became Minister for Food and Agriculture, I don't know how many years after, is about three years ago when I visited. I was very disappointed to know that only 
1,300 hectares have been developed. Out of, I don't know many, how many. So it's really uh, wasting natural resources to find these valleys which are ideal. Academics accept that that is a place, uh, farmers and so on, but very little development. And in fact, I was in the company of the President of the Republic, the Chief of Fubusi, appealed to us to come and open an agricultural college. And it's very much on my cards to do so. But not only that, we intend, as we speak, under one of our projects, we are clearing over 2,000 hectares. Don't forget, all those years, 40-something, 50 years that I, I went there, only 1,300 or so has been we are doing 2,000 as we speak. You go there, they will tell you, you, go, you can go and see for yourself. We are very determined that we will make sure that God's endowment in Fumbisi is realized. So we've also, we are also building a warehouse. Uh, we put a, a, on a pilot scheme a, a rice mill, a small solar rice mill to see how it works. So we have very big plans for, for the area, you can be assured. And indeed, my... Uh, uh, Honorable Minister Designate for Rose, uh, we've discussed it that in addition we need the infrastructure uh, to open up the place whilst the agri we do our bit to do so. So we are very, very big people of the area uh, and uh, uh, you'll hear more about, about that in due course. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Good day. My first question is, uh, what accounts for the huge difference between earnings from these tree crops and cash crops in Ivory Coast and in Ghana? He says, what accounts for the huge difference in earnings from tree crops Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Yes, um, thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. For those who are not very conversant with the subject, <laughs> Ivory Coast earns something like 17, 18 billion dollars from three commodities. Ivory Coast and something like 16, 17, 18 billion dollars every year from three commodities, about five of them. Ghana, we earn 2.3, 2.5 billion dollars from cocoa alone. And we could do far better. That's the essence of Tree Crop Development Authority. That authority, which is new, is just coming on the market, is charged with a responsibility to ensure that in the next eight years, 10 years, we should be earning at least 15, 16 billion dollars a year from these selected crops. Oil palm, coconut, mango, rubber, coffee, uh, uh, cashew, shenanigans. That's their brief. And if the government of Ghana supports this authority, I'm sure we'll be there faster than I am even thinking. So there's a lot of lessons to learn from Cote d'Ivoire about diversified agricultural economy than the, the monocrop agriculture that Ghana has been practicing for 140 years since Tetequashi brought cocoa from Fernando Po. Thank you. But Honorable Minister, the farmer in Cote d'Ivoire, yes, this is a follow-up, I'll, I'll give it back to you. The farmer in Cote d'Ivoire is a businessman and he or she invests heavily in, um, what do you call them, plantations, compared to us, where still the largest majority of our farmers are small farmers. How are we going to reach their figures when we use the same smallholder farmer approach? If, if the smallholder farmer has been able to deliver a world-class industry like cocoa in Ghana with a premium of 200, 300 pounds sterling on top of the London market. 
I don't see why they cannot do the same with, co with coconut, oil, palm, rubber, mango, coffee, cashew, and the rest. We can use the same vehicle to develop. The only thing is that government has not been supportive of smallholder farmers outside cocoa. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, the research, the marketing, and so on are taken care of just like their cocoa and coffee. In Ghana, it doesn't exist. And that is the assignment given to the, uh, the, the Tree Crop Development Authority. And it should establish a research with the research organizations and institutions doing research into these various crops. They should set up the marketing systems. They should use private sector for the development, for the financing of the development and so on, and not rely on the exchequer and all those things. That's their brief. And I'm sure uh, you may not forget that it's only recently that bill came here for this August House to bring it into law. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the president has inaugurated the, the management and the board. And um, they are yet to be given their seed fund. But I'm talking to the Minister of Finance to make sure that happens and they will be off the tracks. Thank you. Yes, you may continue. Thank you. Um, with the support of buffer stock, uh, free SHS has been able to manage very well as far as feeding students are concerned. Uh, what is missing is that how is it that we are still not able to give through buffer stock enough cocoa products for our secondary schools? What? I said through buffer stock under your ministry, free SHS has benefited a lot in economies of scale, quality of the food that are supplied. Why is it that we are not able to do the same thing for cocoa products to our secondary schools? Cocoa products have been supplied from Ghana Cocoa Processing Company in Tema. Cocoa CPC, as they call it, is two-thirds owned by Ghana Cocoa Board. They've had their problems, their financial problems in the past where they went and borrowed 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they borrowed in dollars. And uh, so the depreciation of the currency really brought about the collapse of that company. It's only under the current management that uh, that industry is trying to revive itself with their new arrangement that I have put in place between Cocoa Board and CPC to make sure that the company revives. It's got a lot of potential, and I'm glad that the collaboration is working. And once they are on good footing, then obviously uh, the, the, the kids can have their chocolate, no problem. But at the moment, they are not strong enough to do so. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go to the first. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, I want us to go back to a matter that was raised by the minority leader when he engaged you a while ago. It involves a impasse between a fruit terminal company limited and the fruit export Terminal Ghana Limited at the ports and harbors. Um, first of all, what was the scope of the 2008 concession agreement that GPHA refers to as a defunct agreement? And are you aware that the FTC is still operating the shared nine? that MOFA refurbished and doing so under tariffs that have not been since revised when they were fixed in 2008, despite the fact that GPHA has for over seven times revised their tariffs. Are you aware that FTC still operated Shed 9, even as FET um, was in charge of Steve Dory. So the first part of the question is, um, what was the concession agreement? What was the scope of the concession agreement? I know, Chairman, 
I'm surprised that the agreement that we have with GPHA should be referred to by the Honorable Member as defunct. I've never heard GPHA referred to it as defunct. I've never. And we've had a lot of correspondence. This is the first time it has been attributed to them. So that is uh, beside the point. The main point that we are talking about is to do with the fact that the Shed 9 Ministry for food, of Food and Agriculture had to borrow half a million US dollars from the World Bank to put it in a position to export fresh fruits and vegetables. And they haven't, the agreement has all conditions which up to today has not been met by GPHA. Fortunately, I started communicating with my colleague Minister, Minister of Transport. That communication is still going on to see how best we resolve this issue at the port. So I'm not in a position to make any comment, uh, either public or private, on this issue until the discussion with the Minister of Transport has come to a, a clear conclusion. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Chairman, I have a follow-up on that. And I have seen a number of correspondence between GPHA and the Ministry, and I can say on authority that they have referred to that agreement on defunct. I have those documents here. But the follow-up uh, has to do with the fact that um, at a point, okay, this correspondence, um, FTC and FET began to discuss shareholder purchase. FTC therefore appointed Ensign Young as transaction advisor at some point. They even requested for an extension of the memorandum of uh, understanding validity to allow them uh, access all the information that they needed to acquire the shares in FET. Now, per this letter, dated January 11, 2021, GPHA writes to the Chief Executive Officer of Fruit and Export Terminal and says that we reckon in part, and says in part, that we reckon that this directive of the Minister of Agriculture when carried out by GPHA will offend the concession agreement we executed with you on May 18, 2015, which granted you rights to handle the horticulture products and related operations. Unfortunately, we are not in position to decline the directive, considering the source and the motive behind it. Accordingly, we wish to hereby put on notice of your intention to terminate the concession agreement dated June 18, 2015. This is conveying information to them, information regarding the termination of a concession that they have with Ghana Ports and Harbour. And clearly, the language will tell you that GPHA is not comfortable with that directive that has been agreed and sent to them by you and the transport uh, minister. Again, GPHA in a briefing oh, to you. Oh. Are you asking a question on I'm that? asking a question. I'm asking a question, Mr. Then Chairman. Please if, follow you are, up with if, the question. Patient, if I ask the question without this background, it will not make sense, Mr. Chairman. With all due respect. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So, this is the latest letter. But in a briefing to you, Honorable Nominee, they indicated that they had a concession with FET. And as part of the concession, FET was obliged to construct a facility designed to house the central store, the printing section, and offices for the electrical and welfare sections. The cost of this building is estimated at $3 million. And according to GPHA, FET has actually carried out all these projects. According to GPHA, worth $3 million. Now, the cancellation of this concession, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, how will the nominee assure this committee 
letter that has been written by Providence Law Consult, already indicating intention to legally battle GPHA, that a judgment debt will not be, you know, over the heads of Ghana any moment from now, as far as this directive to cancel the concession with FET is concerned. Yes, Honorable Minister. Honorable Chairman, I must confess I'm totally bemused and confused about all the, the quotations that he's making. I've already said that I'm in discussion with the Minister designate for Transport, and this discussion started before the end of our term. And I'm not in a position to make a comment on the issue. It would be very unfair on my part to make a public statement when my fellow colleague is in discussions with me. It's unethical. Thank you. The question really was that, I think you have answered that question already. Are you sure that um, a judgment debt is not likely to ensue? I think you have answered that question earlier. Has he answered that the same question? And he answered. Mr. Chairman, has he answered that? Yes, the Honorable Minority Leader asked him the same question earlier. Well, um, I'm sure that uh, my chief whip will uh, look at this because uh, we shared this document because. I would have loved to follow up on it, but I will move on to another uh, question. Um, planting for food and jobs. In an answer to an earlier question, you indicated again that that is what you wanted to leave um, as a legacy. I have seen documentation suggesting that, for example, in 2013, the government of Canada began discussions with the government of Ghana on a budget support program, like they have done in the past, in connection with the design of uh, their next phase of support uh, to agriculture. And a number of tasks were undertaken. And on 25 February 2016, the first secretary development, the first secretary development of the Canadian High Commission met with the Honourable Minister of Agri, uh, Mohamed Muniru Limuna, then, and. Uh, pledged 125 million Canadian dollars support for the 2017 budget. During the State of the Nation address in February 2017, His Excellency the President made reference to this um, um, pledge from the Canadian government, an amount of, one, let me just quote what the President said, a, na a national campaign planting for food and jobs will be launched to stimulate this activity. An amount of 125 million Canadian dollars has been secured from Canada a friend of our nation to support the initiative. Now, also at the signing ceremony, um, we're told then that the initiative was called MARC, that is Modernizing Agriculture in Ghana, and that uh, it forms part of efforts by government to reverse the declining growth of the agric sector over the past eight years. This was at the signing ceremony between Ghana and Canada, where the finance minister, Ken Oforiata, uh, signed on behalf of Ghana and the Canadian High Commissioner to Ghana, Ms. Hita, and Cameroon, on behalf of a count, also signed on behalf of a country. Now, honorable nominee, beyond the support that came from Canada, that you inherited as Minister of Agri, what other sources of funds have you mobilized and injected into the then MAC, Modernizing Agriculture for Ghana, rebranded planting for food and jobs? Yes, the question is, is it modernizing agriculture that has been rebranded? No. What was the question then? The question traced the relationship between Canada and Ghana and the offer of 125 million Canadian dollars to support modernization of agriculture. And the state, the, the, the sooner of His Excellency the President in February 2017 making reference to say. So I'm asking, beyond this Canadian fund, which was sourced 
and which he inherited as Minister of Agri. Which other funds has he mobilized as Minister of Agri and injected into this program, then called MAG, now called Planting for Food and no, Jobs? That's, that's the question, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect. Nah. <laughs> yes, Honorable, have you sought any other fund apart from what Canada? Uh, Mr. Uh, Honorable Chairman, I think the I remember Parliament is getting very confused. MAG is for a specific, specific purpose of re-establishing extension services in the agricultural sector in Ghana. And the support is coming in, ter in terms of logistics. So they have provided vehicles, 300 pickups and uh, 3,000 motorbikes for the extension services. But, Honorable Chairman, before we took over, I did an audit. The extension said I was supposed to be handed over 4,000 extension officers. When I did the audit, there were only 1,600. And out of the 1,600, 80% of them were going on pension in another two, three years. So there was virtually no extension services for, for the vehicles to, to service. I had to come to cabinet to ask for an excuse. Minister, so you have, your program is different than your sort of yes, funding. Yes, yes, so, so I don't understand that's, what you're saying that it's called, it's called planning for food and jobs. It's not. Mr. Chairman, and secondly, question. And secondly, Mr. Please, Mr. Chairman, I'm the, answering the question. Yes, Let me okay, finish thank your question, please. Secondly, if you ask where other resources, which other resources have come into planting for food and jobs, I'm glad to tell him that GOG, Government of Ghana, and uh, Nana Adodanko Akufuado, has increased the budgetary allocation to my ministry from 414 million in 2016 to 965 to 954 million in the past one year. <laughs> so is our own resources which has gone into planting for food and jobs, not any Canadian or any foreign uh, uh, intervention. It is a commitment of the President of the Republic to see to it that we put agriculture on a solid footing. And that's where the resources are coming from. Thank you. The Chairman, with all due respect, budgetary allocations to ministries have always increased year by year. And from 2000 to 2008... Honorable, oh, no, kindly ask your other question, please. Mr. Chairman, I'm saying budgetary allocations to ministries represent budgetary allocations to planting for food and jobs. Unless he says that... Honorable, is that a question or your commenting? You can run the commentary after, please. That's another question. Well. We do what we do on behalf of the people of Ghana. My next question, planting for food and jobs still. Mr. Chairman, I've seen a number of research reports. One by, the, by researchers at the University of Ghana who described the planting for food and jobs policy as a piecemeal initiative that lacks the potential to make the desired impact on smallholder farmers. Now, this was um, a research carried out with the support of um, um, the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana in collaboration with Oxfam Private Enterprise Foundation and other partners. There's another one uh, published by USAID. Uh, titled Assessment of Implementation of PFG Program Lessons and Way Forward. Uh, they also identified inadequate supply of inputs and um, political interference and low awareness of some other uh, parts or inputs of the program beyond seeds and fertilizer distribution. Then there's another assessment by Imani that talks about um, uh, the fact that uh, mechanization of the farming process is not that, you know, highlighted by uh, the program. Mr. Chairman, my question to the uh, nominee 
is with all of these findings, what quality assessments exist for the aim of the project, first of all, and the seeds, especially, that are produced? And what support exists for especially local seed producers so that at the end of the program, uh, we will have empowered and bold local capacity for especially the production of seeds in this country. And how timely are payments made to these suppliers? As honorable chairman, I'm still very confused because he's gone on and on and on. I don't know as, as specifically which what one, was. Which one did you hear? I, I, didn't, I didn't get any. <laughs> Can you repeat your question, please? So, Mr. Chairman, I made references to research findings that have identified shortfalls in the planting for food programs. And I want to find out from the minister, those shortfalls include seed production challenges. It includes awareness in some of the uh, 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 programs, you know, models. Those research findings have also uh, talked about late supply of some of these inputs. And I'm asking the minister what quality assessment programs are in place to ensure that these shortfalls identified by researchers are addressed, especially in relation to seed growers, local seed growers, the capacity building for local seed growers, and how timely are payments made to especially suppliers under this project? That's the question. Honorable, they said a shortfall in seed production. Do you pay them timely, those who produce the seeds? Which one of the third one? So that it will be easier and quicker. Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> Mr. Honorable Chairman, he's been very selective. He's been very selective in his choice of literature because I can also cite 10 different research work which is saying that planting for food and jobs is doing wonderfully well. But I don't want to bore uh, this committee with it. The only thing I will say is that the seed industry in this country has been revived by planting for food and jobs, creating the demand for improved seeds, and a lot of private sector investors are going into seed production all over the country, across the, the country, in terms of both seed, uh, food crops and cash crops. That one I can attest to. So, as far as we are concerned, um, there's a lot of stimulus going on for input providers in the private sector, which is what we, 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 we target to do. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my next question, Honorable Nominee, what has been the source of procurement for fertilizer and chemicals, especially at Cocoa Board, since you became Minister? Sole sourcing, restricted tendering, what has been the procurement procedure or process used in procuring fertilizer and chemicals? If you are talking about the Ministry for Food and a great Honorable Chairman, it is as transparent as any process would be. We advertise in the newspapers, all the newspapers in the country, is on radio every year that the Ministry is looking for A, B type of fertilizer, organic, this, this, this. And they, we go through the procurement process. So it's, it's called. Please, could you direct your questions? 
Honorable, uh, look at me, address me. Yes. Ignore us, yes. yes. please. But it's disrupting my... Honorable, we all do a sight. You should just ignore them. Please talk to me. So, we are... So, Mr. Chairman, we are very transparent in our dealings with our procurement in the Ministry for Food and Agriculture. Thank you. Okay. Yes. John. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations um, to the Honorable Nominee. And you have achieved a lot in line with the vision of His Excellency the President and the planting for food and jobs. And, uh, but one area that the farmers are not so happy is the poultry sector. As a result of cost of feed and heavy competition from importation of birds into Ghana, it appears poultry farmers in Ghana are uncompetitive. You have indicated that you are going to give special attention to the poultry sector and that uh, Agri Development Bank is also coming on board. I want to find out, is there a way, as a way of doing something differently, is there a way we can use the Ghana Commodity Exchange to provide an uptake arrangement with these poultry farmers to help them to become more competitive on the market? Thank you. Hello, uh, Chairman. Yes, um, there is a role, as you know, that the, the basic ingredient for poultry farming is to do with feed. Feed can take up to 80% of the cost of production. And the feed elements are to do with soya and maize. The two are already on the Ghana Commodity Exchange list. And not only that, uh, Buffer Stock Company is also there to buy through its agents, uh, uh, the uh, surpluses that are generated around the country. In fact, this pilot scheme that I mentioned, I, told, I said that poultry, far, poultry farming, we are doing a pilot scheme involving about 200 small poultry farmers, which will extend. It brings together the maize and soya producers it brings together the processes, uh, 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 soya mill, milling processes, and uh, uh, maize mill, milling processes. It brings together feed producers and also the poultry farmers. And beyond that, the, the, uh, along the value chain, also the slaughtering houses and the, and the uh, retail uh, uh, shop owners. So. All the five are linked in a chain that it goes from A to B to C to D and so on. And we've done them in the pilot, as I, I mentioned, and it seems to be working. So the next step is to increase the number of participating smallholder farmers to, uh, from 200 to maybe 1,000. I'm yet to check with my, uh, the project manager on this. And then gradually step up, as you know, uh, within 90 days of the check that we, uh, uh, we should be able to produce a two kilogram, a three kilogram bear. And therefore, there's a chance that if the management of the system works well, at least we have three slaughterings in a year for each group. And this is what we are pursuing. We've linked the Agricultural Development Bank and Gersel to these uh, different groups of farmers, uh, uh, of, um, of, of stakeholders particularly the, poultry, the, the, the millers, because the millers have used their capital, building their mills, but they don't have enough working capital to buy from the farmers the soya and the maize. So that is one area that Agriculture Development Bank is intervening to make sure that the whole flow uh, goes on without any uh, disruption. And we are hoping that the assistance given by Agricultural Bank and Gersel will continue to, to grow so that eventually the whole poultry industry will become a net exporter of poultry 
another important situation that we find ourselves today. Thank you. Very well. Yes, very um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, who is my tennis court mate, has been beating me on the court. Unfortunately, so I, I have issues with him, and this is my opportunity, in easier means uh, terms, to retaliate. <laughs> After this, when you meet me on the court, you can do whatever you want to do. But let's get back to Koko, honourable uh, colleague, member of parliament, and minister outgoing minister and looking forward to coming back. Now, the data, International Cocoa Organization. In 2016, Ivory Coast produced 1,581,000 metric tons of cocoa. Ghana produced 778,000 metric tons in 2016. So you took over in 2017. Today, in 2019-2020, the International Cocoa Organization is estimating that Ivory Coast is producing 2,100,000 metric tons of cocoa. And you, in Ghana, will produce only 800,000 metric tons. 2019-2020. 2019-2020. So you will produce 800,000 metric tons when Ivory Coast will be producing 2.1 million. It means that between 2016 and 2020, your colleague in Ivory Coast has increased production by about 600,000 metric tons. And you would have increased production by just 20,000 metric tons. So 600,000 metric tons across the border, and you have increased production by just 20,000 metric tons. How do you assess yourself? in the light of these figures. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chairman, yes, it is true that Honorable Ayaga sometimes runs away from me on the tennis court, but that will not deter me from giving him a proper answer to his question, which is a very interesting question. So, Mr. Chairman, yes, the trends that are being painted in the two countries are a true reflection of what is happening. But we have to go behind the veil to see the factors driving these performances. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, they've gone into areas that traditionally were not producing uh, in the forest, semi-forest areas, and have expanded very rapidly with inflows of labor from neighboring countries, uh, Guinea, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, and so on. Uh, in the case of Ghana, and so their, their stock of cocoa trees are fairly new, young trees, yielding disease resistant as any young uh, uh, being will be. In the case of Ghana, we are lumber with aging uh, plantations which are heavily diseased, led by the dreadful uh, uh, CVVS, which is the, uh, the virus, cocoa uh, illness, which in the heart of the industry in the Western North, as I mentioned, had really driven a knife through the heart, the heart there, 
um, production has been reduced by half in a matter of two, three years. And this uh, situation, the disease uh, spreading across even to parts of Ghana and Eastern region is due to the way the, the disease was managed when it rose its ugly head. That was when decisive action should have been taken around 2012, 2011, 2013. Unfortunately, the method that they used, the government at the time used, did not help. They were asking farmers to cut the trees without giving them any financial assistance to compensate them for the three or four years that they had to wait with the new seedlings that were being supplied. So by the time we took over, the disease had really spread beyond, beyond uh, 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 the immediate environs of, of, uh, of Western North to parts of Western region, uh, Central region, Eastern region, and even Ashanti region. So we are really battling with a situation where after, even after the reintroduction of grants to farmers, at the moment, especially in Western region, we are given grants, three year, yearly grants, to not only the farmers themselves, but also to the landowners, because otherwise they would disinherit the tenant farmers who are working on their farms. So this has been in place for two years, and now the effects on the farmers volunteering to take out these infested uh, 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 trees is beginning to work because more and more droves of farmers are now joining the program voluntarily and we, we, we have all these uh, teams of, uh, 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 of gangs going around helping the farmers to cut and replace with the new uh, strains of uh, cocoa seedlings that we are doing. So this is what is happening and this is a cause of us more or less standing still while the Algorans have entered into new areas and have expanded the area under cultivation considerably. In fact, I'm surprised that he's talking about 1.1. There are estimates that Cote d'Ivoire is producing over 2.5 million metric tons of cocoa. So that is the situation and I'm trying to get a picture explanation as to why the different rates. Where else is stagnant going back because of the disease, old trees, and there's uh, expansion of area and the cultivation with new, young, vibrant trees. Thank you. Yes. So, Honorable Oni, if I got you right, are you suggesting that the AFDB facility, um, which you procured, is likely to assist in addressing these challenges in the industry by way of rehabilitation and uh, creates a new environment for, for our farmers to get a better yield? Absolutely, Honorable uh, Chairman. It means that this, uh, we've been negotiating for this loan for about two, three years, and it's only last year that was finally approved. We are yet to draw down the first tranche. But it's definitely going to accelerate the process of cutting out these trees and, and expanding our rejuvenating uh, our, our old cocoa areas by replanting with high yielding, early maturing uh, trees, which will boost Ghana's production in the medium term. Thank you. Yeah, so you are correcting my figures. You are saying that the Ivorian um, uh, estimate is actually 2.5 million. Uh, 2.5 million. Uh, so that just buttresses my point that they increased by about a million and then you increased by 20,000 tons. Now, you are attributing almost every reason why this is happening to cocoa disease. Um, don't you think that the key difference is in the liberalization on the Ivorian side and the continuing state control of production and marketing on the Ghanaian side? 
resulting into inefficiency in input, you know, uh, cost and other factors and the monopoly that the state is exercising over the marketing means that it is only the resources that the state is able to mobilize that gets injected into the cocoa industry. Whereas the liberalized side, the liberalized program of the Avoda side, you know, is pushing a lot of people into investing in cocoa production, which is exponentially seen to this expansion that we are seeing in it. So are you willing to really reconsider this state control and monopoly of inputting into pro uh, cocoa production and the marketing of uh, cocoa produce and the monopoly in the export of uh, cocoa products in, 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 in cocoa, cocoa beans in, in Ghana. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair, I think Honorable Ayaga is asking all the right questions. And it has an underlying philosophical uh, implication as to whether state control or uh, 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 private sector control is the best. This argument can go on forever. But I want to assure him that the system that we have today was actually started in 1947, not yesterday. And it has served us very well indeed. We are just going through a transit period. We were the dominant force in world cocoa production for more than a century and a half. I would want to remind him. It's only the last 20 years or so that Ivory Coast has taken over from us. So we shouldn't despair. At the peak of it in the beginning of the 1990s, Ghana and other African countries came under very heavy fire from the World Bank, from these Washington institutions to liberalize. The best we did was to liberalize the local internal marketing. And we left the core function to the state. And I think those who resisted then uh, did a very good job. Because in as much as we are looking at production and saying the system is better than this, there are a lot of problems with the Ivorian system, huge problems that are emerging. And given another 10 years or so, uh, when things mature, we will see which system. But at least in our case, we have decades and decades of experience and have some of the best personnel, technical people managing our industry from research through marketing and so on. And these are very dedicated people who by well standards and compare with any in the world. And I think that we should take comfort in that and not look at the temporal, short-term performance of production to change our system. Thank you. A follow-up question on that one, sir. No, follow-up question, sir. No, no, please. A follow-up question, please. Just go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the last time you appeared before us, I asked you a question about cotton production. Cotton production and, and what? Okay. Chair, since he's moving into cotton, Chair, would you leave? Since he's going into cotton, may I, as a nominee, would you say that the aspects of the state control, would you say that the aspect of state control in the cocoa sector has resulted in high quality of Ghana's cocoa as compared to Cote d'Ivoire? Because we're talking about experience hands and way we ensure quality control and all that. I am saying that, you know, the, the, the metaphor my colleague was trying to create in terms of the yield and all that, and your emphasis on quality. Is it your case 
that as a result of the state control of aspects of uh, the, the value chain is what has led to continuously Ghana's cocoa uh, being of the highest quality. Yeah, it is indeed. Uh, Honorable Chairman, Ghana is reputed to have the, by far the best quality cocoa beans in the world. And in fact, the manufacturers of chocolate and other big processes abroad would take just a little bit of Ghana cocoa and mix it with Indonesian and other origins to bring it up to the level. This is why Ghana cocoa has historically had this premium on the terminal market of sometimes as high as 300 pounds per ton. And you are right, um, uh, the, the, the deputy leader, to say that this has been possible because of the control, the central control that we, we, we have and ensuring quality assurance and so on in the industry. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to do a follow-up on the same cocoa liberalization debate. It's a very important debate, Mr. Mr. Chairman. No, it's, it's a follow-up. Chairman admitted follow-up. Now, if one country next door liberalizes and is able to increase, increase income on those cash crops by you mentioned, was it 1 billion or 18 billion? I mean, 8 billion or 18 billion? Was it 18, 18 billion? Is what comes to agriculture through liberalization of the tree crop sector. And we get how much? 2 billion. 2.5 billion. Okay? That's, that's, that's in terms of income to the country, whether it's coming to government or private sector or it's being shared with the international investors or whatever. Then production increases. One side is producing, you know, 2.5 million metric tons, and the other side is in, in, uh, producing 800,000 metric tons. 800,000 metric tons. I mean, how how can you say because you are ideologically opposed to liberalisation, this stark evidence of progress generated by liberalisation? is a problem. And how can the quality of cocoa production be tied to state control? It's a function of agronomic practices and supervision and the quality of seeds and fertilizer and etc., which the state could still supervise and control even if it has been done by private sectors through your various regulatory institutions, crop research institute, the fertilizer uh, uh, committee and all those other bodies. Is it are you just opposed to liberalization ideologically or you think liberalization cannot produce for Ghana the values and the, the income and the results that it is producing for Ivory Coast? Thank you. Hello, Chairman. I wish we were in a different forum to debate this subject. Um, I don't want to take us away from the essence of what we are doing here. Uh, it's a question of opinion, as he's expressing. So I think we will leave it there and then move on with our discussion. A very important matter to me, fertilizer subsidy, the pricing of fertilizer subsidy, the amount of money we spend on importation of fertilizer, and ultimately what I think is a huge inefficiency, a huge inefficiency. In the, in the pricing of fertilizer because of the fertilizer subsidy. Now, can you tell us, relative to the world market of fertilizer, okay, how much as a country do you, let's say, purchase fertilizer per ton from the people that you award the contract for the supply of uh, fertilizer? And don't you think that we'll all be better off if you just liberalized, opened up, and allowed as many people as possible who have funds to import fertilizer and sell directly to farmers, and, and therefore everybody can get as much as they want to buy. And then rather, we, we compensate farmers with higher prices of the produce. 
Don't you think that would be a more efficient arrangement? Look at the figures, how much you are spending on fertilizer imports and how much food we are producing after that investment. Honorable Chairman, I don't think that Honorable Ayaga wants to pursue me for a debate. The fact of the matter is that if you talk about the amount of money government spends on fertilizer and seeds, the amount, the quantity of food produced, and you put a figure on it, it is a very lucrative business for the government to invest in agriculture. If you take maize and the others, in the first year, where we have the full figures for 2017 and 2018, government invested something like 600 million in 2018, uh, 600 uh, million No, let, let's take 2019. 851 million. Cities. Now, the amount of food produced in terms of the grains, the direct effect, we are talking about the farm gate uh, income of 1.8 billion cities to the participating farmers. There couldn't be any better business than that. Apart from the surpluses that come to the cities, much cheaper, lowering inflation, all the macroeconomic benefits, directly inside the pockets of farmers who would then spend the money on secondary tertiary things to increase the economy. You can't put a figure on it. So for me, it is a very good investment, except that you have these uh, thieves who want to cheat the state by taking it and crossing the border with it because they stand to make a lot of money for themselves. And as I've said before, the ministry has taken very strenuous uh, 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 measures to reduce the smuggling to the minimum by restricting, and I don't want to go back to the, uh, to the numbers and the figures, restricting the movement of fertilizer to uh, specific districts which are known to be doing it from the Volta region all the way to Upper West, uh, Chiripone and all those, uh, I don't want to mention the names of the districts here. So, <laughs> well, I didn't want to go there. So, apart from that, reducing the unit weight from 50 kilograms to 25 kilograms to make it more difficult for them to pack and unpack and all that, and then using these garrisons that we, uh, military garrisons that are now crossing the west, uh, the, the northern part of the country uh, to stop the jihad and so on, collaborating with them to make sure that uh, smuggling, you know, they are patrolling the, the, the borders uh, and all that. So we are we are taking great measures and also uh, enabling. The 25 kilogram bags boldly were planting for food and jobs with a yellow a diagonal band to identify it and so on and so forth. So we are happy with the measures that we put in place to minimize uh, 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 smuggling of uh, fertilizer. But when it comes to the policy itself of making sure that the poorest people in this country who happen to be smallholder farmers who cannot pay for the market price and have no clue that by using improved seed and fertilizer, they can treble or even quadruple their annual income, which is what you are seeing today. It's much, I would recommend this to any government in Ghana or anywhere else with similar arrangement uh, to carry on with that, that policy. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I will be yes. <clears throat> Most grateful, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I will like to raise the matter to do with self-sufficiency in rice production. I've seen that the latest numbers, official statistics, are indicating that we are doing 665,000 metric tons in production which is just about 50% of our demand. I would like to find out from the honorable nominee, 
what the strategy is moving forward for self-sufficiency in rice production, because we have the capacity in my own constituency of Aveima rice, for example, what is the, the plan for the future of Aveima rice, Prairie Volta Company Limited, as it was known, uh, appears defunct at the moment, but all across this country, from the Volta region all the way to the northern regions, we have capacity to be self-sufficient in rice production. I want to find out from the honorable nominee what the strategy is moving forward. And do we have any timelines as to by what period Ghana can be self-sufficient in rice production? I think, uh, oh, Chairman, I have already put my neck on line. I'm saying that with all the confidence I can gather, that by 2023-2024, Ghana will be self-sufficient in rice, and maybe earlier. And I'm saying this with a quantity of improved rice seed, agro seed, that we've been distributing to these farmers in my four years, uh, in past four years, as a Minister for Food and Agriculture. I have the statistics here to give, and I, won't, I don't want to bore you, but let me give you a few of them. The quantity of seeds that we supplied of, of rice seeds, agro seed, for PFJ was 1,698 metric tons in 2017. By 2020, that figure last year, we distributed 8,500. That's from 1,006, uh, roughly 1,700. We had distributed 8,500. And these are high yielding seeds that we have distributed not only to the traditional areas in the northern savannah, but also to the valleys of the forest region, which are endowed with a lot of water suitable for rice cultivation. That the, the preparedness of the farmers to actually accept this new rice trade. I mean, last year, around this time, uh, in March, I, was in, I went around the country, came to eastern region, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing in the valleys. They become like the Lamsay sites. Young men and women pouring to these areas, growing rice, because the farm is so profitable that they, they, they uptake. They, they just even couldn't wait for the Ministry of Agri Agriculture to bring them the seeds. They were using, some of them were using traditional uh, local seeds to plant. And you could see the difference between the agro seed and that. So, uh, we know that this will continue. We will continue to provide them more and more of these seeds. And with that, the yield are much higher. So we know that by 2023, 2024, in terms of actual production of paddy rice, we would reach the mark. The biggest constraint of all that is to do with milling capacity. Honorable Chair. Milling capacity, we estimate Ghana has a milling capacity of only 400,000 metric tons. If you want to reach 1.2 million metric tons, and you have only capacity for 400,000 metric tons, then you are in trouble. But in a way, we've been relieved by the demand for Ghana paddy rice from Nigeria and others. They are coming here and, and mopping up. And until the private sector, because government hasn't got money to be installing mills, so until the private sector, which has also started investing in mills, can catch up with the demand for milling capacity in Ghana, at least we'll be helped by our neighbors to, so the farmers do not waste their, their time producing and sitting there uh, without any um, uh, uh, bias. There are buyers from outside the country who will take them away. So the farmers will continue to produce so long as we give them the rice, uh, seeds, and so on. So we are very confident. Uh, honorable uh, member, that we, we will be able to do it. Aveime rice. Well, Aveime rice is very famous. Uh, we all know it. You mentioned this company, which uh, Prairie and so on, they've been in dispute with us. I came to inherit that uh, uh, dispute. It, it still goes on unresolved, which is unfortunate because they came with very good intentions and uh, at the moment, all the areas that they prepared for planting have been taken over by private people. 
which is also very good. And most of them are young people. I have met a taxi driver in Accra who is farming rice in Niaveime. A lot of young people, even teachers, doing it part time and so on, which is very encouraging. So we we are here to help. So uh, any member of parliament who can organize in his area a group of uh, young people, we will prepare to give them the seed and support them with the fertilizer and so on to make sure that they get some uh, benefit from what we are doing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my second question relates to concerns I have reading the Auditor General's report for 2018 and 2019, particularly with reference to the audit they have carried out on the planting for food and jobs. The audit report for 2018 at page 167, the Auditor General reveals that there is an outstanding debt on planting for food and jobs of 2,889,289. And uh, if I can read the paragraph 364, it says, under the planting for food and jobs, farmers are provided with farm inputs. The farmers are required to make upfront payment of 50% of the farm inputs before the farming season, and the remaining 50% loan payable after the farming season. During our review, we noted poor recovery of the loans from the farmers after the farming season. In 19 offices visited, we observed that out of a total of 5.5 million granted, only 2.2 million has been recovered thus far. This is 2018. In the 2019 report of the Auditor General, the matter comes up again at page 125, and this is... Uh, at paragraph 252, failure to recover debt from defaulters, 2,728,440 Ghana cities. And uh, it says indebtedness of tractor and equipment beneficiaries. That's also 3.1 million Ghana cities. That's uh, at page 130 of the report. Uh, at page 125, of the report, we are also told that failure to recover debt from defaulters of the Planting for Food and Jobs program, 2,728,440. So you're making all these investments, but the Auditor General is pointing to leakages. And uh, I'm worried, will the PFJ be sustainable if these losses and these leakages with the Auditor General is reporting continues. Are you aware, are you privy to this uh, audit findings and what are you going to do to stop the hemorrhage? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm aware of these uh, debts, these outstanding. But you know, we have to take it in context. We are talking about hundreds of millions of series worth of uh, inputs and these 2.8 million series and so on uh, even the banks do not recover to that level uh, it doesn't mean that it's not important to us it is very very important to us and we are taking measures and as and when we go we are collecting uh, uh, it's not a debt it's not a written of is still standing in the books, so we are aware of this. In fact, we have, we have a dedicated auditor who goes around the, the country looking at these and reporting back to me directly as to how much of the debt in this district has been paid by who and all that. So I can assure the honorable member that it is not something that we are leaving uh, unattended. Uh, I'm actively on top of the, of the issue the more it's really a question of education. The farmers realized that before we gave these facilities. And, and I'm sure if uh, the honorable member, as his, uh, his uh, constituency of the email, they will confirm to him that the, these facilities had never been provided by anybody. This is the first time. And they realized that they're endangering their chances 
if they carry on, because once you have a debt in a, in, a, in, a, in a group, once and twice, that's it, we cut you off. You and the whole group, you will never benefit from the subsidies again. And they, initially, they, when we came and we said this is a penalty, they thought we were joking. But we put that into practice, and that's making uh, people pay, because if you look at the percentage, these figures that you've mentioned, 2.8, 2.7, 3.1, 2.7, and yet I'm talking about an increase from uh, uh, 414 million for seed and fertilizer to all the way to 800 uh, to 954 million. So the percentage of it which is, goes unpaid is actually declining. If you look at the absolute figures, you may think it's, but definitely it's declining. And it's because of the efforts, efforts that we and the ministry are putting in to ensure that we retrieve, but obviously any credit of that nature in a rural environment, you will never be able to do 100%. But we are trying, that's our target. And uh, I can assure the Honorable Member that it's not money lost at all. We are pursuing them. Thank you. Thank you very much. My third part of question will focus on your handing over notes. I have a copy here at page 215. I am quite alarmed that of the 3,751 vehicular fleet that you have, only 50 are tractors. That's your own writing. Uh, I can read it if you, if you want me to refresh your memory. 14, paragraph 14.2, page 215. Inventory of assets and properties of the government. The Ministry of Food and Agriculture's total vehicular fleet of 3,751, consisting of 701 vehicles, 3,000 motorbikes, and 50 tractors and equipment for its operation. This is uh, 50 tractors and equipment, less than even a quarter of the 260 districts we have in Ghana. I would have thought that tractors and equipment will rather be more than the vehicles uh, and, and, and motorbikes. I can understand that especially the extension officers who need motorbikes. But only 50 tractors for the whole Ministry of Food and Agriculture? Uh, is, is this figure accurate and exactly what is going on? Hello, <laughs> Chairman. I'm surprised that the, the member of Parliament is expressing surprise because when the farm mechanization centers were established under the Kufour administration in 2006, and they built up, I think, 56 farm mechanization centers where smallholders could go and hire services to plow and, and all that. In the subsequent years, eight years, almost all of them came to a standstill because of lack of maintenance, uh, spare parts, mismanagement, and so on. So when we came on board, there was virtually no farm mechanization centers really working. And that's the reason that we have only 50. But even 50, I'm surprised rather than uh, in the reverse. I thought there would be no tractors. But we have restarted the program of farm mechanization centers with what we have received from Brazil so far, where well, we've given 52 um, um, uh, local government authorities a, a, a core number of uh, tractors and other things. We are going to add to it those who perform well. And then we've given another um, hundred and something to farmer groups that we have, uh, we've organized around the country. And then, of course, private sector people, commercial farmers, and so on, have also received them. The government of Akufuado decided that to encourage mechanization, we, had to sub we are going to subsidize farm machinery, imported farm machinery, by 40%. So a tractor and a plow and others, we should have cost over 230 cities, were, were, were being sold to farmers, the big... Honorable, Honorable Minister, let your record be clean. 230 cities? 230,000. Very well. Yes. 
um, you are going to be very interested if it was only two minutes. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and with 145,000, you could have the whole set um, uh, for the same amount. So, we, have, we are re-establishing, and as I, I mentioned, the Brazilian facility, the last tranche is coming by the end of the first quarter, uh, this quarter, next, uh, the second quarter, we should start receiving them. And we intend to use it to establish more uh, farm mechanization centers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I hope that the Honorable Nominee will Sorry? my follow-up on the third question, on handing over notes. Follow-up from this answer? Follow-up on handing over notes. I said that my Follow-up on the answer, <laughs> not notes. Please ask the question. The nominee is assuring us that he will address this alarming situation of only 50 tractors uh, that the ministry can boast of at the moment uh, in the 260 districts. Can the nominee give us some timelines? Uh, you have said that you would work had at it, but can we have some timelines, uh, some timelines and some numbers, say by end of 2021, what will this increase to some specific numbers, if, if, if we can have that assurance? Uh, sorry, I don't have those figures with me, but I know that we are going to have a big infusion of farm machinery. $150 million from Exim Bank of India, and we are going to have this 33 or is it 34 million uh, last tranche from Brazil. That's quite an infusion in one year to have, uh, I'm sure it was it's unprecedented to have nearly $200 million worth of farm machinery coming into the country uh, to do all kinds of things, on-farm, uh, harvesting, uh, and then uh, off-farm processing, and so on. And so I know that we definitely are going to have a significant uh, uh, input of farm machinery into Ghanaian agriculture. That one, I'm absolutely sure. But in terms of when it's going to be and so on, I don't, I don't have the figures with me. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now, okay. You have, you have one, and those who have one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senior nominee. Does your ministry have a mechanism to monitor the use of chemicals, especially weedicides, fertilizers, and so on, and the long-term effects of these chemicals on the human body? Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairman. Yes, we have a division, actually it should be an authority, and uh, we are working towards it, called the Plant Protection, uh, PPRSD, Plant Protection, uh, whatever, whatever uh, it is. And they are the ones who are in charge by law uh, in monitoring chemicals, in issuing permits for all plant materials coming into the country or going out of the country, uh, the fertilizers, the uh, effectiveness, the seas, uh, and so on. So it's a whole uh, department with highly specialized staff who are there. It's just like the Food and Drug Board and, and the others, uh, Standard Board and so on. They are there specifically for, for plant and animal life. Uh, in that we are the, I would say the plant, the police, the plant police men of Ghana. They, they are at all the borders of Ghana checking anything, food, or uh, plant, uh, soils going uh, out of the country or coming in, or animals coming in or out, including dogs at the airport, and all those things. They have quarantine facilities and all that. So we do monitor chemicals. But uh, the impression uh, hidden in the question is the worry that too much chemicals will be spoiling our soils and so on, which is a a concern that was expressed to me many times. But we shouldn't forget that Ghana has one of the least 
application of fer chemical fertilizers in the world. And that's one of our problems, that we are not applying enough chemicals to boost our production, our productivity. So when we came into office, the average per, acre, per hectare of uh, 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 fertilizer application in Ghana was only 8 kilograms per hectare, compared to the world average of 130 uh, kilograms per hectare, and China of nearly 300 kilograms per hectare. So even the West African Echo was in 2007, the heads of state adopted a resolution that our target for West Africa is to raise our uh, application of fertilizer to, 30, uh, to 50 kilograms per hectare. Since we came in, we managed to increase the per hectare application from 8 kilograms per hectare to last year 20 kilograms per hectare, which is still less than half of the ECOWAS uh, heads of state standard. So we are very far away from polluting the, the soils and environment with fertilizers. And I can assure uh, the honorable member that we are keeping an eye through the monitoring of PPRSD to ensure that we don't exceed uh, the levels which will be will harm our environment and, our, and the food intake. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Chairman. So we question? agreed on one each, didn't we? That's what we agreed with the leaders. And I'm sorry, please. Chairman, it's a follow-up question, please. I hope you have enough manpower in that department, though. My other question is, who controls the proliferation of hydrophonic systems? Who controls the proliferation of hydrophonic systems? Hydrophonics. Hydrophonics. I should take off my mask. Hydrophonics. Yes. The proliferation of them. Yes. Now, now I, I, I understand your question. Yes, I mean, hydroponics is one area of, uh, I would say, water agriculture. And the closest that we are doing is what we call the, the greenhouse villages. And if you come to Borja City, to our center uh, there, that's your constituency. So you should visit Borja City. <laughs> so I said who controls? Control. Yes, so there's a whole area of hydroponics where we are producing vegetables based on just water and the chemicals that are mixed in there. So I would, I would entreat the honorable member to visit the of. Uh, uh, I have visited. I'm asking who controls that whole industry. Oh, it's uh, a light uh, one, but. The, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture does control. It, actually, that Bojasi site belongs to the Ministry of Food and Agri Agriculture. So it's, 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 uh, it belongs to the ministry. And there are three of such, including Bojuasi in Ghana, one in Dawinya and one in uh, Akumadan in Ashanti region, which we have done together with the Israeli company, uh, uh, which uh, is, is what it is. Mr. Chairman, I will engage the nominee later. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, my question has to do with power tiles that was uh, promised in your 2016 manifesto. Um, and having been the minister over the last four years, I'm sure you would have some ideas about the power tiles. In 2018 budget of the government, uh, it was stated that the government intends to contribute 1,000 power tiles and 1,000 power tiles. Is it less? I mean, yes. Okay. Very well. <laughs> Very well. Power tiles. <laughs> and then in, 20, in 2020, in the 2020 budget, government indicated that it had imported the thousand power tillers. Uh, there is, however, no evidence to suggest that these power tillers have been distributed to the farmers. 
uh, can you tell the committee whether they have been distributed and who the beneficiaries are? Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chairman, yes, indeed. Uh, we imported these uh, power tillers from Brazil, and specifically power tillers because we wanted uh, farm machinery technology which would be suitable to smallholder agriculture, not these huge tractors that uh, are beyond their, their means and uh, even for hiring. So yes, we have we brought a, part, a thousand partners in. We've distributed all of them, except for a few. We invited uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Honorable Chairman, to our site at Agricultural Engineering near Bema Camp. You can come there anytime, and we'll show you whatever is left. But they've all been distributed. Where they've been, they've been distributed to. I have to get the details for you. But if you visit us, we'll make it available. Thank you. Chair, as a quick follow-up, do you know the cost of how much, I mean, how much it was, uh, at what cost, the thousand power tillers? Oh, these are very cheap. I think they're about 6,000 cities apiece. Yeah, they're not expensive at all. Yes, we that should. Do you want to ask a question, yes? Yes. Go ahead. Doc, congrats again. Um, I've been worried about farmers' attitude toward farming. I don't know if you have some plan to set in place um, a framework to educate farmers, for them to appreciate farming as a business other than the, the usual approach to farming. I think, um, Honorable Chairman, through the implementation of planting for food and jobs, a large majority of farming community, especially the smallholders, are beginning to see a change in their attitude towards farming. Because now surpluses, every farmer, almost every farmer benefiting from food, planting for food and jobs, is producing a surplus. And a surplus, not only for the household, their household, but a surplus which they keep some in stock, and some of it they actually sell to meet their daily household requirements. I remember very well, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, visiting the palace of one of the biggest traditional chiefs in this country, the Nayiri. And he told me this parable, that in his whole life, the first time that new maize has come to meet old maize was in my time as a minister for food and agriculture. It is a parable because what he meant was that Normally, once you harvest, you consume with your household, and there's a gap you have to wait for maybe two, three months before the new harvest comes in. But now these days, while the harvest is coming in, you still have stock of the previous year. And he said it, it never happened before. So you can see that farmers now have surpluses not only to feed their, themselves and their families, but also to buy the necessities of life uh, um, a cloth for the wife, uh, a shirt for the child, uh, and so on and so forth. So that in itself, and they've never seen so much production for themselves ever. I mean, on average, you go to Cicela area where they used to harvest four bags of maize or 50 kilogram bags of maize with a traditional crop. Now some of them are doing 40 bags of maize in one acre. 40 bags with hybrid maize. So they, they are beside themselves that, hey, so technology can change our lives. So automatically, the man is looking at it as a business. He can build his house or renew his house, buy himself a motorbike, uh, you know, send his children to school with good, uh, and so on, and good uh, uniforms and so on. So I think that uh, planting for food and jobs is, is changing lives 
and lifestyles amongst the rural folks. Thank you. Doug, um, I commend you highly. I've witnessed evidence of the change, especially with the advent of planting for food and jobs. But uh, I'm quite concerned about non-traditional exports. Um, what will be your plans in the next years ahead of us for specific to non-traditional exports? The change in the armor of planting for food and jobs is the planting for export and rural development for which an authority, Tree Crop Development Authority, has been created by this parliament uh, through the efforts of the President of the Republic, Nana Adodanko Akufuado, to diversify Ghana out of our monocrop economy, which has been hanging on our necks for over 140 years. And if this vision is transformed into implementation, that will be the leader in non-traditional exports. Right? It will become traditional in the sense that there are these three crops which will, will, will produce it and earning as much as cocoa is earning us today, each one of the six. In addition to that, we have the green greenhouse, the greenhouses, uh, which we, uh, villages, which we, we, we just mentioned in Bajras and other places, which uh, will be the nucleus of the vegetable, develop the vegetable industry in this country for export and for domestic tourist industry and hotels and so on and so forth. So these are all non-traditional exports, uh, cashew and all the others, where we are making the greatest of effort to ensure that they become traditional in quotes, uh, to join COCO in giving this country the capacity, export earning capacity to develop our health systems, uh, our roads, infrastructure, uh, and so on, uh, and, our, and our schools and our educational system. Thank you. Look, um, mango is repeated as the next green gold, and uh, in the Somenia belt, is proving that we have two seasons, which is quite unique to us as a country. Um, I recognize the success of Chop with the tree planting initiative, but conspicuously missing is that of initiative on, on mango. And I know how passionate you are about mango. Are there any specific plans of supporting the growth and the plantation of mango in the future? Yes, mango is one of the six crops selected for development. And mango is unique in the sense that of all the crops that we've selected for this venture, it is the only one where we have sufficient production capacity, enough trees and so on, but is blighted with two different types of diseases. The BBD, there's a black, uh, what, a black spot uh, uh, disease, and then you have these flies that also uh, bear into the fruit and spoils, uh, and that is uh, through that we lose about 60% of our total production of mango. Fortunately, recently, in the last two years, we found this uh, chemical from Israel and South Africa to do the BBD, and this application, I myself am a mango grower, and I know what I'm talking about. So it's been very effective in controlling the BBD. The fruit fly is uh, still a menace to us. We are looking for opportunities to be able to control it, apart from uh, creating these nets to catch them and all that, which is very cumbersome and is not very efficient. So there's a great uh, potential for our mango uh, industry in Ghana. And uh, if we can get over these diseases, I tell you, Ghana will be one of the big mango uh, exporters in the world. Thank you. So, uh, Sandy, I recall when we played as a nation uh, by the fall of the world, um, there was a lot of commentary relating to it. How successful have we been under your leadership uh, in controlling the fall army world? 
and other measures to avoid its reoccurrence. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. In fact, we could say that the control of the Fall Army Worm is one of the biggest uh, achievements of the first term of my leadership of the ministry. Fall Army Worm first came into Ghana in 2016, the year before I took over. And I, by the time I realized when we took over, the insect was already doing the damage, but I had underestimated the rate at which the damage was going to be. And it took us until April before the alarm bell started ringing and we started desperately looking for a solution because it was a new thing altogether. Our experts didn't know how to go about it. They hardly had to read about the biology of the insect, how to control it, how it's been done in Brazil and other places. Our extension officers had no idea. Our farmers, of course, had no clue. So before we realized and started fighting back, it was a bit late. So that year, the total area infested was 249,000 hectares. We were able to spray all the 249,000 hectares and to retrieve the, the area that had been affected, except 14,247 hectares, which were destroyed by the army web. We launched this program of educating our extension officers and the farmers and, and getting the right chemicals for their control and the timing of the application. So the following year, 2018, we lost only 79 hectares from 14,247. The following year, 2018, we lost only 79 hectares. 2019, it was reduced to only 26 hectares. Past year 2020, we didn't lose any hectare from fall anywhere. And it's because now we have the experience, the farmers have the experience, we're able to buy the right combination of chemicals, distribute them to the farmers uh, on a timely basis so that they can spray. That is, if you are doing maize, for instance, you plant two weeks after planting, you just spray. Whatever it is, you spray. And that saves you all the hassle for the rest of the three months or so that you need to harvest. So now, uh, fall army worm has become part of the biology of Ghana. It's not going to go away, but it's just like mosquito and malaria. So, so long as you know how to control it, it's, it's part of the fauna, uh, uh, but we, we, we know how to handle it and bring it under control. So as I speak to you, uh, Honorable Chairman, I can say that we have defeated the fall army worm. Thank you. Look, we, I guess we didn't budget for or against the invasion of the army web. We didn't budget for it. So how did you deal with it? Where did you get the funding to deal with it? I, uh, Honorable Chairman, I had to go to Cabinet and present a case of force majeure that we are being invaded by an army there's an army of insects which are going to hit our stomachs by destroying our food systems if we didn't do anything. So, cabinet allocated to us 10 million Ghana cities as a special emergency funding, and that's what we use to buy the chemicals. But subsequent years, we put it in our budget, and I can give you the amount of money we spend every year on the chemicals to control uh, the the, the fall armor well, the, the insect. Look, I've also read that we've become net exporter of some food items during your, your, your last of your four years. Yes. Uh, how did you do it? How sustainable is this feat going to the future? Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chairman, this is something which the whole of West Africa and the international community have come to accept as one of the, our achievements. In 2019, 
we exported 19 different food items, 150,000 metric tons of them, worth something like 19 million US dollars. If you go through the books of the Ministry of Finance, you won't find this, because these are all, uh, uh, the trade is very informal. People bring silver into this country, they change it, and then they buy these things and take them away. And instead of our customs uh, at the borders checking and making sure that we receive whatever is required of us and the, and the foreign exchange are returned and so on, that doesn't happen. So I call it ECOWAS trade. And we have become a major breadbasket of West Africa. Our people coming all the way from Kano to buy our foodstuffs. We also export uh, plantains and, uh, and so on from Agogo and so on into Burkina Faso where traders have their own area for Agogo plantain. Nothing else but not only from Ghana but just specifically for Agogo. And they are making brisk business. I'm sure you saw the television footage of it where a camera and a crew followed the truck of one of the uh, traders into Burkina Faso and interviewed all the people in the value chain, the competition from Cote d'Ivoire, the fact that Ghana plantain is much preferred because of quality and is of higher uh, price and all those things. So it's something that um, we have sustained. Even this year, uh, the past year, when we had drought in the south, heavy drought in a major season, heavy drought in a minor season, we temporarily drove out the price of maize in uh, December, January. Now you see that the price of maize is coming down because the harvest from the north is feeding into the south, into the poultry and other places. I gave as a precaution a permit, honorable uh, 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 chairman, very interesting. I gave the poultry farmers sent a petition. They were pressurizing me. I gave four different permits for them to import yellow maize for, for their uh, and none of them was able to bring it in. Why? Because if, if, even with a high price, the world price was much higher than what uh, we were receiving here. So it shows you the impact that planting for food and jobs has had on this economy. And um, we uh, intend that with the way things have gone, uh, it's very sustainable uh, to make sure that all farmers in Ghana actually come into the program to uh, further the growth in, in, in our agricultural systems. Thank you. Look, um, Acura scientists or some Acura scientists have advocated the need for agro-invest insurance. I know a number of jurisdictions, even in the sub-region, I think Kenya and largely Uganda, who are practicing it. I am not one person who advocates for the full-scale uh, agriculture insurance. But I think it's something that we can do if we probably focus on, for a start, at least, the non-traditionals or our staples. Is this something that has crossed your mind? And are you considering it, of ensuring that maybe Ghana looks at in the face of the climate vulgarities, climate change, the weather patterns, and all that. Thank you, hello, Chairman. Indeed, I've had a few inquiries in my office of foreign insurance companies wanting to come and set up uh, crop insurance. But we are at very early stage. I mean, we've actually been focusing on increasing the growth of our. Uh, uh, first of all, of our, of our uh, food crops for food security and, and all those things, and making sure that all farmers, smallholders, are rich with improved seed and fertilizer. But I think the next stage will be to look at this. Two of them have brought proposals which we haven't yet considered, I must confess, uh, because there's too much on our plate at the moment. But I think that in this second term, it will be on the agenda to look at this crop insurance as a way of strengthening uh, and sustaining the growth that we've managed to achieve in agriculture. Thank you.
Look, I, I recognize you, you answered a question relating to irrigation, but this is specific to the craplings. I've checked a number of State of the Nation address and uh, often it's been mentioned. Large acreage of land lying fallow. Is there any plan to develop the Accra Plains in, in the context of irrigation? Uh, when I was in this August house as a ranking member, I remember battling it out with uh, my counterparts on the other side of uh, the promise that they are going to irrigate their farm plains with money from China. The, CB, the infamous CBD, three billion, part of it was going to. And I remember I used to stand on this floor to lambast them that they promised, but we don't see anything coming out of that. And really, uh, nothing came out of that. At the moment, we, uh, the Kufanu government, is looking at Kualugu uh, for the irrigation, a major, uh, the biggest investment, one single investment in the northern savannah, which is nearly a billion dollars uh, of uh, dam, uh, electricity generation, and uh, uh, what, uh, 4,000, uh, I think it's 15,000 hectares of irrigated land in the, in the Boko, in the uh, Pualugu area. So that is our focus at the moment. And I think that to spend that kind of money on irrigation, which is only one of many activities for development in agriculture, is a real commitment by this government to irrigation in Ghana. Thank you. So, uh, organic products globally attracts wonderful premium. Um, is your ministry considering or has some plans of facilitating farmers who, who have the desire to go into organic products? Yes, in fact, uh, organic fertilizers are part of our scheme of fertilization. So we have contract with organic producers. Of course, it means there is demand for organic, from organic farmers for fertilizers, organic uh, fertilizers. As we speak, we don't have any, we haven't fashioned out any specific policy for the development of, of uh, organic products. Uh, our policy is to increase the general productivity of smallholder farmers as a means of transforming the agricultural economy and through which to transform the economy of Ghana, including, of course, the strategic uh, 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 planting for export and rural development, which is uh, giving rise to uh, the authority. So uh, I am sure that along the way, as we, we increase the volumes, the issue of organic uh, products will come up for special mention, and I'm sure investors will be going in there because they will find it much more profitable than ordinary products. Thank you. Doug, uh, school farms. I recall when we were at school, we used to go to school farms and it became part of us. Um, it's really becoming a thing of the past. Personally, I think it's a good culture. And also feeding into our overarching dream of farming, food security. Do you have any plans in this regard? And then finally, what legacy would you want to leave behind as a minister for food and agriculture? Thank you, Honorary uh, Chair. Yes, indeed. Um, a major component of planting for food and justice is to promote interest among students in uh, junior HS, HIA, and in fact, even in universities program that we, we do, we are doing with, uh, with schools. 
across the country, and I'll show you the statistics to show you uh, as to the number of schools that are participating in this, but I, I can't, in this case, I cannot find it uh, at the moment. So, but I can assure you that there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, schools which uh, I, uh, within that program where we give them the seeds and the fertilizers and uh, it's getting very popular indeed. I mean, we have about 10 uh, tertiary institutions uh, are participating in the program and I think about 150 schools across the, the country. More schools are coming on board, but uh, it's showing a lot of promise uh, in order to gain the interest of students uh, at an early age before they go into tertiary or they go into the world to look at agriculture as a, an option for uh, as a career uh, where you can make a decent living out of. So it's, uh, it's something that is very much part of what we are doing. Thank you, Chair. Well, the chair is on his way back. Honorable Affair, are you going to ask questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was waiting for you to sit so that I can make reference to you. I have in my hand the handover notes, the handover notes of the Minister of Food and Agriculture. Um, page 213, Honorable Minister, under the heading Legal Seeds, and I quote Mr. Chairman, the Ministry has been notified with Legal Seeds by former clients and some past members of staff for perceived injustice by plaintiffs. The issues include demand for payment for contractual transactions and compensation. Compensation. It is recommended that a review is undertaken of such cases to determine possible settlements where possible. And then the underlook just said the critical issues are segregated into 30, 60, and 90 days in Appendix 16. But, Honorable Minister, when you go to Appendix 16, it's not there. It's not in Appendix 16. Are this, are, are this information available and will you be willing to provide the, those details of the legal suits to the committee? Uh, if they are part of the records of the Ministry, I don't see why we cannot provide it. Yes, we will. Thank you. I want to find out in an earlier answer to a question on the audit of the Kokoros, he, in answering, he did not give the precise answer of whether the report is ready and where is the report. Can I find out from him where is the report and is the report ready? Sir, I couldn't hear you properly. I think your thing is too close. So I can't... Yeah. I'm well, asking uh -huh. that when you assume office, you authorize the auditing of the Kokoros. Yes. And an earlier question, you were asked about the report of this audit yes. and whether it was ready. And I didn't get the answer, so I'm asking, is the report ready, and where is the report? To be honest with you, I'll have to check with Ghana Cocoa Ball. Uh, I'm the supervising minister. Uh, you know Cocoa Ball is uh, a big organization, and their commitments and so on, I don't follow it on a daily basis. So you have to give me time to check with the management of Cocoa Ball exactly what you're saying. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Far from it. I want to be as accurate to this committee as possible. So, if you give me time, I'll consult the Ghana Cocoa Board 
and then I can get back to you. Have we been informed that that audit is ready? Have they informed you that that audit is ready? I don't recall. But you don't also recall whether they have published the report? I don't know Ghana, uh, the, the Cocoa Board policy on publishing audit reports. That one I'm not sure. But you can get a copy for this committee? Yes. Uh, why not? If, if it's available, I don't see why they will resist. Do, do you have an idea who was, which company did the audit? No, sir. And how much they paid for that work? You, you also have no idea. I have no clue. The procurement of fertilizer and chemicals by Cocoa Board, you are the supervising minister. Do you have an idea the method they've been using in the procurement? These are very technical questions. I'm only a supervising minister. They have a board of directors who decide on policy, and my job is to make sure that the policy established by the board is followed to the letter. So the details about who is what and so on, I'll have to get back to them to give you that information. But you know you are the supervising minister, and you are supposed to get us the annual, the annual to parliament and they are supposed to submit this at least three months after every year, and you two, within six months of each year, you have to now forward the report to Parliament. And you don't have these details, you don't know anything about how they are making their procurement? They are supposed to submit it to the board for approval. I'm in touch with the chairman of the board, so I have to find out from him the status of these reports, and if they are available, I will make them available to Parliament. Do you remember submitting any, from 2017 to date, submitting any of their annual reports to Parliament? I don't recall. But that's one of your core functions and responsibility as a minister playing oversight to Cocoa Board. Yes, but... Um, so you don't have a checklist Mr. in the ministry to be sure the things that you are supposed to present to Parliament yes, annually, yes, yes, to be Mr. sure Chairman. that you do that so that you don't fail? Mr. Chairman, I'm only a supervising minister. The board is in place to look at these issues and to advise me. If they don't come up with these issues to me, I have a lot of other authorities under me and my own ministry and so on. So the member of parliament for Aswasi should understand that. There are areas that I'm directly responsible and we've sat here for three and a half hours. All the answers that I can give, I've given. So I'm cooperating with this committee and if I say I don't have it, he has to believe what I'm saying. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to find out from the minister, how many deputy CEOs do we have at Cocoa Board? There's a question. How many deputy chief executives do you have at Cocoa Board? Three. Have you instructed them to report to you directly? To do what? Have you instructed them to report to you directly? How can I? Please. I have an uh, honorable. Uh, this is a simple question. Yes, I, no. I, 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 no. But, you know, questions like that. How can I ask juniors to report to me when their bosses are out of the answer, no, you haven't. That makes it No, matter. okay, no. Do you, have, do you have hand in the dismissal of the previous three chief executives of Cocoa Board? No. Have you recalled persons that have gone on retirement to resume work at Cocoa Board? Yes. How many of them? I can't recall. This is four years ago. So there are quite a few of them that we brought back to Cocoa Board when we took over. I cannot tell you as I sit here. Do you remember Mr. Yao Edu Ampo Ampoma? Yes, yes. He's my advisor on Cocoa Affairs. But you first recall him to come back as Deputy Chief Executive of Cocoa Board. Sorry, I, I, 
You first recalled him. I can't hear you. You first recalled him to come back as deputy chief executive of Cocoa Board, right? I first did what? You first recalled him to come back as chief executive of Cocoa Board. Not as, as deputy chief executive of Cocoa Board. As deputy chief executive. Yes, as deputy chief. He was sorry. one of the three that were recalled. And you remember that some of them had gone on retirement as far back as four years ago, four years before the recall. I don't remember. So, Mr. Edu Ampoma, that you said is your advisor on COCO at the ministry, how is he paid? No, no, no. He was transferred from the ministry, from COCO board, to advise me in the ministry. I'm but only asking when, how when, is he can paid? I, can I finish, please? You ask me a question, you give me the space to finish, please. Is that okay? So I'm saying that when I became the supervising minister, I needed a very senior person from the from Cocoa Board to come and advise me. So he was transferred from the ministry, from Cocoa Board, Cocoa House, to come to be with me at the ministry to advise me on Cocoa Affairs. So how is he paid? He's paid from where he came from, from Cocoa Board. Someone that has gone on retirement and you call and then you put the person at the ministry and you say Cocoa Board should pay him, you think that is justifiable? But, the, the, sorry, could you slow down because no, I can't I'm, hear I'm, you. I mean, the because of you have I, removed my nose I, I miss most of the things that you are saying. I'm if saying you can that. slow down and I can hear you and I can well, give you a proper answer, please. Well, I'm sure everyone else is here and he understanding me, so you have to put your mic on so and pay attention. I'm saying that you ask for a retiree to return to Cocoa Board. Then you move the person to Minister of Food and Agriculture, and you ask Cocoa Board to continue to pay him with all his entitlement at Cocoa Board. And I'm asking, you think that is right? He was on retirement contract. And that is very normal. I have about four different specialists in the ministry who are on retirement contracts. And are they all paid by Cocoa Board? No. So this particular one is paid for? He has answered that. I'm only asking. But I've answered that question. He has answered that. Mr. Yes, Chairman, I want to find out from the nominee in an earlier answer to your question about uh, CMC and its board. He said that the CMC's board was properly constituted. Is that what you said? CMC. Put your mic on. CMC. You were earlier asked about the composition of their board whether it was properly constituted. And you said yes. And I'm asking, is that what I heard you say? Yes. Who are the members that you inaugurated as board members of CMC? I cannot give their names to you now. I cannot. Because I don't work with them. How many, how many are they? Because you inaugurated them. The president appointed them. But you inaugurated them. I inaugurated them. I inaugurated a lot of such... Uh, 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 box. You can't so remember. I cannot, I cannot recall the numbers. Do you have the chief executive of Cocoa Board as a member? A member of? Of that CMC board. The one that you know. I'm not sure. I, I, I have to check. The, were there workers representative on the board that you know created? I'm not sure. I have to check. Were there farmers representative on the board that you know created? We have to look at the regulations governing CMC to be able to answer that question. Which regulation regulates the board of CMC? It's a limited liability company, so, so they is. have regulations. So which, company, which regulation regulates them? Company regulations, please. No, <laughs> that's fine. So you say which, which, which act regulates them or which regulation Regulate them. I, I cannot tell you. So, how did you inaugurate a board 
you can recollect the members that are inaugurated. You cannot recollect whether the very regulation that you are talking about are adhered to, but you went ahead to, to inaugurate it. Just a follow up for you. Before. Please, uh, answer. No, no, let him answer. Oh, if you have a follow up. Oh, please, let him answer. When he is finished answering, you have a follow up. You can't. Yeah. It cannot be before my question, please. I've asked a question. Hello, hello, hold on, hold on. Hold on. He has just asked a question. When the nominee finishes, I'll give you the opportunity to answer. Please. Honorable Minister, kindly answer him. Sir, um, Honorable Chairman, what, what did you say? His question was, how come you inaugurate the committee but you don't remember the members? Not only that. You inaugurate a board, you don't remember the members. You don't remember the regulation. How will you, because I asked him about the regulation, that regulates them, and he says he can't remember. And I'm saying that, then how do you inaugurate that board? Honorable uh, Leader. The question about regulations, I spoke to you quietly. That is a question of law. They have company regulations, which are registered with the Registrar General. It's not law. It's not law we pass. That's a private one. So leave that one out and ask the other question. Mr. Chairman, that's where I decided because the Companies Act was passed by an act of parliament. So we passed that law. And before you innovate a board, the first thing that you try to do is to check. Are these compost are these persons that are coming in compliance with the existing law? So you cannot separate the two. So that's why I'm asking him. That that's the difference. It's not the computer regulation is not a legislation. It's a different one. That's why I want you to move on, please. Honorable Minister, the question is how come you don't remember the names of the Board members, you. If I recall, the chairman, I have at least 10 boards under me. And these boards were inaugurated four or five years, four years ago. I'm not required to remember 10 times, I don't know how many, and their regulations. That's not my job. I'm I only acting on behalf of the President of the Republic. That's all. Mr. Chairman, the act that the, the private okay. company Can limited by shares... Sorry, you uh, wanted a follow-up question. Yes, you may have your uh, Honorable nominee, please. Is CMC a subsidiary of Cocoa Yes. Mr. Chairman, the Act that regulates CMC as a subsidiary of Cocoa Board is Act 179. And that's an Act of Parliament. So if we say that it's a private, no, it's an Act of Parliament. I don't know. You have lawyers here. They may be able to advise. What's it? A company registered on the company's law, the regulations. That's a different arrangement. So they will advise you. But please move on. Mr. Chairman, I'm putting, I'm tell, I'm informing the minister designate that the board that he inaugurated has no cocoa board representative, has no minister of agri representative has no workers' representative, and has no farmers' representative. Is this which is required by law and their practice? Is he aware of this? I have to check. Mr. Chairman, is he aware that since 2017, CMC has not held annual general meeting in compliance with the Companies Act. I'm not aware.
Mr. Chairman, in an earlier answer to a question about job creation, that reference was made to the handover notes of the Minister for Employment and Labor Relations. The Minister agreed that the planting for food and jobs had created averagely 2.299627 jobs in an answer that he gave earlier. Is that right? Yes. And Mr. Chairman, in his budget that he presented for 2020, he also said that 94% are on-farm workers. Is that right? That's correct. The Speaker, that's on paragraph 259 of the 2020 budget. This 94 brings it to 2.149. That's the 94 percent that is talking about. These are laborers, uh, farmhands, and what have you. And he also said 4 percent is in value addition. Minister, do you remember that? In your answer, you said the jobs that were created, 4 percent were in value addition. Is that right? Mr. Uh, Honorable Chairman, I thought these questions were answered at your committee. I'm just for awareness of that because no, no, I'm building I'm up to chairman. ask your question. Yes. I just want to be sure chairman, that that's what chairman, I heard. I'm saying that these same questions have been asked me this afternoon in this committee. Yes. Is it please. the case that members please. can ask the same please. question many times? <laughs> Honorable, he just wants to confirm the answer for subsequent again. So please answer. I'm waiting for my answer. Four percent in value addition. Is that right? You said that. Yes. The chairman, that four percent gives you ninety-one thousand four hundred and seventy-five. When you say in value addition, what do you really mean? We're talking about. Processing. So, for example, in maize, and you talk about the processing, what are you specifically talking about? Processing. I'm saying that the planting for food and jobs, and I just give an example, say in processing. So, I say when you talk about maize, and you say processing, what specifically are you talking about? in relation to maize that you are referring to as processing? It's just processing the maize. Well, I heard someone talking about mole, and so even those, those who do interior are all part of the processing that you are talking about. Is that right? Is that right? Is that what you, you mean? Because if you say Processing and then someone scream, those who prepare mole, those are not his words. So no, that's why I'm asking him. So, those who prepare interior and all are part of this value addition that you are talking about. Am I right? Processing. Mr. Chairman, he also said 2% is by way of extension delivery. Is that what you said? Yes. That's because that brings you to 45,737 of the number. Are your extension workers in this country up to 20,000? No. And so how do you have extension delivery, the jobs there being over 45,000? We are talking about the formal sector and the informal sector. How does the informal sector perform extension delivery? You are not aware of that. There, there is an informal sector. So I'm asking you, how do they do it? Service. So how do they do it? So you tell me, give me examples. I mean, you know, just as you are a minister, you know I'm also a farmer. You know that, even though most of the time I'm a farmer. So 
I want to understand when you say extension delivery is not only done by your extension offices, which other categories does it? You say including private. And I say, how do they do it? Tell me. Informal sector. I didn't get the answer. No, I'm saying that when you say in the informal sector, and I'm saying, how do they do it? They do it by helping the farmers to plant, to sow, and all that. Minister, you know that what you are saying is difficult to appreciate because these are done by Minister of Food and Agriculture Workers who assist farmers in various farms. Can you give me an example of a private company or a non-governmental organization that you know are engaged in this? Mr. Chairman, I also find it difficult to appreciate the question. That's why I'm struggling with answering the question. Mr. Chairman, he, in an answer to an earlier question, you also said that plantain is now being exported to the Sahelian regions, where obviously we all know they don't have plantain. I suggested that it is only now that plantain is being exported to Northern Nigeria, Kano, Kaduna, and other places? Not at all. So why are you associating it to planting for food and uh, for, for jobs when you know that it existed before? Why not? The planting for food and uh, the planting for food and jobs, the segment in particular with fertilizer, are you aware that it's not available throughout the year? Mr. Chairman, why should it be? Our agriculture is very seasonal, determined by the rainfall patterns. How does the questioner expect that? they will be available. And who will buy them? For what? In the dry season? I don't understand the question. Mr. Chairman, the Minister knows that we have several irrigation projects across this country. We have private irrigation facilities. And there are a lot of dry season farming happening now. So in the absence of fertilizer subsidy during the dry season to assist dry season farmers, doesn't the thing that it indirectly defeats the purpose for which it is introduced during the rainy season. I totally disagree, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in an answer to an earlier question about smuggling of the planting for food and jobs fertilizer, he said a lot of measures were being put in place to uh, curtail the smuggling. I just want to find out, those that were arrested in Sunyani and Upper West, what's happened to them? I have to check with my legal department. In an earlier answer to a question, he claimed that in 2020, 400,000 metrics of metric tons of fertilizer was important. Is that right? Was what? The answer to an earlier question, you said about 400,000 metric tons of fertilizer was important. Is that right? That's not right. I didn't say about. I gave a specific figure. And if you give me a few minutes, I know that I'll let you know the exact I'll be grateful to get the exact figure.
serve as chairman, my things are mixed up, so I need time to look through them. Well, I thought I had a little over 400,000. It wasn't a little over, Mr. Chairman. It was exact figure. Exactly 400,000. Is that what you say? Could you, can I hear the question again? I'm saying that you said it was about, it's exactly 400,000 metric tons. I didn't say that. I gave an exact figure to the last unit. Okay, but the principle is that from 2017 down to 2020, every year, year in, year out, the importation or distribution of fertilizer has been going up. Am I right? Yes. So, Mr. Chairman, if you take the volumes of import of hybrid maize, hybrid maize seeds, and local certified maize seed, which constitute about 60% of the seed use. If projected, Ghana should have cultivated about 1 million acres or 400,000 hectares. Therefore, we should be having over 3 million tons of maize. Why then did we have shortage of maize? during the latter part of last year. I said earlier that there was a massive drought in the major season in the south and a massive drought in the minor season in the south. These droughts come once every four or five years. We have been lucky to escape that until last year when we were hit. Fortunately, we had a very good crop in the north, except for the Boku area, or Logo, where there was a flooding. Otherwise, we go to Sisala and, and the other places, the crop was very good. And this is why, with their harvest, maize and other soya and so on, prices are now coming down. Mr. So I want to find out from the nominee, with this huge investment and in planting for food and jobs, that i.e. in seeds and in fertilizer. How can he explain the growth rate that we have seen in the agriculture sector over this same period? Question is not clear to me, Honorable Chairman. I'm saying that having in mind the heavy investment in seeds, in fertilizer, we have the growth rate in the agricultural sector fluctuating from 2.9 in 2016, 6.1 in 2017, 4.7 in 2018, 2.9, uh, 2.6 in 2019, an estimated figure of 2.9 for 2020. You will see that whereas our investment is going up in terms of fertilizer and other inputs, the, the rate of growth is going down. And I'm saying that, can he explain why we are having this kind of trend? The, the, I think the question is looking at it the wrong way altogether. It's not the rate of growth that determines the security of food in this country is the quantum, the amount of production that determines that. And I think that, except he disagreed with me, food security in this country in the last four years has been very, very good. And we have the evidence in Asomase, in Tamale, in Ashanti New Town, everywhere there's food, unless that is being denied. So, you just said that food security is what matters most. So let me then take you there. You were asked about the prices of 100 kilos of meat. And this were your, when you give the answer, you said in 2020, that's last year, December, it was about 172 per 100 kilo. And 127 
in 2019, around the same time, 133 over the same period in 2018, and 92 Ghana cities in 2017, around the same time. Looking at this trend, do you say or do you tell the people of this country that the planting for food and agriculture has brought about stability in the prices of at least maize? Mr. Chairman, there is no planting for food and agriculture in this country. Planting for food and jobs, sorry. Right. Can the, the question be repeated? In an earlier answer to my question, you, when I was talking about the group, you said that no, I shouldn't be looking at the group, I should look at food security. And you say that the evidence is there, whether in Aswansi and you mentioned so many other places, that, I mean, food security is guaranteed. And I then referred you that, okay, then let's go and look at the security of food. And I'm saying that from 2017, the price of maize has moved from 92 Ghana cities to in 2020 December, 172 Ghana cities. And I'm asking you, do you tell the people of this country that that program, planting for food and jobs, have brought stability and therefore food security to them, looking at over 87 price in the price of maize alone? There is a difference between price stability and food security. I think the questioner is mixing the two. The fact that it's not a price stability does not mean there's no food security. And I want to correct that impression. I'm very happy to be educated. Tell me the difference. Mr. Chairman, the Honorable Member is saying he's a farmer. And he can't distinguish between the two. Honorable, oh, no, just please tell him the difference. It's not just for him, it's for all of us listening. Please. Price, price stability is not food security. You can have fluctuations in price and so your security of food will be rising. That's the difference. It's not one and the same. That, that should not be the mistake. Yes, I will be very happy he tells us what food security is. He is a minister of our grid for the past four years. I challenge you, tell us what the, food security is. The, the food security is exactly what you are seeing in this country in the last four years, where there's so much food making everybody all food prices down, even here at a and this time where we have a, uh, the, the season of dryness, you still have all types of foods and fruits along. And I don't think I'm the only witness. Everybody will bear witness to the fact that you go to all markets, rural markets, urban markets. Oh, every food security is availability of food. Is that right? Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, all right. Just make it simple. Uh, okay. And Mr. Chairman, it is not just availability. You can never define food security without inputting the price of the commodity. You can't. Sir. By any means possible. If you are going to define food security, a need embedded will be the cost element. That's an opinion, uh, Chairman. It is not. Even though we are not going to litigate, because I believe that the good people of this country are listening to all of us, including the experts. Mr. Chairman, in an earlier answer to a question about AMG, a company that will be supplying fertilizer, I just want to find out from the nominee whether he knows the owner of AMG. This is a personal question, and I'm not prepared to answer personal questions. Honorable Minister, if it is uh, inadmissible, I will rule that it's not admissible. If you know the company, it's a company that works for? Yes, the ministry. The ministry. Do you know any such company? The, company, the, the company doesn't work for the ministry. It is a contractor of the ministry. 
and there are loads and loads of uh, uh, companies that work for the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and they work for Cocoa Board, they work for GDA, Ghana Irrigation Development Authority, they work for CMC, they work for all the uh, institutions under the Ministry of Agriculture. So uh, hundreds and hundreds of business people that we deal with in the office. So that's why I'm asking you, this particular one, whether you know the owner. Can he define what he means by no? Because, Mr. Chairman, in fairness to me, a lot of these, they come to my office or they, I meet them outside. Some of them I knew even before I became Minister for Food and Agriculture. And the, uh, Honourable Minister, it's a company, is that right? Yes. It's a company, so there yes. will be an owner, so to speak. But yeah, so... If there's any specific person you want to ask, after otherwise, owner will be inappropriate. The, one of the, any of the directors? Do you know any of the directors? The, the directors mean are not necessarily owners of the company. But you said owner. And I don't know who owns AMG. But I know managers and uh, some directors who work for that company. And so do I know managers and owners of uh, directors of many, some of these many, many companies that I deal with. So you also know some of the directors or managing director, man, uh, managers of AgroWaves? AgroWave. I don't. Do you know Ernest Apia? Who is he? I'm asking whether you know Ernest Apia. I want you to define what is no. If I somebody uh, that do I you know, any, know. Do you know any person called by, uh, by that name? Yes, I, I know someone called NS Apia. Is he related to AMJ company or AgroWave? I know that he's a director of AMG company. Do you have an idea when his company was registered? How would I know? I don't have any idea about these companies. How, how do you expect me to know? Uh, are you aware that they've been supplying fertilizer to the planting for food and jobs over the past four years? Oh, this is what I'm saying. Hundreds of companies have been supplying fertilizer to us. Are you also aware that they alone supply close to 50% of all the fertilizer that are supplied by the, to the ministry? I'm not aware of that. Mr. Minister Nominee, the price of MPK fertilizer in the open market is about 110 cities. Is that right? I cannot have to check. The subsidy on the fertilizer within the program planting for food and jobs is as your ministry put out, supposed to be 50 percent, right? It has been up to now. And farmers are asked to buy at the subsidized price of 85 cities. Are you aware of this? There are official prices for the 50 percent subsidy, which every farmer is supposed to pay. Of course, in some cases, either the retailers, there are all kinds of things which go on. So the policy is 50% subsidy. If anybody gets less than that, then they are being cheated out of, of pocket. Are you aware that the, it is being sold to farmers as 85 cities? That's the question I just asked. I'm not aware. Will you find out? Because that is the price at which farmers are, they are being sold, this, the fertilizer. We have monitors, Honorable Chairman, we have people all over this country who monitor these things to us. And that has not been one of the complaints that we are getting. So I don't know where he's getting his information and where, how many farmers are paying 85 and so on and so forth. I'm not aware at all from the monitoring system that we have all over the country. 
we have no record of anyone reporting that they are selling above the subsidized price. Mr. Chairman, in an answer to an earlier person, he was heard saying that Ghana's cocoa we sell at a premium of about between 200 to 300 British pounds. Is that right? Can you repeat the question? I'm saying that when you were answering the question earlier, you said that Ghana's cocoa is being sold at a premium of between 200 to 300 British pounds, pounds sterling. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Depends upon the market. I was just making an illustration. And in, 20, in 2019-2020 season, we ended with a little over 700,000 metric tons, right? Cocoa. I wouldn't know. Minister for Agri, you can't remember the tonnage that we sold Ghana's cocoa at? I cannot come in front of this important committee and just give a figure. I have to be sure to the last unit what I'm saying. So. Basically, I'm saying that I need to refer to the records, and I don't have those records here with me. Thank you. Chairman, last year we did over 750,000 metric tons. And if I take even the 700,000 alone and use the, the, the bottom of 200 pounds, it gives us 140 million pounds that came by way of premium alone. And my question to the nominee is, how much of this has the farmers benefited? I have to check with Ghana Cocoa Board. Mr. Chairman, to Gapoha, when earlier questions were asked, I just want to find out from the nominee whether he directed the Gapoha authorities to issue a license to Food Terminal Company Limited. No, I didn't. And also an earlier answer to a question, you said that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture had an agreement with Gapoha for this terminal in 2008. Did I hear you say that? Yes. And was it in the name of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, or it was in the name of a different company? The Ministry of Food and Agriculture. You said it was in the name of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and not Fruits Experts, Fruit Terminal Company Limited. The Ministry of Food and Agriculture had an agreement with the, the food exporters. I've forgotten the name of the, that they gave to the food exporters. And that agreement was signed on behalf of the Ministry and the government by the late Deborah, Honorable Deborah, who was then the Minister of Food and Agriculture. Have you? Have you made this statement in a way that the board of Fruits and Expert Terminal Ghana Limited has created bottleneck to the export of fruits through the ports and the operations of this Fruits and Export Terminal Ghana Limited are unduly adding to the cost of supplying horticulture product export outside Ghana. Have you made this statement anyway? Never. A statement made outside my office or inside my office, no. There's been correspondence between me and the Minister for Transport, uh, copied to Gapoa and the other ones. But I've never made a statement that you are quoting. 
In your letter to the Minister for Transport, did you make did you ask, did you make this allusion? I have to read the letter again to, uh, to say anything about the contents. Are you aware that Gapoa had a concession agreement which was executed on May 18, 2015 with Fruit Export Terminal Company Limited? I'm not aware. Will you be surprised if you are told that this contract is still is still in force that has been signed by Gapoha and Fruits Export Terminal Ghana Limited? Mr. Chairman, nothing surprises me in this work. As the Minister designated for Food and Agriculture, if approved, will you want to see this? concession terminated? I am yet to be appointed, approved by this committee, and I'm not prepared to make any comment or speculate on any action for my future. You are the minister, you are the representative of the president at the Minister of Food and Agriculture currently, and as we speak, you still have some authority of the president to act within the ministry. Will you want to see this contract or concession agreement terminated? The instructions are that I'm just keeping the fort, not to make any commitment financial or otherwise in this capacity as acting in the name of the President. So I cannot. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the nominee. From 20, in 2017-2018 cocoa season, whether the price of cocoa was increased, that is our way. Which period again? 2017-2018 season. Whether you are aware whether the price of cocoa was increased for the ordinary farmer? I have to check. Do you remember the the current price of cocoa per bag? I have to check. Mr. Chairman, in 2017. The price 2017, 2018, 2016, 2017, the price of cocoa per bag in Ghana was 475. In 2017, 2018, there was no increase. In 2018, 2019 season, it was increased to 515. And then in 2019, 2020 season, it was increased to 660. And Mr. Chairman, from 2017 all the way to 2020, the price increase is 39 percent. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the nominee whether he thought this pricing is fair to the farmer. Honorable Chairman, it's really in my business is not to determine what is fair or not. These, according to the market conditions, are the prices given to the producers. So it's really not a question of fairness or is the rarity of the market which it takes what producer price is given to the farmer at the time. Mr. Chairman, I'm asking this because in the relation to the price of meat, and the way it's been increasing. You said that people should not just look at the, the nominal figure. They should be looking at the real. But when it comes to the cocoa farmer, where you have to pay, you had done this 39%. I wanted to know whether by that assertion with the maize pricing, whether you thought that in real terms, the farmer is not worse off. I cannot make that assessment. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the Premier, why has he eliminated cocoa revenue from the national budget since 2017? This, Mr. Chairman, this is a, a, a question for the Minister for Finance. Mr. Chairman, the reason why I'm asking is because the cocoa board used to be under the Minister of Finance. 
and they always report the revenues in the tables. And since it was ceded up to Minister of Agri, all of a sudden it vanished from our national budget. And since 2017, it has not. So that's why I'm asking whether why he had gotten it off the budget since 2017. Yeah, the law, the law that took uh, Cocoa Board back to agree was just last year. No, but we all were communicated and that. And sorry, if he uh, the reporting is not his business, he will just tell us. So we move on. Honourable Minister, are you responsible for reporting? That, that, that's why, uh, Chairman, I said that is for the Minister of Finance to answer. Mr. Chairman, the Ivory Rice project, the collapse. In an earlier answer, he gave an answer that wasn't very clear. Can you, can I get the understanding? In in an earlier answer to a question about the Ivory Rice project, about its collapse, I wasn't very clear about the answer you gave. Will I be how, yeah, will I? What he said was that there's a litigation with the ministry. And that is ongoing, and the mini, uh, private people have taken over the land. They were very clear in the record. So, ask any question on that, if you may. So, if the if private persons are encroaching the land when the ministry is in litigation with the farm, what is the ministry doing to safeguard the land since they are in litigation? We, we try our best with the resources we have, and it's not only available, it's all over the country. Lands of the ministry are being encroached left and right. We are fighting back, but it looks like a losing battle, but we are doing the best we can. Mr. Chairman, the minister is saying looks like a losing battle. Do I get the impression that it's like he's giving up the fight to protect the lands that the Minister of Food and Agriculture has across this country that badly need protection from him? Mr. Chairman, I'm a fighter. I don't give up at all. Yeah. I'm just giving you the current situation that we have been invaded left and right center, and, and that's, 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 that's what I meant by that. Chairman, I have a point of interest. Uh, Honorable nominee, Honorable Ayaga said you've been playing tennis. And because he was going to settle scores, because we're always beating him. Have you been playing tennis with uh, uh, the chief, the chief whip from Asawasi as well? Uh, I, I don't know whether he's ever heard about it before, but uh, not, not to my knowledge. <laughs> no, no, but would you want to take him to the tennis court? Because he's been your good friend. Um, he's been your good friend. Yeah. You know, he has his lenses down, and he's asking his questions down. Okay. Mr. Chairman, in an answer to an earlier question, he, about the army worm, the minister gave us these statistics, that in 2017, we had to struggle to protect 249,000 hectares of land, only about 14,000 hectares were destroyed. Then in 20, the following year, it dropped to just 79 hectares. The subsequent year, it further dropped to 26 hectares. And he was telling us on authority that in 2020, no farm was destroyed by the army worm. Mr. Minister, Nemini, this is what I heard you say. Is that what you said? That's exactly what I said. Honorable Minister Nominee, I'm sure a lot of farmers who are listening to us will not be happy with you because I can tell you that in 2020, yes, we were still battling with army worm. Yes, the devastation is not as before, but we still have farms being destroyed. Will you investigate this? The report for the monitoring for the end of 2020 has not reached me. We are still in the first quarter. There's always a, 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 a relay, but 
up to the time the last report came, there was no destruction, zero destruction. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Honorable Deputy Leader, do you have a question for your minister? <laughs> Chairman, with what uh, minority chief whip has done, he's covered all my areas. <laughs> He's coming on my area. Thank you so much. <laughs> Honorable Minister, thank you for attending upon the house to answer questions. <laughs> you have endured us for nearly five hours. <laughs> you are <you're> discharged. <laughs> Colleagues, please don't leave. We have a quick, quick announcement that I will invent to inform you.